Story One of The Human Boy and the War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. The Human Boy and the War by Eden Philpotts. Story One The Battle of the Sand Pit. After the war had fairly got going, naturally we thought a good deal about it, and it was explained to us by Fortescue that behind the theory of Germany licking us, or Rots licking Germany, as the case might be, there were two great psychical ideas. As I was going to be a soldier myself, the actual fighting interested me most, but the psychical ideas were also interesting, because Fortescue said that often the cause won the battle. Therefore, it was better to have a good psychical idea behind you, like us, than a rotten one, like Germany. I always thought the best men and the best ships and the best brains and the most money were simply bound to come out top in the long run. But Fortescue said that a bad psychical idea behind these things often wrecks the whole show. And so I asked him if we had got a good psychical idea behind us, and he said we had a champion one, whereas the Germans were trusting to a perfectly deadly psychical idea, which was bound to have wrecked them in any case, even if they'd had twenty million men instead of ten. So that was all right, though no doubt the Germans think their idea of being top dog of the whole world is really finer than ours, which is live and let live. And, as I pointed out to Fortescue, no doubt if we had such a fearfully fine opinion of ourselves as the Germans have, then we also should want to be top dog of the world. And Fortescue said, that's just it travers major thanks to our sane policy of respecting the rights of all men and never setting ourselves up as the only nation that counts we do count first and foremost but if we'd gone out into the whole world and bawled that we were going to make it anglo-saxon then we should have been laughed at as the germans are now and we should dismally have failed as colonists just as they have so, of course, I saw all he meant by his psychical idea, and no doubt it was a jolly fine thought, and most, though not all, of the sixth saw it also. But the fifth saw it less, and the fourth didn't see it at all. The fourth were, in fact, rather an earthy lot about this time, and they seemed to have a foggy sort of notion that might is right, or if it isn't, it generally comes out right, which to the minds of the fourth amounted to the same thing. The war naturally had a large effect upon us, and according as we looked at the war, so you could judge of our opinion in general. I and my brother, Travers Minor, and Briggs and Saunders, though Briggs and Travers Minor were themselves in the lower fourth, were interested in the strategy and higher command. We foretold what was going to happen next, and were sometimes quite right, whereas chaps like Abbott and Blades and Mitchell and Pegram and Rice were only interested in the brutal part, and the bloodshed and the grim particulars about the enemy's trenches after a sortie, and so on. In time, curiously enough, there got to be two war parties in the school. Of course, they both wanted England to win, but we took a higher line about it and looked on to the end and argued about the division of the spoil and the general improvement of Europe and the new map and the advancement of better ideas and so on, while Rice and Pegram and such like took the horrible slaughter line and rejoiced to hear of parties surrounded and uhlans who had been eating hay for a week before they were captured and the decks of battleships just before they sank and such like necessary but very unfortunate things i said to mitchell it may interest you to know that real soldiers never talk about the hideous side of war and it would be a good deal more classy if you chaps tried to understand the meaning of it all instead of wallowing in the dreadful details and mitchell answered the details bring it home to us and make us see red and i replied to mitchell what the dickens do you want to see red for and he said everybody ought to at a time like this of course with such ignorance you can't argue any more than you could with rice when he swore that he'd give up his home and family gladly in exchange for the heavenly joy of putting a bayonet through a german officer 
it wasn't the spirit of war and i told him so and he called me von travers and said that as i was going to be a soldier he hoped for the sake of the united kingdom in general there would be no war while i was in command of anybody gradually there got to be a bit of feeling in the air and we gave out that we stood for tactics and strategy and brain power and rice and his lot gave out that they stood for hacking their way through and as for strategy they had the cheek to say that if it came to actual battle the fourth would back its strategy against the sixth every time it was a sort of challenge in fact and rested chiefly on their complete ignorance of what strategy really meant when i asked mitchell who were the strategists of the fourth he gave it away by saying well, me and pegram well he and pegram were merely cunning nothing more mitchell was a good mathematician and in money matters he excelled on a low plane while pegram was admitted to be a master in the art of cribbing but no other his bent of mind had been attracted to the subject of cribbing from the first and while i hated him and knew that he could never come to much good i was bound to admit the stories told about his cribbing exploits showed great ingenuity combined with nerve by a bitter irony theology was his best subject but only thanks to the possession of a bible one inch square he had found it when doing christmas shopping with his aunt who was his only relation owing to his being an orphan and when he asked her to buy it for him as one of his christmas presents she did so with pleasure and surprise little dreaming of what was passing in his mind i never saw the book nor wished to see it but briggs who did told me it contained everything only in such frightfully small print that you wanted a magnifying glass to read it needless to say pegram had the magnifying glass and thus armed he naturally did scripture papers second to none he also manipulated a catapult for the benefit of his friends in the lower fourth of whom he had a great many and with this instrument such was his delicacy of aim he could send answers to questions in an examination through the air to other chaps in the shape of paper pillets he could also hurl insults in this way or in fact anything once he actually fired his bible across three rows of forms to abbott it flew through the air and fell at abbott's feet who instantly put one on it but brown who was the master in command on the occasion looked up at the critical moment and saw a strange object passing through the air only he failed to mark it down what was that said brown to rice who sat three chaps off abbott a moth i think sir said rice extraordinary time for a moth to be flying said brown very sir said rice don't let it occur again anyway said de brown who never investigated anything but always ordered that it shouldn't occur again no sir said rice then abbott bent down to scratch his ankle and all was well and this pegram was supposed to have strategy as good as ours i never thought a real chance of a conflict would come but it actually did in a most unexpected manner just before the holidays the weather turned cold for a week and then after about three frosts we had a big snow and in about a day and a night there was nearly a foot of it and walking through the west wood with blades i pointed out that the sand pit under the edge of the fir trees would be a very fine spot for a battle on a small scale i said if one army was above the sand pit and another army was down here trying to storm the position there would be an opportunity for a remarkably good fight and plenty of strategy and if i led the fifth and sixth against the sand pit or if i defended the sand pit against the attacks by the upper and lower fourth the result would be very interesting and blades agreed with me he said he believed that it would give the upper and lower fourth frightful pleasure to have a battle and he was certain they would be exceedingly pleased at the idea in fact he went off at once to find pegram and if possible rice and mitchell the school was taking a walk that afternoon as the football ground was eight inches under snow and some were digging in the snow for eating chestnuts of which a good many were to be found in west wood and others were scattered about so blades went to find mitchell rice and pegram and i considered the situation 
the edge of the sand pit was about eight feet high and a frontal attack would have been very difficult if not impossible but there was an approach on the left a gradual slope fairly easy and another on the right rather difficult as it consisted of loose stones and tree roots on the whole i thought i would rather defend than attack but as if anything came of it i should be the challenger i felt it would be more sporting to let the foe choose then rice and mitchell came back with blades and they said that nothing would give them greater pleasure than a fight they had heard my idea and thought exceedingly well of it they examined the spot and pretended to consider strategy but of course they knew nothing about the possibilities of defence and attack what they really wanted to know was how many troops they would have and how many we should we counted up and found that in the fifth and sixth leaving out about four who were useless and perkins who would have been valuable but was crocked at footer for the moment we should number thirty-one while the upper and lower fourth would have thirty-eight i agreed to that and rice made the rather good suggestion that we should each have ten kids behind the fighting line to make ammunition and i said i hoped there would be no stones in the snowballs and mitchell said the fourth didn't consist of germans and i might be sure they would fight as fair as we did if not fairer so it was settled for the next saturday and brown and fortescue consented to umpire the battle and fortescue showed great interest in it there were a good many preliminaries to decide and i asked mitchell what chap was to be general-in-chief for the fourth and much to my surprise he said that pegram was and still more to my surprise he said that pegram wished to attack and not defend this alone showed how little they knew about strategy but i only said all right and mitchell actually said that pegram backed the fourth to take the sand pit inside an hour and i said that pride generally went before a fall then i saw pegram which was at a meeting of the commander-in-chief and we arranged all the details he asked about the fallen and i said that nobody would fall but he said he thought some very likely would and he also said that it would be more like the real thing and more a reward for strategy if when anybody was fairly bowled over in the battle and prevented from continuing without a rest that that soldier was considered as a casualty and taken to the rear this was pretty good for pegram but as our superior position on the top of the sand pit was bound to make our fire more severe than his and put more of his men out of action i pointed that out but he said that if i thought our fire would be more severe than his i was much mistaken he said the volume of his fire would be greater which was true so i let him have his way and we each selected ten kids for the ammunition travers minor didn't much like fighting against me but of course he had to though it was rather typical of mitchell and pegram that they were very suspicious of him before the battle and wouldn't tell him any of the strategy or give him a command in their army for fear of his being a traitor and they felt the same to briggs though of course briggs and travers minor were really just as keen about victory for the fourth as anybody else in it and the only reason why my brother didn't like fighting against me was that with my strategy he felt pretty sure i must win the generals pegram and i visited the battlefield twice more and arranged where the wounded were to lie and where the umpires were to stand in comparative safety behind a tree on the right wing but of course we didn't discuss tactics or say a word about our battle plans the fight was to last one hour and if at the end of that time we still held the sand pit we were the victors and for half an hour before the battle began we were to make ammunition and pile snow and do what we liked to increase the chances of victory i of course led the fifth and sixth and under me i had saunders as general of the sixth and norris as general of the fifth as for the enemy pegram was a generalissimo to use his own word and rice and abbott and mitchell and blades were his captains it got jolly interesting just before the battle and everybody was frightfully keen and the kids who were not doing orderly and red cross work were allowed to stand on a slight hill fifty yards from the sand pit and watch the struggle and on the morning of the great day happening to meet rice and mitchell i asked them what was the psychical idea behind the attack of the fourth 
and rice said his psychical idea was to give the sixth about the worst time it had ever had and mitchell said his psychical idea was to make the sixth wish it had never been born they meant it too for there was a lot of bitter feeling against us and i realized that we were in for a real battle though there would only be one end of course they had thirty-eight fighters to our thirty-one and they had rather the best of the weight and size but in the sixth we had forbes and forrester both of the first eleven and hard chuckers and we had three other hard chuckers and first eleven men in the fifth besides williams who was the champion long-distance cricket ball thrower in the school we had all practiced a good deal and also instructed the kids in the art of making snowballs hard and solid the general feeling with us was that we had the brains and the strategy while the fourth had rather the heavier metal but would not apply it so well as us when a man fell the ambulance in the shape of two red cross kids was to conduct him to a place safe from fire in the rear and when he was being taken from the firing line he was not to be fired at but the battle was to go on though the red cross kids were to be respected i should like to draw a diagram of the field like the diagrams in the newspapers but that i cannot do i can however explain that when the great moment arrived i manned the top of the sand pit with my army and during the half hour of preparation threw up a wall of snow all along the front of the sand pit nearly three feet high and along this wall i arranged the fifth led by norris on the right wing five men commanded by saunders specially guarded the incline on the left which was our weak point and the remaining ten men all from the sixth took up a position five yards to the rear and above the front line in such a position that they could drop curtain fire freely over the fifth i being the grand staff took up a position on the right wing on a small elevation above the army from which i could see the battle in every particular and thwaites of the sixth who was too small and weak to be of any use in the fighting lines was my adjutant to run messages and take any necessary orders to the wings as for the enemy they made no entrenchments or anything of the kind though they watched our dispositions with a great deal of interest pegram studied the incline on our wing and evidently had some ideas about a frontal attack also which would certainly mean ruin for him if he tried it as it would have been impossible to rush the sand pit from the front they made an enormous amount of ammunition and as they piled it within thirty yards of our parapet they evidently meant to come to close quarters from the first i was pleased to observe this they arranged their line rather well in a crescent converging upon our wings but there was no rear guard and no reserve so it was clear everybody was going into action at once the officers were distinguished by wearing white footer shirts which made them far too conspicuous objects and it was clear that pegram was not going to regard himself as a grand staff but just fight with the rest needless to say i was prepared to do the same and throw myself into the thickest of it if the battle needed me and things got critical but i felt somehow from the first that we were impregnable well the battle began by fortescue blowing a referee's football whistle and instantly the strategy of the enemy was made apparent they opened a terrific fire and their one idea evidently was to annihilate the sixth they ignored the fifth but poured their entire fire upon the sixth and a special firing party of about six or seven chosen shots or sharpshooters poured their entire fire on me where i stood alone about ten snowballs hit me the moment fortescue's whistle went and the position at once became untenable and also dangerous so i retired to the sixth and sent word to the fifth by thwaites to very much increase the rapidity of their fire which they did and pegram appealed that i was out of action but fortescue said i was not it was exceedingly like the great war in a way and the fourth evidently felt to the fifth and sixth what the germans felt to the french and english they merely hated the fifth but they fairly loathed the sixth and wanted to put them all out of action in the first five minutes of the battle needless to say they failed 
but we lost saunders who somehow caught it so hot guarding the slope that he got winded and his nose began to bleed at the same moment which was a weakness of his brought on suddenly by a snowball at rather close range so he fell and the red cross kids took him out of danger this infuriated us and keeping our nerve well we concentrated our fire on mitchell who had come far too close after the success with saunders a fair avalanche of snowballs battered him and he went down and though he got up instantly it was only to fall again and fortescue gave him out and he was conducted to a ruined cowshed where the enemy's ambulance stood in the rear of their lines i had already ordered the sixth to take open formation and scatter through the fifth and this undoubtedly saved them for though we lost my aide-de-camp thwaites who was no fighter and nearly fainted and was jolly glad to be numbered with those out of action for some time afterwards we lost nobody and held our own with ease once or twice i took a hand but it wasn't necessary and when we fairly settled to work we made them see they couldn't live within fifteen yards of us they made several rushes however but by a happy strategy i always directed our fire on the individual when he came in and thus got two out of action including rice he was a great fighter and i was surprised he threw up the sponge so soon but after a regular battering and blinding he said he'd got it in the neck and fell and was put out with one eye bunged travers minor also fell rather to my regret and what struck me was that considering all their brag the fourth were not such good plucked ones when it came to the business of real war as we were it made a difference finishing off rice for he had fought well and his fire was very accurate as several of us knew to our cost i felt now that if we could concentrate on pegram and blades who were firing magnificently the battle would be practically over but blades owing to his great powers could do execution and still keep out of range he was in fact their seventeen inch gun you might say and though williams on our side could throw further he proved in action rather feeble and not a born fighter by any means as for pegram he always seemed to be behind somebody else which knowing his character you would have expected at last however he led a storming party to the slope and leaving the bulk of my forces to guard the front i led seven to stem his attack for the first time since the beginning of the battle it was hand to hand but we had the advantage of position and were never in real danger i had the great satisfaction of hurling pegram over the slope into his own lines and he fell on his shoulder and went down and out he was led away holding his elbow and also limping but his loss did not knock the fight out of the fourth though in the same charge they lost preston and we nearly lost bassett but he got his second wind and was saved to us though only for a time for blades who had a private hate of bassett came close and scorned the fire and got three hard ones in on bassett from three yards and fortescue had to say bassett was done blades however was also done and there was a brief armistice while they were taken away we now suddenly concentrated on mitchell who was tiring and had got into range i think he was fed up with the battle for after a feeble return he went down when about ten well-directed snowballs took him simultaneously on the face and chest and then he chucked it and went to the ambulance at the same moment one of their chaps called sutherland did for norris norris had been getting giddy for some time and he also feared that he was frostbitten and when sutherland creeping right under him got him well between the eyes with a hard one he was fairly blinded though very sorry to join our casualties i had a touch of cramp at the same moment but it passed off we'd had about half an hour now and five of the ammunition kids were out of action with frozen hands then we got one more of the enemy in the shape of sutherland and their morrow ought to have begun to get bad but it did not though all their leaders were now down they stuck it well while we simply held them with ease and repelled two more attempts on the slope 
in fact williams wanted to go down and make a sortie and get a few more out of action but this i would not permit for another five minutes though during those exciting moments we prepared for the sortie and knocked out abbott who much to my surprise had fought magnificently and covered himself with glory though lame on their side they got mcandrew owing to an accident in fact he slipped over the edge of the sand pit and was taken prisoner before he could get back and we were sorry to lose him not so much for his own sake as because his capture bucked up the fourth to make fresh efforts and then came the critical moment of the battle and a most unexpected thing happened with victory in our grasp and a decimated opposition a frightful surprise occurred and the most unsporting thing was done by the fourth that you could find in the gory annals of war it was really all over bar victory and we were rearranging ourselves under a very much weakened fire when we heard a shout in the woods behind us and the shout was evidently a signal for the whole of the fourth still in action made one simultaneous rush for the slope and of course we concentrated to fling them back but then with a wild shriek there suddenly burst upon us from the rear the whole of their casualties mitchell and rice and pegram came first followed by travers minor and preston and blades and sutherland and abbott they had rested and refreshed themselves with two lemons and other commissariat and then taking a circuitous track from behind their ambulance had got exactly behind us through the wood and now uttering the yells that the regular tommies always utter when charging they were on us with frightful impetus just while we were repelling the frontal attack on the slope and before we had time to divide to meet them in fact they threw the whole weight of a very fine charge on to us and fairly mowed us down there was about a minute of real fighting on the slope and blood flowed freely we got back into the fort so to say but the advancing fourth came back too and the casualties took us in the rear then unfortunately for us i was hurled over the sand pit and three chaps all defenders came on top of me and half the snowbank we had built came on top of them with the snowbank gone it was all up i tried fearfully hard to get back but of course the fourth had guarded the slope when they took it and in about two minutes from the time i fell out of our ruined fortifications all was over in fact the fourth was now on the top of the sand pit and the shattered fifth and sixth were down below one by one our men were flung or fell over and then fortescue advanced from cover with brown and blew his whistle and the battle was done we appealed but pegram said all was fair in war and fortescue upheld him and in a moment of rage i told pegram and mitchell they had behaved like dirty germans and mitchell said they might or they might not but war was war anyway and he also said that the first thing to do in the case of a battle is to win it and if you win then what the losers say about your manners and tactics doesn't matter a button because the rest of civilization will instantly come over to your side and blades said the sixth had still a bit to learn about strategy apparently and pegram showing what he was to a beaten foe offered to give me some tips mind you i'm not pretending we were not beaten because we were and the victors fought quite as well as we did but i shall always say that with another referee than fortescue they might have lost on a foul no doubt they thought it was magnificent but it certainly wasn't war at least not what i call war we challenged them to a return battle the next saturday and pegram said as a rule you don't have return battles in warfare but that he should be delighted to lick us again with other strategies of which he still had dozens at his disposal only pegram feared the snow would unfortunately all be gone by next saturday and the wretched chap was quite right it had mitchell by the way got congestion of his lungs two days after the battle showing how sickness always follows warfare sooner or later but he recovered without difficulty End of story one
Story two of The Human Boy and the War by Eden Philpotts. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story two The Mystery of Fortescue. My name is Abbott, and I came to Merivale two years ago. I have got one leg an inch and three quarters shorter than the other, but I make nothing of it. A nurse dropped me on a fender when I was just born, owing to a mouse suddenly running across her foot. It was more a misfortune than anything, and my mother forgave her freely. When I was old enough, I also forgave her. In fact, I only mention it to explain why I am not going into the army. All abbots do so, and it will be almost a record my going into something else. Many chaps have no fighting spirit, and as a rule it is not strong in schoolmasters. Yet when the call came for men, three out of our five answered it and went. Two, who were well up on the terriers, got commissions, and the other enlisted, and so we were only left with Brown, who can't see further than a pink-eyed rat, and isn't five foot three in his socks, though in his high-heeled boots he may be, and Fortescue. You will say this must have had a pretty bright side for us, and at first sight no doubt it looks hopeful. In fact, we took a very cheerful view of it, because you can do what you like with Brown, and Fortescue only teaches the fifth and sixth. On the day that Hutchings cleared out to join the army, and we were only left with Fortescue, Brown, and the doctor, we were confronted with serious news. In fact, after chapel on that day, we heard, much to our anxiety, that old Dunstan himself was going to fill the breach. Those were his very words. He talked with a lot of ghastly funniness and used military terms. He said, Now that our valued and honored friends, Mr. Hutchings, Mr. Manwaring, and Mr. Meadows, have answered their nation's call with a loyalty to king and country inevitable in men who know the demands as well as the privileges of empire, it behooves us as we can and how we can to fill their places this then is my contribution to the great war i shall fight in no foreign trenches but labor here sleeplessly if need be and undertake willingly proudly the arduous task that they have left behind i shall confront no cannon but i shall face the lower school henceforth after that amalgamation of class and class which will be necessary you may count upon your headmaster to answer the trumpet call and fill the breach but I do not disguise from myself that such labors must prove no sinecure, and I trust the least, as well as the greatest, to do their part and aid me with good sense and intelligence. Well, there it was, and we saw in a moment that you can't escape the horrors of war, even though you are on an island with the grand fleet between you and the foe. When it came to the point, the doctor was fairly friendly, but there was always something about him that was awful and solemn and very depressing to the mind. You could crib easily enough with him, for he had a much more trustful disposition than Hutchings or Brown or Fortescue, and was also short-sighted at near range. But the general feeling with the doctor was a sense of weariness and undoubted relief when it was over. It was as near like being in church as anything could be beginning at the beginning of subjects bored him in fact he often found when he went back to the very start of a lesson he'd forgotten it himself moving for so many years on only the higher walks of learning and then finding that he had forgotten some footling trifle on the first page of a primer he became abstracted and lost heart about it and seemed more inclined to think than to talk Another very curious habit he had was to start on one thing, say Latin, and then drift off into something else, say geography. Or he might begin with algebra, and then something would remind him of the procession of the equinoxes, or the nebula in Orion, and he would soar from earth and wander among the heavenly bodies until the class was over. And if he happened to be very much interested himself, he wouldn't let it be over. And then we had to sit on, hearing the doctor maundering about double stars or comets, perhaps, while everybody else was in the playground. 
I think he got rather sick of the lower school after about a month of it, and Fortescue took over a good many of the classes in his normal style, which was more businesslike than the doctor and more punctual in its working. Fortescue was cold and hadn't much use for us in school or out, but he was just, and we liked him pretty well until the mystery began. Then we gradually got to dislike him, and then despise him, and then hate him. He was rather out of the common in a way, being an honorable and related to the famous family of Fortescue, which has shown a great deal in history off and on. And of course, when the war broke out, we naturally expected that the Honorable Howard Fortescue would seize the opportunity to shine also, which he could not do as an undermaster at Maryvale. He was a big, fine man, six feet high, with a red complexion and a Roman nose. Certainly he did not play games, but he was all right in other ways, and had been a lawn tennis player of the first class in past times at Oxford, and in fact got his half blue for playing at that sport against Cambridge. So it seemed to us pretty low down that he didn't join Kitchener's army. As a matter of fact, he didn't even try to. He was a very sublime sort of man, and not what you might call friendly to us, yet if anybody appealed to him in any sort of way, he generally thawed a bit and responded in quite a kind manner. We argued a good deal about him, and Travers Major said it was natural pride, because being of the family of Fortescue, he knew there was a gulf fixed between him and us. And Travers did not blame him, and nor did I or Briggs but rice who is irish and who got sent up on the report of fortescue for saying as he thought something disrespectful about the british army hated fortescue with a deadly hatred which was natural because fortescue had misunderstood and rice had really said nothing against the army but against protestants which being a roman catholic himself was merely his point of view and no business of fortescue's and when Fortescue wouldn't become a soldier, Rice left no stone unturned, as they say, to worry about him. At that time, Millie Dunstan, the doctor's youngest daughter, had just come back from a school where she had been finished, and Rice's sister was at the same school, so she took notice of Rice, and it soon turned out that Millie Dunstan also hated Fortescue, I believe he had snubbed her in some way over English literature, at which Fortescue was said to be a flyer, but Milly Dunstan was not. She had, in fact, praised a novel to him, and he had laughed and told her it was quite worthless, and advised her to read some novels by people she had never heard of. And then he had slighted the school where she had finished, and so when Rice explained that Fortescue was a coward and preferred the comparative comfort of Merivale to the manly business of going to Salisbury Plain and living in mud and becoming useful to the Empire, Millie Dunstan quite agreed with Rice and said something ought to be done about it. We helped because we thought the same. In fact, everybody seemed to be of one opinion, and little by little Fortescue began to see signs of great unpopularity growing up against him. At first he ignored these signs, being evidently unprepared to take what you might call a delicate sort of hint. For instance, he smoked a pipe and kept a Japanese vase on the mantelpiece of his study full of black crow's feathers, which he was in the habit of picking up on Merivale Heath, where he often went for lonely walks. With these feathers he cleaned out the stem of his pipe. Well, Millie Dunstan bought a white fowl for the doctor's dinner, and told the man at the shop to send it without plucking the feathers off which he did do, and she got them and gave them to Rice, who dexterously took away Fortescue's black feathers and substituted the white ones. But Fortescue went on just as though he hadn't noticed it, and when Saunders was with Fortescue, having his special coaching lesson for a civil service exam, he said that Fortescue took a white feather and cleaned his pipe with it, as though quite indifferent to the color." Then Milly Dunstan got a ball of knitting wool and four knitting needles, for all of which she paid herself, and Rice once more did the necessary strategy and arranged them on Fortescue's desk, where his eyes would fall upon them on returning to his study. 
but they merely disappeared, and Fortescue gave no sign. Then Travers Major started a very interesting theory on the subject, and he said there must be some reason far deeper than mere cowardice behind the mystery of Fortescue. He said that it was impossible for a Fortescue to be a coward in the common or garden sense of funking danger, but he admitted that he might be a coward in some other way, such as not liking discipline, or living in a tent, or wearing uncomfortable clothes, or getting up early to the sound of a bugle. And Briggs said that he thought perhaps Fortescue was keeping a widowed mother and sister, or an old aunt, or some such person by his exertions at Merivale, in which case, of course, he couldn't go. But Rice didn't see why not, even if it was so, and nor did I, because the government gives full compensation for women relations in general. But Briggs said I had got it all wrong, and that if Fortescue had an aunt, she wouldn't gain a penny by his going to the war, however old and poor she was. In fact, he believed that only a wife who was going to have a baby got anything at all, owing to the great need for keeping up the race. Then Rice said that it didn't make any difference to his deadly feeling against Fortescue, and he also said that he was going on rubbing it into Fortescue, and leaving no stone unturned to make his life a burden to him until he enlisted. And Travers Major said that Rice was feeling the instinct of pure revenge, and Rice said he might be, but that was what he intended to do. Anyway, he was sure the war office and admiralty didn't care a button about aunts. Then we divided into two factions on the subject of Fortescue, and one faction decided to leave him to his conscience and mind its own business, which wasn't driving Fortescue to war, while the other side took the opposite course and decided to work at Fortescue with the utmost ingenuity until, in sheer despair, he was driven to do his duty and Briggs and Travers Major and Travers Minor and Saunders and Hopwood abandoned the pursuit, so to say, while I and Rice and a chap called Mitchell, all ably assisted by Milly Dunstan, continued in our great attempt to wake Fortescue to the call of his country and storm his lines, as Rice said. As for Mitchell, he came into it rather curiously, and it shows how an utter accident will sometimes reveal anybody in their true colors, and surprise other people who thought they knew them and yet didn't. Mitchell was a mere rabbit in character and nothing in learning, and, in fact, he only had one feature beside his nose, and that was his love for money. Money, you might say, was his god, and his financial operations in the matter of loans to the kids were a study in themselves. But over Fortescue he came out in a most unexpected manner, and, much to our surprise, made up a bit of poetry about him, which shows nothing happens but the unexpected, and nobody was more astonished in a sort of way than Mitchell himself, because he never knew he could do it. How to use the poem to the best purpose was a question that Milly solved. She typed it by night on her own typewriter, and then directed Rice at the first opportunity to put it on Fortescue's desk when his study was empty. And he did so, and this is what Fortescue found waiting him when he returned. You ask us lots of questions, and we answer if we can, and now we'll jolly well ask you one, you call yourself a man, then why on earth don't you enlist and try to do your share where the black Mariah's bellow and the shrapnel's in the air? And if you will not tell us why, then we'll tell you instead. It's just because you funk it and would hate to be shot dead. In other words, in fact in one, most honorable Howard, though of the race of Fortescue, you are a bally coward. We didn't much envy Fortescue his feelings when he read these stirring lines, and in fact I, in my hopefulness, believed they would actually win our object and start Fortescue on the path of duty and rouse him from his lethargical attitude to the war. But strange to say, they went off him like water off a duck's back. Not a muscle moved, so to speak, or if it did, nobody saw it do so. He went on his way for all the world as if civilization was not in its death throes. And then Rice, to show you what Rice still felt about it, 
offered mitchell a week's pocket money if he would write yet another poem of even a more fiery and stinging character and mitchell gladly agreed and took enormous trouble and burnt the midnight oil as the saying is and produced certainly a poem full of rhymes and great abuse of fortescue yet not nearly such a fine poem as the first and rice said it wasn't up to the mark and wouldn't pay for it and mitchell said it was a contract and written on commission and must be paid for by law but rice knew no law and he showed the poem to travers major who instantly tore it up and kicked mitchell next time he met him and told him he was a dirty little cad so mitchell cooled off to rice and in fact his next poem was actually about rice not written to order but for pure hate of rice and it was undoubtedly a bitter and powerful poem but rice being far stronger than mitchell made him eat it and swallow it in front of his class though it was written in red ink and mitchell said if he died rice would be hung but he felt no ill effects though he rather hoped he would at this season however a far greater and more splendid poem than any mitchell could do had appeared in england in fact it was set to music and england rang with it also ireland at least so rice said because his mother had told him so in a letter there was a special mention of ireland in it and rice's mother told him that it had made more recruits in ireland than mr redmond and sir edward carson put together rice never does anything by halves and he actually learnt the poem by heart and also found out the tune somehow and sang it when possible once in fact he woke up in the night singing it from force of habit as the saying is and his prefect who happened to be mactaggart said there was a time for everything and threatened to report rice if he did it again i asked rice why he had made such a great effort and learnt anything he wasn't obliged to learn and he said firstly because it was the grandest poem he had ever heard and secondly because he had a great idea some day to sing it to fortescue as it applied specially to him by dwelling on the fearfulness of hanging back when the empire cried out for you the poem said the empire was calling to every one of her sons of low and high degree and so of course it was also calling to fortescue and rice thought that as it was pretty certain fortescue wouldn't read it and no doubt fought shy of patriotic poetry in general just now he meant to wait for some happy opportunity when fortescue was not in a position to get out of earshot and sing it to him but the opportunity did not come so rice adopted the former plan of leaving the poem in fortescue's room he had plenty of printed copies of the words because the poem after first appearing in a london newspaper of great renown had been copied at the special wish of the author into hundreds and thousands of other papers and to show you the tremendous liking people had for it even the merivale weekly trumpet printed it and milly dunstan found it there she by the way had another pretty bitter cut at fortescue which cost more money and she told rice she had paid five shillings and sixpence for her great insult in fact she sent fortescue a shawl and a cap such as is worn by aged women with red white and blue ribbons in it which of course meant that fortescue was an old woman himself it was frightfully deadly if you understood it and rice said that only a girl could have thought of such a cruel thing the parcel was sent by post but once more we were doomed to disappointment as they say for nothing came of it except slight advantage to the matron in fortescue's house in fact he gave her the five shilling shawl but the cap we never saw again and doubtless it was burnt to a cinder in fortescue's fire then rice tried the patriotic poem and so as there should be no mistake he covered the back of it with paste and in this manner fastened it very firmly to the looking-glass just behind the spot where fortescue kept his pipes on the mantelpiece we didn't hope much from it and expected he would merely scrape it off and take it lying down in his usual cowardly manner but imagine our immense surprise when we found he had sneaked to the doctor and even that was nothing compared to the extraordinary confession that he had made to the doctor and it all came out and as mitchell said a bolt from the blue fell on him and me and rice 
after stating the facts of the case which were that mr fortescue had been from the beginning of the term subject to a great deal of annoyance from boys who laboured under the offensive delusion that he ought to go to the front the doctor said it is my honoured friend mr fortescue's wish that i inform you of the circumstances which prevent an action which he would have been the first to take did his physical welfare permit of it but unhappily he suffers from an enlarged aorta and it is impossible for him to take his place in our line of defences though that impossibility has caused him the sorrow of his life it happens however that nature has blessed mr fortescue with abundant gifts while denying him his health and in the pages of that work of reference known as who's who pages that i fear few among you will ever adorn may be found the distinguished name of the hon howard fortescue in connection with notable achievements for mr fortescue is a votary of the muses already he has two volumes of verse to his credit and three works of fiction while in a subsequent edition of the volume it will doubtless be recorded that he was the author of a certain admirable poem which has recently stirred the united kingdom to its depths and sent more young men to the enlisting station than any other inspiration of the time but it was it seems left for one of my pupils to combine idiocy with insolence and affix a copy of his own immortal composition to mr fortescue's looking-glass this was positively the last straw and my esteemed colleague who up to the present time has allowed his sense of humour to ignore your insufferable impertinences felt that it was bad for yourselves to proceed further upon so perilous a path very rightly therefore he called my attention to a persecution i should have thought impossible within these walls he has no desire to give me the names of the culprits and it is well for them that he has not but having placed the whole circumstances in my hands i cannot permit the outrage to pass without recording my abhorrence and shame i may further remind you that wednesday next is our half-term whole holiday and if before that date no private and abject apology is committed to the hands of mr fortescue by those who have disgraced themselves and put this affront upon him if that is not done and if i do not hear from him that he is thoroughly satisfied with the nature of that expression of regret then there will be no half-term whole holiday and righteous and guilty alike will suffer needless to say this tremendous speech made a very great impression on me and rice and mitchell milly dunstan did not hear it but it made a great impression on her too when she heard the facts and we felt in a way that she was a good deal to blame because she could easily have looked up who's who being free of the doctor's library which we were not of course there was no difficulty about the apology which i wrote with help from mitchell but showing what girls are though she had invented most of the things we did to fortescue she calmly refused to sign the apology and said she would apologize personally to him no doubt she did not and rice chucked her afterwards rice was the most cut up he said he should never feel the same again after being such a simple beast and he changed over from hating fortescue to thinking him the most wonderful and splendid man in the world and far the best poet after shakespeare and to show how frightfully rice feels things and the rash way he goes on i can only tell you that when we signed the apology he cut himself on his arm just above the wrist and got two drops of blood and signed with them and after his name he wrote the grim words his blood so that fortescue shouldn't think it was merely red ink the apology went like this we the undersigned members of the lower fourth form of merivale beg to express our great regret for having tried to make the hon howard fortescue go to the front we freely confess we ought not to have done so and that we were much deluded we utterly did not know that he had got an aorta and we are very sorry that he has and we hope that he will soon recover from it and we beg to say that we think his poem the best poem we have ever heard and also better than virgil 
and we hope that he will overlook it on this occasion and are willing to do anything he may decide upon to show the extent of our great regret signed rupert mitchell patrick rice his blood arthur abbott but nothing came of it the honourable fortescue went on his way quite unmoved and treated us just as usual without any sign of forgiveness or otherwise and whether he ever reported our names to dunston or not we never knew but i don't think he did at any rate he must have said the apology was enough which it certainly was and the end justified the means as they say because the whole holiday at half term passed off as usual End of story two. Story three of The Human Boy and the War by Eden Philpotts. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story three The Countryman of Kant. Dr. Dunstan had a way of introducing a new chap to the school after prayers. The natural instinct of a new chap, of course, is to slide in quietly and slowly settle down, first in his class and then in the school. But old Dunstan doesn't allow this. When a new boy turns up, he jaws over him and prophesies about him and says we shall all like him and so on. And if the new chap's father is anybody, which he sometimes happens to be, then Dunstan lets us know the result is that he generally puts everybody off a new chap from the first but the fifth and sixth allow for this as travers major pointed out it's a rum instinct of human nature to hate anything you are ordered to like and to scoff at anything you are ordered to admire so thanks to travers who is frightfully clever in his way and in fact going to woolwich next term we always allowed for the doctor's great hope about a new boy and didn't let it put us off him as a matter of fact dunstan often withdrew the praise afterwards and we noticed for some queer reason that if a boy had a celebrated father he always turned out to be the sort that dunstan hated most and often and often when he had to rag or flog that sort of boy the doctor fairly wept to think what the boy's celebrated father would say if he could see him now when jacob wundt came to merivale dunstan just went the limit about him and it was all the more footling because wundt grinned and evidently highly approved of what was said about him he was the first german the doctor had ever had for a pupil i believe anyway the first in living memory so perhaps naturally he got a bit above himself about it and wundt got a bit above himself too in jacob wundt we embrace one from the hamlet among nations began dr dunstan in jacob wundt we welcome the countrymen of kant and schiller the contemporary of eucken and harnack moreover colonel von wundt his esteemed parent occupies a position of some importance in the fatherland and has done no small part to perfect the magnificent army that great nation is known to possess well we looked at jacob wundt and saw one of the short fat sort with puddingly limbs and yellowish hair close cropped and a fighting sort of head he looked straight at you but he never looked at anybody as though he liked them and we jolly soon found he didn't as to dr dunstan's german heroes we only knew one name and that was schiller but as the fifth and sixth happened to be swatting the robbers for an exam and as the robbers happens to be a ripping good thing in its way we were not disinclined to be friendly to wundt as far as the fifth and sixth can be friendly to a new boy low in the school we soon found that wundt was very un-english in his ideas also in his manners and customs he could talk english well enough to explain what he meant and we soon found that he thought a jolly sight too well of germany and a jolly sight too badly of england at first we thought he had been sent to merivale to make him larger-minded so that he could go back and make other germans more larger-minded too but he said it was nothing of the kind he hadn't come to england to learn our ways which were beastly in his opinion but to get perfect in our language which might be useful to him when he became a soldier he was very peculiar and did things i never knew a boy do before and the most remarkable thing he did was always to be looking on ahead to when he was grown up 
of course everybody knows they're going to grow up and some chaps are even keen about it in a sort of way but very few worry about it like wundt did i said to him once what the dickens are you always wanting time to pass for so that you may be grown up i can tell you it isn't all beer and skittles being a man at any rate i've often heard my father say he wishes he was young again he may answered wundt you've told me your father was an international and a blue and no doubt he'd like to excel at football again but i despise games and i've got very good reasons for wanting to grow up which are private of course he didn't put it in such good english as that but that was the sense of it he wasn't what you call a success generally for he didn't like work except history and he hated our history and there wasn't much going at merivale in the matter of german history but he took to english well and would always talk it if he could get anybody to listen which wasn't often he said it was all rot about english being a difficult language he thought it easy and feeble at best all his people could speak it in fact everybody in germany could when it suited them to do so as for games he had no use for them but he was sporting in his own way his favorite sport consisted in going out of bounds and he showed very decent strategy in doing so and gave even norris and booth a tip or two norris and booth had made a fair art of trespassing in private game preserves at the manor house and other places round about merivale in fact game preserves were just common or garden sunday walks to them and wundt showed them how a reverse like that need never have happened he could turn his coat inside out and do other things of that sort which were very deceptive even to the trained gamekeeper eye and finding a scarecrow in a turnip field he took it and as it consisted of trousers and coat and an old billycock hat wundt was now in possession of a complete disguise he hid the things in a secret haunt that really belonged to norris and booth and they liked him at first and helped him a good deal but finally they quarrelled with him because he said england was a swine's hole and told them that a time was coming he hoped not till he grew up when england would simply be a protectorate of germany whatever that is so they invited him to fight whichever he liked of them and when he refused though just the right weight they smacked his head and dared him to go to their secret cave again when they smacked his head his eyes glittered and he smiled but nothing more he never would fight with fists because he said only apes and englishmen fought with nature's weapons but at single stick he was exceedingly good and in fact better than anybody in the school but forrester he much wished we could use swords and slash each other's faces as he hoped to do when he became a student in his own country and he said it was a mean sight to see old dunson and brown and manwaring and hutchings and the other masters all without a scratch he said in germany every self-respecting man of the reigning classes was gashed to the bone and decent people wouldn't know a man who wasn't because he was sure to be a shopkeeper or some low-class thing like that as to games he held them in great contempt it seems people of any class in germany only play one game and that's the war game kriegspiel he called it i said what the deuce is the good of always playing the war game if you're not going to war and he said ah it was a favorite word of his and he used it in all sorts of ways with all sorts of expressions forbes who like me had a kind of interest in wundt that almost amounted to friendship asked him if women played the war game and he said he didn't know what they played except the piano all women were worms in his opinion of course he gassed about everything german and said that from science and art and music to matchboxes and sausages his country was first and the rest nowhere he joined our school cadet corps eagerly and became an officer of some sort in a month but he was fearfully pitying about it and said that english ways of drilling were enough to make a cat laugh or words to that effect after he became an officer he put on fearful side though as just one of the rank and file he had been quite humble and then when he ordered saunders who wasn't an officer to do something out of drill hours and saunders told him to do it himself he turned white and dashed at saunders who of course licked him on the spot and made his nose bleed 
he was properly mad about that and said that if it had happened in germany saunders would have been shot but as it happened in england of course saunders wasn't travers major tried to explain to wundt that we weren't real soldiers and that when not with the cadet corps he was no better than anybody else but he couldn't see this he said that in his country if you were once an officer you were always an officer and that there was a gulf fixed between the men and their officers and he called saunders cannon fodder to batson and when batson told saunders saunders made wundt carry him on his back up to the gym and there licked him again and made his nose bleed once more much to his wrath on the whole owing to his ideas which he wouldn't keep to himself wundt didn't have too good a time at merivale he couldn't understand us and said we were slackers and rotters and that our mercenary army was no good and that germany was the greatest country in the world and we'd live to know it perhaps sooner than we thought travers major tried hard to explain to him how it was but he couldn't or wouldn't understand travers said it's like this germany takes herself too seriously and other countries not seriously enough an englishman is always saying his own country is going to the dogs and his armies rotten and his navy only a lot of old sardine tins that ought to be scrapped and all that sort of thing that's his way and when you bally germans hear us talk like that you go and believe it and don't understand it's our national character to run ourselves down and you chaps always go to the other extreme and brag about your army and your guns and your discipline and your genius and all the rest of it and of course we don't believe you in the least because gas like that carries its own reward and nobody in the world could be so much better than all the rest of the world as you think you are and if you imagine because we run ourselves down we would let anybody else dare to run us down you're wrong and if you think our free army is frightened of your slave army and would mind taking you on ten to one on land or sea you're also wrong it was a prophecy in a way though travers little knew it for the war broke out next holidays and when we went back to school it was in full swing and so naturally was a wundt he wasn't going home for the vac in any case but stopping at merivale and he had done so he told me the doctor had talked some piffle to him about the duties of non-combatants but as avunt truly said every german in the world is a combatant in time of war and if you can't do one thing you must try and do another in fact old dunston little knew the german character and when he found it out he was a good bit astonished not to say hurt he however discovered it jolly quickly and i did first of all because owing to being rather interested in human nature i encouraged wundt in a sort of way and let him talk to me and tried to see things from his point of view as far as i could that is without doing anything unsporting to england the great point was to keep your temper with wundt and of course most chaps couldn't because he was so beastly sure he was right at least his nation was but i didn't mind all that humbug and found by being patient with him that under all this flare-up he was what you might call deadly keen on his blessed fatherland he fairly panted with patriotism and in these moments quite ignored my feelings now you know why i wanted to grow up he said to me i hope this wouldn't have happened till i could be in it but it will be all over and your country a thing of the past before i'm sixteen worse luck as he was going to be sixteen in october that was a bit hopeful of wundt his father or somebody had stuffed him up that germany was being sat on by the world and couldn't stand it much longer and after the war began he honestly believed that it was the end of england and in a way he was more decent than ever he'd been before when we came back at the end of the holidays wundt welcomed me in a very queer sort of manner somebody had treated me just the same in the past and after trying for a week to think who it was i remembered it was my uncle samuel after i'd lost my mother wundt evidently felt sorry for all of us in general and for me in particular as his special friend of course he said i can't pretend i didn't want it to happen but you won't see it is for the good of the world that your country's got to go down and so i'm sorry for you if anything 
do you really think it has got to go down i asked wundt and he said it wasn't so much what he thought as what was bound to take place either england's got to go or else germany he said and as the teuton is the world power for religion and culture and everything that really matters and also miles strongest england's naturally got to go you've had your turn and now it's ours the kaiser speaks germany listens and obeys booth asked him what day the germans would be at merivale and if he'd got a plan of campaign marked out and he said about the half-term holiday or earlier they would come and booth said that would mean a short term anyway which had its bright side then tracy who is awful sarcastic though it doesn't generally come off asked wundt how he had arrived at this idea and wundt said from reading papers that his father had sent him via holland your papers are chock full of lies he said if you want the truth those of you who can read german can see it in my papers of course some of the six could read german and they followed his papers and were much surprised that wundt really believed such absolute rot against the evidence of our papers but he was simply blind and went so far as to say that he'd sooner believe the pettiest little german rag than all our swaggerest papers let alone the merivale weekly trumpet which was fearfully warlike because the editor had a son who was training for the front but most of all wundt hated punch and finding this out we used to slip the cartoons into his desk and put them under his pillow and arrange them elsewhere where he must find them these made him fairly foam at the mouth and he said he hoped the first thing the germans would do when they got to london would be to go to punch and put the men who drew the pictures and made the jokes to the sword no doubt it was because they were so jolly true the masters were very decent to wundt especially fortescue who saw how trying it must be for him living in an enemy's country and when wundt told me in secret that he felt his position was becoming unbearable and that he had written and asked if he could be exchanged for a prisoner or something he said in a gloomy sort of voice i may tell you i haven't wasted my time here and perhaps some day dr dunston and you chaps will know it to your cost well though friendly enough to wundt i didn't much like that and told my own special chum manwaring what he'd said and manwaring told me that in his opinion wundt ought to be neutralized immediately but i knew enough of wundt to feel certain he could never be properly neutralized because he had told me that once a german always a german and that he'd rather be a dead german than a living king of england and that if he had to stop in england for a million years he'd still be as german as ever if not more so and he'd also fairly shaken with pride because he'd read somewhere that the kaiser had said that he would give any doctor a hundred thousand marks if he would draw every drop of english blood out of his veins and when he said it tracy had answered that if the kaiser came over to england there were plenty of doctors who would oblige him for half the money but now i thought without any unkind feeling to wundt that i ought to tell travers major as head of the school of his dark threats and i did and travers thanked me and said i was quite right to tell him because war is war and uh, you never know of course if wundt was going to turn out to be a spy it wasn't possible for me to be his friend and i told him so and he saw that he said he was sorry if anything to lose my friendship but he should always do all that he considered right in the service of his country and he couldn't let me stand between him and his duty which amounted to admitting that he was a spy or at any rate was trying to be one for of course at merivale a spy was no more use than he would have been at the north pole there was simply nothing to spy about except the photographs of new girls on brown's mantelpiece then travers made a move and he was sorry to do it but he was going to be a soldier just as much as wundt was and though he never jawed about woolwich like wundt did about potsdam yet he was quite as military at heart and though he didn't wear the english colours inside his waistcoat lining like wundt wore the german colours as he admitted to me in a friendly moment yet travers felt just as keen about england as wundt did about germany and quite as cast down when he heard about mons as wundt was when he heard about the retreat on the marne he pretended of course it was only strategy but he knew jolly well it wasn't 
then travers major reluctantly decided that with a spy certain things must be done he didn't like doing them but they had to be done and the first thing was to prove it you can only prove a chap is a spy by spying yourself travers said and well knowing the peculiar skill of norris and booth he told them to keep a careful lookout on wundt and report anything suspicious which they did so because it was work to which they were well suited by their natures and they soon reported that wundt went long walks out of bounds and evidently avoided people as much as possible once they surprised him making notes and when he saw booth coming he tore them up then travers major did a strong thing and ordered that the box of wundt should be searched i happen to know that wundt was very keen to get a letter off by post which he said was important yet hesitated to send for fear of accidents and that decided travers so it was done quite openly and without subterfuge as they say because we just took the key from wundt by force and told him we were going to do it and then did it he protested very violently but the protest as travers said was not sustained and we found his box contained fearfully incriminating matter, for he had a one-barreled breech-loading pistol in it with a box of ammunition, of which we had never heard until that moment, and a complete map on a huge scale of Merivale and the country round. It was a wonderful map, and how he had made it, and nobody ever seen it, was extraordinary. At least so it seemed, till we remembered that he had been here through the holidays on his own there were numbers in red ink all over the map and remarks carefully written in german and though it is impossible to give you any idea of the map which was beautifully drawn and about three yards square if not more yet i can reproduce the military remarks upon it which travers translated into english they went like this and showed in rather a painful way what wundt really was at heart and it showed what germany was too and no doubt thousands of other germans all over the united kingdom had been doing the same thing and still are after the first shock of being discovered i honestly believe he was pleased to be seen in his true colours and gloried in his crime these were the notes in cold blood as you may say one a wood good cover for guns in the middle is a spring where a gamekeeper's wife gets water it might easily be poisoned two a large number of fields some have potatoes in them and some have turnips three a village with fifty or sixty houses and about two hundred and thirty-five inhabitants mostly women and children presents no difficulties four a church with a tower a very good place for wireless or light gun the pews inside would be good for wounded cover for infantry in the churchyard five a stream with one bridge which might easily be blown up but it would not be necessary as the stream is only six feet across and you could easily walk over it too small for pontoons small fish in it six a large field which was planted with corn but is now empty a good place for aeroplanes to land can't find out where corn is gone seven a railroad with one line that goes up to main line could easily be destroyed but might have strategic value eight a hill where guns could be placed that would cover advance of troops on merivale nine the school this stands on rising ground a mile from the hill number eight and could easily be destroyed by field guns or it might easily be used as a hospital it contains a hundred beds and the chapel could easily hold a hundred more there is a garden and a fountain of good water also a well in the house the playing field is a quarter of a mile off tents could easily be put up there for troops ten a village schoolroom three hundred yards from the church it has been turned into a hospital for casualties there are thirteen or fourteen nurses of the red cross waiting for wounded soldiers to arrive they are amateurs but have passed some sort of examination the wounded are said to be coming this place could easily be shelled from the hill marked number eight eleven a forest full of game and in the middle of it a park and the manor house belonging to a man called sir neville carew he has a great wealth and the mansion could easily be looted and then either used for officers or burned down twelve a farm rich in sheep and cattle and chickens also turkeys it would present no difficulties thirteen the sea this is distant ten miles from here and there is an unfortified bay which looks deep 
we went there for a holiday last summer and some of us went out in a boat i pretended to fish and tried to take soundings but regret to report that i failed however the water was quite deep enough for small battlecraft the cliffs are red and made of hard rock there are about twenty fishing boats and a coast guard station on top but i saw no wireless there is a semaphore fourteen a medical doctor's house with a garage would present no difficulties i saw petrol tins in the yard that was all and travers at once decided to hand the map and the pistol and cartridges to dr dunston i'm very unwilling to do it he said but this is a bit too thick altogether it is pure unadulterated spying of the most blackguard sort and if i had anything to do with it i should fine wound every penny he's got and imprison him for six months and then deport him so he took the evidence of guilt to dunston and of course dunston had the day of his life over them some of the masters considered it funny and i believe peacock who translated the map for dunston thought it was rather fine of wundt but old dunston didn't think it was funny or fine either he had the whole school in chapel and hung up the map on a blackboard and waved the pistol first in one hand and then the other and talked as only he can talk when he's fairly roused by a great occasion i believe what hurt him most was wundt saying it would be so jolly easy to knock out merivale and to hear wundt explaining how the school could be shelled fairly made old dunston get on his hind legs in his great moments he always quotes shakespeare and he did now he said he wasn't going to have a serpent sting him twice anyway he also said it was enough to make kant and goethe turn in the graves and that for all he could see they had expended their genius in vain so far as their native land was concerned and then he went on needless to say jacob wundt you are technically expelled i say technically because until i have communicated with your unfortunate father it is impossible literally to expel you to be expelled a boy must be expelled from somewhere to somewhere and for the moment there is nowhere that i know of to where you can be expelled but rest assured that a way shall be found at the earliest opportunity indeed it may be my duty to hand you over to the military authorities and should that be the case i shall not hesitate for the present you are interned wundt merely said ach but he said it in such a fearfully contemptuous tone of voice that the doctor flogged him then and there and travers major thought wundt ought not to have been flogged by rights but treated as a prisoner of war or else shot he didn't seem to be sure which and as for wundt he evidently thought the belgian atrocities were a fool to his being flogged and he got so properly wicked that the doctor had him locked up all night with nothing but bread and water to eat and the gardener to guard him then a good many chaps began to be sorry for wundt but their sorrow was wasted for the very next day dunston heard from his father that wundt could go home through holland with two other german boys who were being looked after by the american ambassador or some such pot in london so he went and after he had gone fortescue asked the doctor if he might have wundt's map as a psychological curiosity or some such thing and dunston said he had burned the map to cinders and seemed a good deal pained with fortescue for wanting to treasure such an outrage wundt promised to write to me when he left but he never did and perhaps if it's true that german boys of sixteen go to the front he may be there now and if he is and if his side wins and if wundt is with the germans when they come to merivale i know the first thing he'll do will be to slay old dunston and the second thing he'll do will be to slay saunders but in the meantime of course there is a pretty rosy chance he may get slain himself not that he'd mind if he knew his side was on top and going to conquer only perish the thought as they say End of story three. Story four of The Human Boy and the War by Eden Philpotts. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story four. Travers Minor, Scout. 
Before the fearful war with Germany began, Dr. Dunstan was not very keen about us joining the Boy Scouts on half-holidays. He liked better for us to play games, and if you didn't play games, he liked you to go out with Brown to botanize in the hedges. It was a choice of evils to me and Travers Minor, because we hated games and we fairly loathed botanizing with Brown unluckily for us he was the foreign master of the lower fourth and so we had more than enough of him in school without seeing him pull weeds to pieces on half holidays and talk about the wonders of nature for that matter he was about the wonderfulest wonder of nature himself if he'd only known it but after the war began old dunstan quite changed his attitude to the boy scouts and in some ways that was the best thing that ever happened for me and travers minor though in other ways it was not i'm called briggs and travers minor and i came the same term and chummed from the first we had the same opinions about most things and agreed about hating games and preferring a more solitary life but we were very different in many respects for travers minor was going to be a clergyman and i had no ideas of that sort my father being a stockbroker in the brighton a market Travers Minor was more excitable than Travers Major, though quite as keen about England, and after being divided for some time between the Navy and the Church, he rather cleverly combined the two professions and determined to be the chaplain of a battleship. His enthusiasm for England was very remarkable, and after a time, though I had never been the least enthusiastic about England before, yet, owing to the pressure of Travers Minor, I got to be. Nothing like he was, of course. He used to fairly tremble about England, and once, when an Irish boy, who didn't know home rule had been passed, said he'd just as soon blow his nose on the Union Jack as his handkerchief, which was rot, seeing he never had one, young Travers flew at him like a tiger from a bow, and knocked him down and hammered the back of his head on the floor of the chapel. As soon as he had recovered from his great surprise, the Irish boy, Rice he was called, got up and licked Travers Minor pretty badly, which he could easily do, being cock of the lower school. But all the same, Rice respected Travers for doing what he did, and when he heard that home rule was passed, he said that altered the case, and never cheeked the English flag again. Then Dunstan changed towards the Boy Scouts, and said to such of us as liked might join them, and about twenty did. We were allowed to hunt about in couples on half-holidays, and the rule for a Boy Scout is always to be on the lookout to justify his existence when scouting, and to assist people, and to help the halt and the lame, and tell people the way, if they want to know it, and buck about generally, and if possible, never stop a bit of scouting till he's done a good action of some kind to somebody. Of course, we had to do our good actions in bounds, and Travers Minor often pointed out, as a rather curious thing, that over and over again there were chances to do good actions if we'd gone out of bounds, sometimes even over a hedge into a field. But he generally found something useful to it, and I generally didn't. The good action that occurred oftenest was to give pennies to tramps, but Travers did not support this. He said, I dare say you've noticed, Briggs, that all these chaps who ask us for money have got starving families at home. Well, if it's true, they ought to be at home looking after them. But it isn't true. As a rule, they spend the money on beer, and when you ask them why they haven't enlisted, they all say they're too short or too tall or haven't got any back teeth or something. We were scouting the day Travers Minor pointed this out, and that was the very afternoon that we met the best tramp of the lot. I should have believed him myself and tried to help him, but Travers, strangely enough, is much kinder to animals and dumb creatures in general than he is to men, especially tramps, and it took a very clever tramp to make him believe him. But this one did. He was old and grizzled and gray, and his mustache was yellow with tobacco. He was sitting, rolling a cigarette in the hedge, and as we passed together in uniform with our scout poles, he got up and saluted us with a military salute. "'What a bit of luck!' he said. "'You're just the chaps I'm on the lookout for.' Travers stopped, and so did I. "'Do you want anything, my good man?' said Travers. "'Yes, I do. I want a sharp boy scout to listen to me. I'm telling secrets, mind you, but you're in the service just as much as I am, and I can trust you.' "'What service?' asked Travers Minor. "'What service are you in?' 
the secret service said the tramp i dare say you think i'm only a badgering old loafer and not worth the price of the boots on my feet far from it i'm sir baden powell's brother that's why i was glad to see you boys come along i don't believe it said travers quite right not to answered the old man that is till i explain as you know the country's fairly crawling with german spies at present and it takes a pretty good chap to smell them out that's my game i've run down thirty-two during the last month and i'm on the track of a lot more but to keep up my character of an old tramp i dress like this and then they don't suspect me and i just meet em in pubs and stand em drinks and tip em a bit of their lingo and pretend i'm german too i was a good deal impressed by this and so was travers minor i've been standing drinks to a doubtful customer only this morning and spent my last half-crown doing it went on the great baden powell's brother that's why i stopped you boys i'm a good way from my base for the moment and i shall be obliged if you can lend me half a sovereign or whatever you've got on you till to-morrow if you let me have your address you shall get it by midday and i'll mention your names to be p next time we meet travers minor looked at the spy in a spellbound sort of way it's a wonderful disguise he said not one of my best though answered the man i never look the same two days running very likely to-morrow i shall be a smart young officer and then again i may look like a farmer or a clergyman or anything it's part of my work to be a master of the art of disguises travers minor began to whisper to me and ask how much money i had then the great spy spoke again i might give you boys a job next saturday afternoon but you'll have to be pretty smart to do it i'm taking a german then i've marked him down at little Middleborough, you know a mile from merivale and on saturday next at the woolpack public house i meet him and arrest him i shall want a bit of help i dare say travers fairly trembled with excitement after that then he felt in his pocket and found he'd only got a shilling and this he gave to the spy without a thought but i happened to have five shillings by an extraordinary fluke it being my birthday and brown had changed a postal order from my mother so i was not nearly so keen about the spy as travers minor travers was a good deal relieved to hear i'd got as much and even then apologized that we could only produce six bob between us the spy seemed rather disappointed and i made a feeble effort to keep my five shillings by saying couldn't you get to the police station they'd be sure to have tons of money there but at the mention of a police station he showed the utmost annoyance combined with contempt he said what's your name and i said briggs well briggs he said let me tell you if there's one thing the secret service hates and despises more than another it's a police station and if there's one bigger fool on earth than another it's a policeman it would very likely be death to my whole career as a spy if i went to a policeman and told who i was don't you ever work with them mr baden powell asked travers and he said never if i can help it so he had the six bob much to my regret and told us to be at the woolpack public house at midborough on the following saturday afternoon he asked what would be the most convenient time for us to be there and we said half past three and he said good then travers asked rather a smart question and said how shall we know you and the spy said i shall be disguised as a farmer in gaiters and the sort of clothes farmers go to market in on saturdays and i shall be in the bar with other men and one of these men will be a very dangerous german secret agent who has a wireless in his house and when we've got him we shall go to his house and destroy the wireless and now you'd better be getting on or people will think it suspicious and you shall have your money again next saturday so we left him and the six shillings with him and i was by no means so pleased and excited about it as travers minor still i was excited in a way and hoped the following saturday would be glorious and travers said it would undoubtedly be the greatest day we had spent up to that time we had gone two hundred yards and were wondering what the german would look like and if he'd make a fight when we were much startled by a man who suddenly jumped out of the hedge and stopped us it was a policeman in a very excited frame of mind what did that bloke up the road say to you he began and travers minor remembering what contempt the great spy had for policemen was rather haughty 
our conversation was a private he answered and the policeman seemed inclined to laugh i know what your conversation was very well he answered soapy william wouldn't tire himself talking to you kids for fun did you give him any money in this insolent way the policeman dared to talk of baden powell's brother his name is not soapy william answered travers who had turned red with anger and he's got no use for policemen anyway no you take your dying oath he hasn't said the policeman if he told you that he's broke the record and told you the truth did you give him money or only a fag we lent him money for a private purpose and i'll thank you to let us pass said travers minor but the policeman wouldn't he's as slippery as an eel he said and i've been waiting to cop him red-handed for a fortnight so now you'd better come and overtake him for he's lame and can only crawl along and when i talk to him you'll be surprised you're utterly wrong travers minor told the policeman you're quite on the wrong scent and if you interfere with that man you'll very likely ruin your own career in the force he's much more powerful than you think but the policeman said he'd chance that and then in the name of the law he made us come and help him it was a most curious experience when we got there the spy had disappeared and the policeman knowing that he could only go about one mile an hour said he must be hidden somewhere near and if you chaps are any good as scouts now's your chance to show it he said by this time i began to believe the policeman for he was a big man and very positive in his speech but travers hated him and if he'd found the spy i believe we would have said nothing but i found him or rather i found his boot he had no doubt seen us stopped by the policeman and then hastened to evade capture there was a haystack in a field and he had gone to it and on one side where it was cut open there was a lot of loose hay and he had concealed himself with the utmost cunning all but one boot this i observed just peeping out from a litter of loose hay and not feeling equal to making the capture myself i pretended i had not seen the boot and went off and told the policeman who was hunting some distance off and also eating blackberries while he hunted he was much pleased and hastened to make the capture and when he arrived and he saw the boot he said hello soapy old pard got you this time my boy then the hay was cast aside and the great spy otherwise known as soapy william rose up it was rather a solemn sight in a way for he took it pretty calmly and said he'd been wanting a fortnight's rest for a long time after the capture the policeman seemed to lose interest in travers minor and me in fact he didn't even thank us but he gave us back our money and it was rather interesting to find that soapy william besides our six shillings had the additional sum of two and seven pence halfpenny also travers minor didn't speak one single word going back to merivale until we were at the gates then he said a thing which showed how fearfully he felt what had happened he said it makes me feel almost in despair about going into the church briggs when there's such wickedness as that about and i said i should think you would want to go in all the more and afterwards when we had changed and had tea and we were in school he got calmer and admitted i was right but he took a gloomier view of human nature afterwards and often on scouting days he said there was more satisfaction in helping a beetle across a road or making a snail safe than there was in trying to be useful to one's fellow creatures we had to go and give evidence against soapy william before a justice of the peace two days later in fact it was sir neville carew who lived at the manor house and he seemed to be very much amused at our evidence and almost inclined to let soapy off but he gave him a fortnight and soapy said to us as he hoped we'd let the great ben powell know how he was being treated and everybody laughed including brown who had gone to the court with us but after that dr dunston cooled off to the boy scouts a lot and when the terrific adventure to travers minor finally occurred about three weeks after travers major said it was a nemesis on old dunston and so undoubtedly it was though not actually in it i heard all the particulars in fact everybody did for naturally dr dunston was the most famous person in merivale and when this remarkable thing overtook him the merivale weekly trumpet had a column about it and everybody for miles round called to see him and say how jolly glad they were it wasn't worse 
it was a fierce afternoon with the leaves flying and the rain coming down in a squally sort of way and travers minor and i went for a drill and after the drill we scouted a bit on rather a lonely road where nothing was in the habit of happening but as travers truly said the essence of scouting is surprise and because a road is a lonely and uneventful sort of road it doesn't follow something may not happen unexpectedly upon it he said no doubt the roads in the valley of the river and in france have been pretty lonely in their time but think of them last september so we went and one motor passed us in two miles and two dogs poaching together also passed and in a field was a sheep which had got on its back and couldn't get up again being too fat to do so we pulled it up in another field was a bull and we tried to attract it and scouted down a hedge within fifty yards of it to see if it was dangerous and warn people if it was and i went to within forty yards of it being a good twelve yards from the hedge at the time but it paid no attention then just at the end of the road we came across an old woman sitting by the roadside in a very ragged and forlorn condition with a basket of watercresses and also about twelve mushrooms thinking she might be lame or otherwise in difficulties travers minor went up to her and said good evening do you want anything and she said yes a plucky lot of things but none of your cheek it wasn't meant for cheek i'm a scout said travers minor and she said oh run along home and ask mother to let out your knickers else you'll bust em travers turned white with indignation but such was his great idea of discipline that he didn't tell her she was a drunken old beast which she was but just marched off but he was fearfully upset all the same and instead of pouring out his rage on the horrid old woman he poured it out on me he had been a bit queer all day owing to a row with brown over a history lesson in which travers minor messed up the story of charles the second and now what with one thing and another he lost his usual self-control and got very nasty he said scouting with another person was no good not with me anyway and i said what have i done and he said you're such a fathead nothing ever happens when you're about i told him to keep his temper and not make a silly ass of himself i also asked him what he thought was going to happen i said we all know you're always ready for anything from an ulan to a caterpillar but it seems to me the essence of scouting is to keep wide awake when nothing is happening like the fleet in the north sea any fool can do things the thing is always to be ready to do them and not get your shirt out and lose your nerve because there's nothing to do this good advice fairly settled travers minor he undoubtedly lost his temper as he admitted afterwards and he said when i want you to tell me my business briggs i'll let you know and i said your first business is to keep your hair on whatever happens and he said then i'll relieve you of my company briggs and before i could answer he had got through the hedge and gone off over a field which ran along a wood i watched him in silent amazement as they say and he crossed the field and entered the wood and disappeared this action alone showed what a proper rage he was in because he had gone into the manor woods which was not only going out of bounds but also trespassing two things he never did it was a fearful loss of nerve and i stood quite still for a good minute after he vanished then my first idea was to go and lug him back but discretion was always the better part of valor with me and always will be owing to my character so i left travers to his fate and hoped he'd soon cool down and come back without meeting a keeper it was growing dusk too and i went to merivale and decided not to say anything about travers minor except that while we were engaged in some scouting operations i had missed him i only heard the amazing tale of his adventure afterwards and though everybody had the story in some shape or form i got the naked truth from travers minor himself in his own words next morning much to our surprise it was given out that dr dunstan was unwell and fortescue read prayers and during that event travers told me all when i left you he said i was in a filthy bait and for once instead of not wanting to trespass and break bounds i did want to and i went straight into the manor woods and badly frightened some pheasants that had gone to roost and was immediately soothed 
they made a fearful row and i thought a keeper would be sure to spring up from somewhere and rather hoped one would in order to afford me an opportunity for an escape but nothing happened and i decided to walk on till i came to the drive and then boldly go along out of the lodge gate well i walked through the wood to the drive just before it got dark i was looking out cautiously from the hedge of the wood to see that all was clear when i observed a man sitting on the edge of the drive for a moment i thought it was that wretched soapy william again he was humped up and nursing his foot which was evidently badly wounded then the man gave a sound between a sigh and a groan and a snuffle and i saw it was dr dunstan of course it was the moment of my life and i felt in a sort of way that my whole future career depended upon my next action my first instinct remembering that norris and booth were both flogged when caught here was a strategic retreat but then my duty as a boy scout occurred to me it was a fearful choice of evils you may say for if i cleared out i was disgraced forever and my mind couldn't have stood it and if i went forward i was also disgraced forever because to be flogged to a chap with my opinions is about the limit i considered what should be done and while i was considering it old dunstan groaned again and said out loud tut tut this is indeed a tragedy that decided me because the question of humanity came in and looking on into the future in rather a remarkable way i saw at once that if i retreated and heard next morning that old dr dunstan was found dead i should feel the pangs of remorse for evermore and they would ruin my life i also felt that if i saved him he was hardly likely to flog me because there would undoubtedly be a great feeling against him if he did you might have done this i said you might have retreated and then gone down to the lodge and told the woman that there was an injured man in great agony lying halfway up the drive you might have given a false name yourself and then when the rescuing party started you might have cleared out and so remained anonymous it would have gone down to the credit of the boy scouts and old dunstan would have been the first to see that the particular boy scout in question preferred for private reasons to keep his identification a secret travers was much impressed by this view i never thought of that he said probably if i had i should have done it anyway i'm sorry i swore at you and called you a fathead briggs you're not a fathead far from it he then continued his surprising narrative in these words anyway i decided to rescue the doctor and stepped out of ambush and said good evening sir i'm afraid you're hurt he was evidently very glad to see me but you know his iron discipline he kept it up even then what boy are you he asked and i told him i was travers minor from merivale and how comes it you are here he asked again i was operating in the woods on my way home sir and i heard your cry of distress we will investigate your operations on another occasion then said the doctor for the moment mine are more important i have had a bad fall and am in great pain you had better run as quickly as possible to the manor house ask to see sir neville carew and tell him that i have met with a very severe accident halfway down his drive whether i have broken my leg or put out my ankle it is not for me to determine i have been drinking tea with sir neville and learning his views as to the war be as quick as you can you will never have a better opportunity to display your agility then i hooked it and ran the half mile or so to the manor house sprinting all the way i soon gave the terrible news and in about ten minutes sir neville carew himself with his butler and his footman set off for the doctor and the footman trundled a chair which ran on wheels and which sir neville carew kindly explained to me he uses himself when he gets an attack of gout which often happens unfortunately he didn't ask me how i discovered the accident which was naturally rather a good thing for me and when we got back to the doctor he told me to hasten on in advance and break the evil tidings so i cleared out and i've heard no more yet but no doubt i shall soon that was the great narrative of travers minor and after morning school brown gave out that the doctor's ankle was very badly sprained but that things would take their course as usual and a bulletin be put up on the notice board in the evening and it was and it said the doctor was better 
Travers Minor heard nothing until three days later, when the doctor appeared on a crutch and read prayers. Then he had Travers up and addressed the school, and Travers saw at a glance that Dr. Dunstan was still in no condition to flog him, even if the will was there. It ended brilliantly for Travers, really because the doctor said he had been an instrument of providence, and he evidently felt you ought not to flog an instrument of providence, whatever he's been doing. He reproved Travers Minor pretty stiffly all the same, and said that when he considered what a friend Sir Neville Carew was to the school, and how much he overlooked and so on, it was infamous that any boy should even glance into his pheasant preserves, much less actually go into them. And Travers Minor was finally ordered to spend a half-holiday in visiting Sir Neville Carew, and humbly apologizing to him for his conduct which he did so, and Sir Neville Carew, on hearing from Travers that he would never do it again on any pretext whatever, was frightfully sporting and forgave him freely, and talked about the war, and reminded him about Sir Baden Powell's brother, and ended by taking Travers Minor into a glass house full of luscious peaches, and giving him two and Travers kept one for me, because he said if it hadn't been for getting into a wax with me, he would never have trespassed and never have had the adventure at all. And I said it wasn't so much me as that beast of an old woman who told him his knickers were too tight. In strict honesty, I said, she ought to have this peach. Then I ate it, and I never want to eat a better. In fact, I kept the stone to plant when I went home. End of story four. Story five of The Human Boy and the War by Eden Philpotts. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story five, The Hutchings Testimonial. Naturally, all Merivale was deeply interested in the adventures of Mr. Hutchings at the front of the war. Of the three masters who had instantly volunteered, only Hutchings had actually gone to the front, being a skilled territorial and holding a commission in the Devons but the other two, Manwaring and Meadows, had to be content with Kitchener's army, because they were ignorant of the subject of warfare, and had to begin at the beginning. Of course, Fortescue would have proudly gone, as his splendid poems on the war and his general valiant feelings showed, and we were very sorry we had misunderstood him, but his aorta being a bit off quite prevented him doing anything, except write splendid poems urging everybody else to go, and no doubt many did go because of them. As for Brown, he was five feet nothing, or thereabouts, and so he wasn't wanted, and I believe in secret he thanked God for it, though in public he said it was the bitterest blow of his life. And Rice, who doesn't fear Brown, asked him why he didn't join a Gurkha regiment, and Brown said nothing would give him greater pleasure, only unfortunately, owing to caste and religion, and one thing and another, it was out of the question. He appeared to bar the Bantam Regiment also, probably not so much as the Bantam Regiment would have barred him. So you may say Merivale only had one man at the positive front, though Jenny Dunstan, the doctor's youngest daughter but two, was engaged to a man in the Welsh Fusiliers, and he was there, and Abbott's father was also there. They were, of course, nothing to us, though no doubt a good deal to Jenny Dunstan and Abbott's mother but all our excitement centered on Hutchings, who was a lieutenant, and was often believed to do the work of a captain when actually under fire. He occasionally sent a postcard to Fortescue, saying that all was well, and I believe Fortescue also got a letter with pieces censored out of it, but he did not show it to us, though he told Travers Minor and Briggs that it was anxious work. This was when the British expedition was falling back, much to its regret but soon the time came when they got going forward again, and then Fortescue bucked up and, I believe, wrote his best poetry. In fact, Fortescue really was a sort of weather-glass of the war, if you understand me, and chaps in his class said that, after a reverse, you could do simply anything with him, and he didn't seem to have the slightest interest in work and didn't care if you were right or wrong and in a way it was equally all right for his class after a victory, for then he was so hopeful and pleased that he never came down on anybody. 
so we hadn't got to read the papers because after seeing fortescue in the morning we always knew the general hang of the war in fact mitchell who was a cunning student of other people's characters though his own was beastly said that you had only to look at fortescue's neck to know how it was going at the front if his head was hanging over his chest it was certain the allies had had a nasty knock and if it was just about normal you knew nothing had happened to matter either way and if it was thrown up and straight and fortescue's eyes were bright behind his glasses then you knew that we had scored or else the french or russians had then a little child could lead fortescue as mitchell said and at last came hill number sixty and the fearfully sad news that hutchings was dead or wounded and many of us would have given a week's pocket money to know which then came the good news under the roll of honor that he was only wounded and after that many of us would have given a week's pocket money to know where presently we heard from dr dunstan that he was in paris and then we heard that he was coming to england and going to the private house of some very sporting rich people who had turned their mansion into a hospital for wounded officers then fortescue heard from hutchings and most kindly gave us the information that he had been wounded in two places the shoulder and the calf of the right leg and we were thankful that it was no worse we were allowed to write to hutchings and barrington who was head boy now that travers major had left composed a letter and everybody signed it and i hope he liked it but then came the great idea of a presentation to hutchings i am blades and it was my idea though afterwards sutherland and thwaites claimed it but i promise you it was mine and we had a meeting in chapel one night before prep at which barrington proposed and i seconded the great thought that we should make a collection of money for a memorial to hutchings barrington said we are met together for a good object namely to collect money for a valuable memorial of his bravery in the war for mr hutchings or i should say lieutenant hutchings everybody here even his own class likes him and the new boys who do not know him would equally like him if they did no doubt there will be a very fine medal of hill number sixty struck and presented to our troops who were in that terrific battle and no doubt lieutenant hutchings will get it but it often takes years and years before war medals are struck and presented to the heroes of a battle and i have heard that some of the medals from the battle of waterloo are still hanging fire and many ought to have had them who died a natural death long before they were sent out so i propose that we make a collection for mr hutchings and present him with a valuable object before he goes back to the war because if we leave it till afterwards it may be too late and i said i beg to second the excellent speech you have just heard and if anybody is of a different opinion let him say so it was carried then barrington said we must have a committee of management with a secretary and treasurer and it was done the committee consisted of me and barrington and sutherland and thwaites and rice who would not have been on such an important thing in the ordinary way was proposed because he was enormously popular and would be able to persuade many to subscribe who would not otherwise do so without great pressure that only left the treasurer and well knowing mitchell's financial skill and mastery of arithmetic in general i proposed him some chaps who owed mitchell money were rather shy of voting for him but finally they decided it was better to have him for a friend than an enemy and so they voted in his favor i myself owed mitchell three shillings for which i was paying tuppence a week which was a fair interest and personally i always found him honorable though firm anyway he was made treasurer and he said the subscription list must be posted in a public place because in these cases people like to see their names where other people would also see them and that publicity was the backbone of philanthropy we left it with him as he thoroughly understood that branch of the testimonial and meanwhile from time to time the committee met to consider what ought to be bought and we differed a good deal on the subject 
I thought, as Hutchings would certainly go back to the war when he was well, we ought to buy him a complete outfit of comforts, including blankets, tobacco, of which he was very fond, a thermos flask, a wool helmet, day socks, night socks, a mouth guard to keep out German stinks, and, in fact, everything to help him through the misery of warfare, including a filter for drinking water. And Sutherland was rather inclined to agree with me, but the others were not. Thwaites said, "'My dear Blades, you talk as if you were his grandmother. No doubt he's got women relations to look after paltry things like that. But a testimonial rises to a much higher plane, in my opinion. It ought to be something that will last forever and not wear out and be forgotten.' And Rice said, "'Get the man a revolver.' And Barrington said, "'He's got one.' And Rice said, of course he has, and if we get him another, then he'd have two, and that means six less Germans some day, very likely. But Barrington didn't approve. We want a testimonial that has nothing to do with actual battle, he said. The war won't last forever, and we ought to buy something useful, and also ornamental, that Hutchings will be able to employ in everyday life when all is over. We want something that will catch his eye a hundred times a day, and pleasantly remind him and his family of his heroic past, and us. An heirloom, in fact, said Thwaites. But I argued that practical comforts at the critical moment would be far better than an heirloom for future use, because if he didn't have the mouth guard and filter and so on, he might die. And where would the heirloom come in then? I said, what's the good of knowing you've got a silver ink pot or a tea kettle or a cellaret full of whiskey at home when you're perishing for a wholesome drink in the field? And Barrington said that was petty, and so did Thwaites. They seemed to think that the remembrance of our testimonials safe at home would carry Hutchings safe through all the horrors of the campaign. It turned out that I had rather touched up Barrington, for he had actually been thinking about a silver ink pot, and Thwaites had been thinking about a cellaret with three bottles of various spirits. But I told them flatly I didn't agree with them. Then they asked Sutherland his idea, and he said it wasn't so much what we should like as what Hutchings would. He said, perhaps a very fine meerschaum pipe mounted in silver with an inscription would do, because there you have a creature comfort of the first class, and also a testimonial which would not wear out, and a pipe would be far more to Hutchings, either in war or peace, than an ink pot, or in fact anything of that sort. And Rice said, why not get the man a sword? He could use it in the war, and if all went well, he could hang it up in his home afterwards. And if there was blood on it, then he'd have great additional pleasure every time he looked at it, and so would his family. Barrington rather liked the sword, but he said that classy swords were frightfully expensive, and he doubted whether we should run to it. Then the committee broke up, to meet again when we found out how the subscriptions came in. Unfortunately, this department of the testimonial was very slow. Mitchell, with great trouble, wrote out a list of the whole school, and was allowed to put it on the notice board. Class by class, he wrote it, 132 boys, he wrote, with money columns and a line leading from each boy to the money column. On it, in large ornamental letters, Nicholson, who was a dab at printing, put the words, Testimonial Fund to Lieutenant Hutchings from Merivale School. Then we all waited breathlessly for the result in the money column. There was some delay because everybody, of course, wrote home on the subject and mentioned it in the next Sunday's letters, and we pointed out to the kids that a good and useful thing to write home about, and something at least to fill two pages, would be the Hutchings testimonial. Whether they made the appeal or not, of course, none could tell, but if they did, the response was fearfully feeble. When questioned, they said that their people at home had done such a frightful lot for the war already that further cash for Hutchings was out of the question, while other parents wrote back not that they had done much for the war, but that the war had done much for them in a very unfavorable manner. The result was apparently the same in each case, and the lower school, all except Peterson in the third, responded very badly to the appeal. 
he produced ten bob much to our amazement and there was one other ten bob secured by abbott through his mother because his father was at the front and still unwounded as for the sixth who headed the list we all gave three bob to a man except barrington who gave five the fifth came out at about one and ten pence a head which was fair without being particularly dazzling but the fourth fell away a good deal and after that there was a hideous array of blanks mitchell said it was probably owing to the utter failure of the dividends of the parents of the lower school and as we could not apparently make bricks without straw we considered how to tackle the lower school there is no doubt the failure was genuine for many of them had even their pocket money reduced so pegram who had only subscribed a shilling himself by the way proposed that the kids should be invited to give property instead of cash he said if they all yield up something they value we can collect the goods in a mass and have a sale and the proceeds of the sale can go to the hutchings testimonial the committee approved this excepting thwaites who thought nothing of it but when asked to give his objection he merely said wait and see which we did do and found that thwaites was wonderfully right and had looked on ahead much farther than us the kids agreed willingly to subscribe in goods and were only too delighted to do so but when it came to the point the goods of the kids proved utterly worthless in the open market it was a revelation in a sort of way to see the things the kids valued and honestly thought were worth money in fact preston said it was pathetic and pegram said we had a good foundation for a rubbish heap but nothing more they brought string and screws and nails also the glass marbles from a certain make of ginger beer bottle and knives fearfully out of order and corkscrews and padlocks without keys and a few threadbare story books and three copies of hymns ancient and modern and two old horseshoes and catapults and bullets and shot and charms they also brought three steel watch chains and one leather one and percy minimus offered a watch chain made from his mother's hair so he said but nobody bid for it naturally for who on earth wants a watch chain made of somebody else's mother's hair there was also a bottle imp fourteen india rubber balls and seven golf balls all worn out two kids cricket bats unspliced three pairs of tan gloves new but small and one pair of wool ones eight neckties not new and a silk handkerchief given to tudor in case he had a cold in his head but not required up till now and therefore new among other items was half a packet of sanatogen also from tudor a box of chocolate cigarettes several conjuring tricks mostly out of order and three guinea pigs alive of other live things were included a white rat with pink eyes and a hairless pinkish tail and a dormouse which mather said was hibernating though mitchell thought was dead it proved alive on applying warmth and fetched five pence lastly there was a chrysalis into which a remarkable caterpillar found by hastings on the twenty first of last september had turned and as nobody knew the species of moth to be presently produced by it hastings thought it worth money and put a reserve of tuppence on it but the chrysalis was long overdue and so it did not reach the reserve and so hastings who was still hopeful bought it back for that sum as a matter of fact it never turned into anything and was found to be quite hollow when examined there was a good deal of other trash hardly worth mentioning and many lots at the sale did not produce any offer at all let alone competition and the owners of these lots thankfully got them back again though of course sorry that they commanded no market value and some kids were much surprised to find their rubbish had no value at all in the eyes of the larger world so to speak one way and another the sale realized eight shillings and fourpence chiefly owing to the generosity of rice who gave the absurd sum of two shillings for the guinea pigs which were not even the chrysanthemum variety of pig with wild and tousled hair but just sleek ordinary pigs and known to be far past their prime one in fact had a bald head 
the hutchings testimonial now stood at four pounds fourteen shillings and sevenpence and thanks to a windfall in the shape of five shillings from cornwallis who had a birthday and got a pound for it we were now practically up to a fiver in fact i myself flung in the five pence but we were far from satisfied for as mitchell with his mathematical mind pointed out five pounds spread over one hundred and thirty-two boys amounts to the rather contemptible smallness of nine pence and one eleventh a boy we raised the question of inviting the masters to come in from dr dunston downwards and some fondly thought that dunston would very likely give another five pounds to double ours but barrington said he had reason to fear this would not happen because from rumours dropped between brown and fortescue which he had accidentally overheard while working in fortescue's study he believed that a good many parents were putting the moratorium in force on the doctor and fortescue seemed to think that it was quite within human possibility that the doctor might put the moratorium in force on him and brown with very grave results to their financial position but brown said the moratorium was over long ago and could not be revived against them then two things of considerable importance happened on the subject of the hutchings testimonial firstly we heard that hutchings might come to merivale for a week or so before returning to his regiment and secondly mitchell made a very interesting offer concerning the five pounds now deposited with him he said very truly that money breeds money in skilled hands and that no financier worthy of the name ever lets his talent lie hid in a napkin but far from it he said to the committee it's like this we are now a fortnight from the holidays and the holidays will be five weeks long five and two are seven therefore it follows that for seven weeks this five pounds is doing nothing whatever this would be untrue to the science of political economy and banking therefore i propose that i send the five pounds to my father and ask him to invest it in his business my father john septimus mitchell esq is a member of the stock exchange of london and would no doubt very easily turn our five pounds into six or even seven in the course of seven weeks this would greatly increase the power of the committee and the extent of the testimonial for hutchings and then at the beginning of next term we shall be able to buy and present the testimonial in person to hutchings well knowing mitchell it was rather a delicate question in a way but what he said was sound finance as barrington admitted and barrington himself felt thoroughly inclined to trust mitchell we went into a sort of private committee after mitchell had gone and though i and thwaites voted against the majority was in favour of agreeing to the suggestion of mitchell and therefore it was done then mitchell sent the five pounds to his father and gave us the cheering news that his father had received it and agreed to invest it at interest and mitchell handed barrington a document from his father to show all was being rightly managed on the stock exchange about it and barrington kept the document carefully as it was legal and had a penny stamp on it we next returned to the question of the testimonial itself and still could not agree about it though we were now able to argue on the basis of seven pounds instead of five we had agreed about a sword but unfortunately found on inquiries that a sword worthy to be called a presentation sword would cost about fifty pounds and ought to have rubies and emeralds in the handle which was of course out of the question many things were suggested but none somehow met the case and we fairly kicked ourselves to think that a committee like us were such a lot of fat heads and of course dozens of the chaps asked us about it and were rather surprised we couldn't think of the right thing proposals were showered in but all to no purpose and the end of the term actually arrived without anything being settled it was then agreed that we should all think hard about the form of the testimonial during the holidays and barrington hoped that events at the front might develop and help us to hit on a happy idea and we all hoped so too as for mitchell he said that he thought very likely hutchings would rather have the money than anything else but that was of course what mitchell himself would rather have had though far below the mind of a patriotic man like hutchings 
and thwaites said rather scornfully to mitchell that no doubt he would rather have money than an heirloom to hand down to the future generations and mitchell said that he undoubtedly would because money was out and away the best possible sort of heirloom and everybody knew it at heart even though they might pretend different then the holidays took place and the prizes were decidedly skimpy which was a disappointment to those who got them and a comfort to those who didn't nothing of any consequence occurred to me during the holidays and i had no idea for hutchings worth mentioning and when we all returned we found the committee as a whole were in the same position as before there were many suggestions made certainly but none that pleased the entire committee then a dreadful thing upset the situation and for three days the darkness of returning to school was made darker still by a sensational rumor mitchell did not turn up on the appointed afternoon and it was whispered that he wasn't coming back at all presently the whisper grew into a regular roar so to speak and brown announced the tremendous news that mitchell had left altogether and might be going straight into his father's business of being a stockbroker on the stock exchange london to add to this hutchings was now staying at merivale with the doctor for a few days before going back to the war and he had already heard about the testimonial and was undoubtedly in a great state of excitement about it his wounds had taken an unexpectedly long time to heal but he was now quite ready for renewed activity at the front and was in fact going back on the following friday with other healed heroic men our position had now become extremely grave and we held a committee meeting instantly and thwaites and i were in the position of the late lord roberts when he clamoured for an army and couldn't get one because we had strongly advised that mitchell should not be allowed to send the money to his father but the committee had outvoted us i was dignified myself and did not remind the committee of my views but thwaites did and there was a good deal of bitterness in the remarks of the committee till barrington reminded us of the legal document which we had preserved with such care he said that he was not in the least alarmed and felt sure that whatever mitchell might be the father of mitchell was a man of honour and would not risk his position on the stock exchange of london for a paltry seven pounds so we wrote to the address on the legal document stating the case and saying politely but firmly that we expected the seven pounds by return of post we added that we trusted mitchell's father implicitly and that as the matter was very urgent owing to mr hutchings being just off again to the front we hoped that he would be so good as to give it his personal attention the moment he received our letter this we all signed to show how many people were interested and that it was a serious affair for three very trying days we heard nothing and the school was in a fair uproar and the committee got itself very much disliked then when we had decided to put the matter into the hands of dr dunstan mitchell himself wrote to me and sent a check signed by his father but it was not for seven pounds i regret to say in fact it was not even for six his wretched father had merely sent us back our five pounds with seven pence added mitchell explained that we had received four per cent for our money and that he was sorry nothing better could be done for the moment owing to the stock exchange being very much upset by the war and he asked us for a stamped receipt for the money which we sent him in very satirical language and said that no doubt his father had made the two pounds himself and we promised faithfully that when we grew up and had dealings on the stock exchange of london they wouldn't be with mitchell and his father barrington by the way wouldn't sign this piece of satire which was invented by tracy all the same we sent it but mitchell never answered it and soon afterwards he turned up again having merely been ill and not going to leave at all hutchings was going on the following friday and something had to be done at once the committee which was now fairly sick of the sight of one another met again for the last time i'm glad to say and the question being acute as thwaites said we proposed and seconded that a master or two should be invited to help us with ideas 
Then I thought of something still better, and suggested that we should simply and straightforwardly go to Hutchings himself, and ask him what he most wanted in the nature of an heirloom that could be got for five pounds and sevenpence, and everybody gladly seconded this idea, though of course it was not so impressive as making a presentation with a few dignified words and the whole school present, as we had meant to do however we went to hutchings and he was much pleased and said it was ripping of us all and promised the morning before he went to try and get us a half holiday as a memory of him this was good but still better was the great ease with which hutchings decided what he wanted he said i'll tell you what i'll do on my way through london to dover i'll buy a pair of field glasses and i'll have inscribed somewhere on them to lieutenant t hutchings from merivale school we agreed gladly to this and so did everybody and several chaps who had suggested this very thing and been turned down reminded us afterwards at any rate hutchings got them and wrote to barrington from a direction he couldn't name to say he'd got them inscribed and all and they were splendid glasses and that we might picture him often using them on the field to mark the enemy's position or sweep the sky for aeroplanes which was very agreeable to us to hear and showed all our trouble was by no means in vain and in return we wrote to hutchings and told him we were very pleased to know about the glasses and were glad to inform him that we had got the half holiday and though it unfortunately poured without ceasing all the time it was quite successful in every other way end of story five Story six of The Human Boy and the War by Eden Philpotts. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story six The Fight. My name is Rice, and there was only one thing I hated about the war, and even that I had to stop hating because of England. My first feeling was the war had come too soon, and that if it had only been four years later, I should have been there but saying this to tracy he pointed out that from england's point of view it was lucky the war had come when it did because every year was making the germans stronger while we went gaily down the hill reducing our navy and our army too so it was a jolly good thing the great war hadn't waited till i went into the army in fact in four years by all accounts there mightn't have been any army to go into no doubt you'd have been a host in yourself rice said tracy in his comical way meaning a joke that i easily saw but all the same as we had to fight germany the sooner we did it the better so i gave up hating the sad fact of not being there though it was extra rough on me because many people seemed to think it was going to be the last war on earth and if that was so my occupation was gone and i might just as well not have been born except for the simple and rather tame pleasure of being alive but what's the good of that if you're not going to do anything worth mentioning from the cradle to the grave as the saying is as far as mere fighting went i did all i could at merivale and after seven regular fights got to be cock of the lower school and in ordinary times i should have been cock of the whole school but curiously enough there was one chap of very unusual fighting ability at merivale when i was there and he was rightly regarded as cock of the school in the science of fighting it happened also that he and i were tremendous chums such chums as are seldom seen for we had similar ideas on all subjects and never differed even on the subject of the boxing art in fact we only differed because i was going into the navy and sutherland minor was going into the law he had no taste for soldiering like his brother sutherland major though great genius for boxing in which he took after his father and as his father was in the law and wanted him to go into it he resolved to obey but to me the law seemed a feeble profession and i often tried to dissuade him from it sutherland minor was sixteen and a half and tall i was fifteen and three inches shorter he had better biceps than me and a longer reach and he said i had a better punch than him but less science after my third fight he always let me second him in his fights 
but he only had two before this particularly interesting fight i am going to mention and one was against blades which he won after six rounds by excellent science and far superior footwork to blades and the other was against a chap called pingley who only came for one term and gave himself frightful airs because he was a cornishman but i shouldn't think cornwall had much use for him one day sutherland said that the cornish might be very good at catching pilchards and digging up tin but they didn't seem much good at enlisting in kitchener's army and pengelly said there was a reason for that though he refused to tell us what the reason was then he got into a fearful bait and little knowing the truth about sutherland challenged him to fight which of course sutherland instantly agreed to Pengelly was very big and strong, and if he had been able to hit Sutherland as often as he wanted to, the fight might have been interesting. But having no science whatever, he was useless against Sutherland. By sheer strength, he stuck to it for eight rounds, during which time he got a fair doing, and Sutherland was hardly marked. But then, though by no means all in, Pengelly realized that he wasn't going to get a knuckle on Sutherland, and so he gave up. He wasn't a bad chap, really, though rather foolish about Cornwall, and he even said to me deliberately that a Cornishman was as good as an Irishman, which showed, if anything, that he was weak in his head. And after his fight with Sutherland, he asked him again what the reason was that Cornwall was so slack at enlisting, and he said that the truth was that half of all Cornish chaps go into the navy, which owing to Cornwall being almost surrounded by sea, they prefer. But whether that's true or only a piffling excuse, I don't know. Anyway, when it came to counting up the most famous men Cornwall ever produced, he could only mention Sir Humphrey Davy, who invented the safety lamp for miners, which was undoubtedly all right in its way, and Q, who wrote Dead Man's Rock, and was knighted for doing so. And nobody ever deserved it more. But that was all, whereas when it came to Ireland, of course, I could count up thousands of the greatest heroes in creation, including Mr. Redmond, who has just got home rule for us after fearful obstacles. But I never fought Pengelly. There wasn't time, for he only had one term at Merivale, and then, I believe, went to Canada suddenly to an uncle there. After that began the curious affair between me and Sutherland, but as it was remarkable in every way and will never be forgotten by our families, I may mention them. In the first place, Sutherland's mother was a chronicle invalid. I said it must be very difficult to love a person who lived in bed and never be any use out of doors or ride to hounds or anything. And he said that it made no difference and that he was accustomed to it because his mother had always been an utter crock ever since he knew her and even at her best when she was feeling unusually fit she only changed her bed for a sofa in his father's study apparently she was just as keen about him as my mother was about me and though she didn't much care to hear about his fights she tried to understand the beauty of them like his father did but naturally this father was more to Sutherland than the mother could be, because his father had been amateur middleweight champion of England in his time, and held the cup for three years, and had been runner-up twice also. He was, therefore, a very great boxer and fighter, and Sutherland had been taught by his father, which accounted for his genius at it and his style, which was very finished. He would undoubtedly have been a pro if he had been in another walk of life, but as it was, he fully intended to do as well as his father had done in the amateur boxing world, though as he was growing very rapidly and was also a great eater, it looked as if he would end up by being a heavyweight, which his father never was. Though, as Sutherland told me, his father had beaten a few good heavyweights in his time, though he never touched twelve stone in his boxing days. Sutherland Major, by the way, had just left Merivale when the war broke out, and he instantly went into the OTCs and soon became a second lieutenant and went to France. 
this father of sutherland was a lawyer and sutherland regretted to say that the war had done him harm as owing to it apparently people were not going to law nearly so much as usual still he thought after the war he might find a great improvement he was a lawyer of the sort called a barrister and wore a wig and gown and pleaded for criminals before the judges and juries on the western circuit often getting them off when it looked jolly bad for them so sutherland said but my father was quite different being a gentleman at large and funnily enough owing to the war he made the first money he had ever made in his life for he had a great knowledge of horses and the war office hearing of this let him go out and choose and buy horses for it which he willingly did and for his trouble he got the enormous sum of a guinea a day my mother sent me a sovereign of my father's earnings and told me to keep it and bore a hole in it and put it on my watch chain and be proud of it but this i did not do because a sovereign is a sovereign and i simply couldn't see a good sovereign wasting its time so to speak on my watch chain then one day walking as usual with sutherland on the way to a footer match in which we were both playing both being in the first soccer team him at right back and me at right half we got talking about a fight i rather hoped to have with briggs and sutherland was trying to think of a casus belli which in english means a reason for the fight but knowing briggs he said no casus belli would ever arise and i said in that case if briggs were willing we might fight for a purse if anybody would subscribe one and then sutherland reminded me that i should become a pro and briggs also if that were done he said briggs wouldn't fight just for the sake of fighting and as you and he are very good friends and there's no needle in it it looks difficult then we talked and then he happened to say about fighting in general and weights and so on you might just as well think of licking him speaking of hutchings who had gone to the front as you might of licking me of course i said it would be absurd that was the whole conversation and i forgot it while the match was on and in fact it didn't come back to me till i went to bed that night and then it fairly kept me awake and i was fearfully sorry i'd said it would be absurd for me to think of licking sutherland in fact i got sorrier and sorrier and then i wondered why the dickens sutherland thought it was such a mad idea my licking him and before i went to sleep i felt in a way rather sick with sutherland for having such a poor opinion of me in the morning the feeling was still there and he noticed i was a bit off and asked me if i was all right and i said i was but it weighed fearfully and i fairly got to hate myself in about two days for having said the idea of my licking sutherland was absurd in fact the more i thought about it the less absurd it seemed i knew he was heavier and had a longer reach and was older and more scientific but he himself had said that i had a fine punch and if you've got that you never know what may happen and many an unlikely thing has come off in the ring owing to unexpected smacks landing at the right moment in the right place after a good deal of hard thinking and going down about four in my form which landed me at the bottom i felt i must speak to sutherland or i should burst so when he asked me for the thousandth time what was the matter and if anybody had scored off me or anything i said look here sutherland you remember that while going to the footer match last week you said i might just as well think of licking you as of licking hutchings and he said well yes i remember and i said i told you it was absurd didn't i you did naturally answered sutherland well i said i was wrong it wasn't in the least natural for me to say that and there was nothing absurd about it it's been on my mind ever since and now i see it wasn't absurd what wasn't absurd said sutherland the idea of your licking hutchings or the idea of your licking me the idea of my licking you i said firmly for a moment sutherland was quite silent do you really think so he asked yes i said after considering it quietly in bed and in chapel and at many other times i can't see anything absurd about it in fact rice you think you might have a chance against me 
suggested Sutherland. I don't say that it would be much of a chance, I told him. Probably you'd do me because you're a lot cleverer and more scientific, but when I said absurd, I went too far. Sutherland considered. You're quite right, he admitted. You might get over a lucky one. It's very unlikely, but you might. Therefore, there would be nothing absurd about our fighting, and I oughtn't to have suggested there was. Somehow, I never regarded us as in the same street. But, of course, we may be. We're not, I said, as for boxing on points, we're not. But fighting is different, and, well, there you are. He nodded. If you feel like that, he said, of course. I never did feel like that. In fact, I never thought of it before, I told Sutherland. But now... He didn't say anything, so I went on. It's a matter of honor, in a way, I said. From your point of view, it is, no doubt, he answered. Isn't it from yours? I asked him. Not exactly, he explained. We're very good friends, in fact, more than just common or garden friends, and I never thought of fighting you, regarding you as cock of the lower school, and not supposing the question would ever rise between us, as I shall probably leave Merivale before you get into the upper school, if ever you do. Still, as you feel your honor makes you want to fight me, you must, of course." there's no casus belli otherwise i said and sutherland answered that honour was the best casus belli possible he said of course if you honestly feel that i have wounded your honour rice we must fight and i said well you haven't wounded it exactly in fact i don't know what the dickens you have done but you've done something, and though you're my chum, and I hope you always will be forevermore, yet I don't believe I shall get over this feeling, or in fact be any more good in the world till we fought. As a matter of fact, said Sutherland, you've wounded your honor yourself by thoughtlessly agreeing to my suggestion that you couldn't lick me. Still, whatever has done it, the result is the same, I'm afraid. I'm afraid it is, I said. I suppose no two chaps ever arranged a thing of this sort in a more regretful frame of mind, for we had always been peculiarly friendly, and the idea of ever fighting had never occurred to us. But it was just that fatal remark of Sutherland showing his point of view, and showing me with only too dreadful clearness his opinion of me as compared with him and the queerest thing of all was that I quite agreed with him, really, only there was a feeling in me I couldn't possibly let it go at that, and of course there was also a secret hope that after all Sutherland and I might be mistaken about his being such a mighty lot better than I was. So we agreed to fight on the following Saturday afternoon, as there was only a second eleven match on our own ground, and we should have leisure to go into the wood close by, where these affairs were settled. Needless to say, the world at large was fearfully surprised when it heard we were going to fight. We still pottered about together in our usual friendly way, and when we were asked, as of course we were, what we were fighting for, it was more than I could do to explain, or Sutherland either. Travers Major understood the truth of the situation, and I think Thwaites did, and possibly Preston, but to have tried to explain to anybody else the frightfully peculiar situation would have been impossible, for they hadn't the minds to understand it. So we just said, in a general sort of way, we were still chums, but felt such a tremendous interest in the question of which was the greatest fighter, that we were going to find out in the most friendly spirit possible. Of course, being easily the two best in the school, the sensation was huge, but the general opinion seemed to be that I must be mad to think of beating Sutherland, and I never argued much about it and said very likely I was, but that I hated uncertainty in a thing like that. Pegram said, It will be your sedan, Rice, meaning that I should be treated by Sutherland like the French were treated by the Germans on that occasion. But I did not think so. I said, Most likely I shall be licked and badly licked, which is nothing against such a man as Sutherland, but it won't be my sedan by long chalks, because we've agreed whichever wins it will make no difference. 
certainly there will be no indemnity said pegram as you're both far too hard up for any such thing but you needn't think the beaten one will ever feel the same again to the winner because human nature is all against it your human nature may be i said to pegram who was a foxy chap great at strategy but otherwise mean your human nature may be like that but mine and sutherland's is not all the same i had pegram to second me because he is full of cunning and i also had travers minor and sutherland had abbott who is a very fine second and would be a fine boxer too but for a short leg on one side williams was his other second and travers major consented to be referee fighting was not allowed at merivale but travers though head of the school and never known to break any other rule supported fair fighting because he believed it was good and he also believed that the doctor did not really much dislike it though no doubt to parents he had to say he did brown however hated fighting and as he was master in charge on the appointed day we had to exercise precautions and keep the fight as quiet as possible though favourable to fighting as a rule travers never cared much about my fight with sutherland and even tried to make us change our minds but he had no reasons that we thought good enough or rather that i thought good enough because of course i was the challenger and sutherland had no choice but to agree it turned out that sutherland was rather glad of the fight because it distracted his mind from sadness a fortnight before he had been home from saturday till monday to see his mother who was worse because his brother tom or sutherland major was in the trenches and his father had been very gloomy about it so the fight served to cheer him up and brighten his spirits which was one good thing it did then the eventful day arrived and the fortunate chaps who knew that this was the appointed time looked at me with awe and as we were getting up in our dormitory percy minimus whispered to me you'll look a very different spectacle tonight from what you do now rice the morning seemed long and i jolly near messed up the whole thing and had a squeak of being kept in for the half holiday but i escaped and at last the time came when the footer match was in full swing and brown with a lot of kids watching it then one by one about fifteen of us strolled off including sutherland and me and our seconds and travers major and preston and blades and saunders and perkinson and ash and percy minimus who liked the sight of blood if it wasn't his own no time was lost and a ring was made with a bit of rope while sutherland and i prepared they were two-minute rounds and ash kept the time no two chaps ever shook hands in a more friendly spirit and as to the fight itself as i cannot relate it i may copy the notes that blades took he missed a good many delicate things that we did but the general description though not at all in regular sporting language gives a fair idea of how it went he wrote these words round one sutherland seemed thoughtful and not so much interested as rice rice advanced and dodged about and struck out into the air several times and danced on his feet and once he would have hit sutherland but sutherland ducked his head under the blow and before rice could recover hit him with both fists on the body rice laughed and sutherland smiled they were dancing about doing nothing when ash called time and they rested and their seconds wiped their faces and rice blew his nose with his fingers round two now sutherland began to hit rice a good deal oftener than rice hit him but in the middle of the round rice got in a very fine blow on sutherland's face and knocked him down sutherland instantly rose bleeding but by no means troubled he praised rice and said it was a beauty and rice said don't patronize me sutherland but sutherland did not answer for the rest of the round sutherland hit rice several times but didn't make him bleed it was a good round and both were panting at the end round three sutherland wouldn't let rice get near enough to hit him and kept catching rice's attempts on his arms and his arms being longer than rice's he could land on rice without being hit back he did not hit so hard as rice but he hit rice whereas rice hit the air still rice got in a very good one just in the middle of sutherland's body which doubled up sutherland and before he could undouble again rice had hit him very hard on the face with an uppercut 
sutherland fairly poured with blood but was quite cool and showed no signs of not liking it he got in a very good blow with his left on rice's neck before ash called time round four it was certainly a very fine fight of much higher class than we had ever seen before at Maribel. this round was the fiercest up to now and travers major had to caution rice for being inclined to use his head still he fought very finely but it worried him fearfully to be hit so often without getting one back the hits were not heavy hits to the spectator but they must have been harder than they looked because rice who has black hair and a very pale skin by nature was now getting a mottled sort of skin in this round they were rather slower than before and stood and panted a good deal and while they panted they looked at one another with a sort of doleful cheerfulness from time to time but there was also fierce fighting and sutherland at last drew blood from rice with a blow on the nose at the sight of his blood rice gave a great display and kept sutherland moving about and at last hit him backwards out of the ring but sutherland instantly returned and went on fighting till the end of the round it was a splendid round in every way round five both were now rather tired and in this round they took it easy but at taking it easy sutherland was much better than rice and did not waste so much energy in fainting he had the best of this round and hit rice twice or three times on the face at the end he fairly knocked rice down and when ash said time pegram and travers minor rushed to pick up rice and carry him to his corner but he rose and walked round six this looked as though it was going to be the last for sutherland was now fresher than rice and evidently stronger rice began the round well but soon fell away and sutherland hit him several times and once over the right eyebrow and cut him and evidently did that eye no good rice made ferocious dashes and sutherland got away from them and then while rice was resting sutherland dashed in and rice didn't get away sutherland hit rice on the chest and knocked him down and it looked as though he wasn't going to get up again but he did and still had good strength he was being licked but slowly at the end of the round he got one good one in though it was lucky i must here break off the account of the fight by blades to describe a most amazing thing which made this fight far unlike any other i or sutherland had ever fought after the sixth round we were being mopped up and pegram was advising me to chuck it and i was saying in a gasping sort of way i should try to stick a few more rounds and hope for a bit of luck when to our great horror there suddenly appeared from the trees brown and a man clad in black at first we thought it was a policeman and that brown had heard of the fight and had called a constable to take us up but it turned out that brown hadn't heard of the fight and the man in black was none other than the father of sutherland the famous middleweight of other days he had called to see sutherland and had been sent to the playing field and there he had been met by brown and brown guessing that the big chaps were in the wood had brought sutherland's father actually to the ring side brown of course was furious and wanted to stop the fight and take down all our names but the famous middleweight would not hear of this the moment he found that sutherland was fighting a wave of animation went over him and he begged brown as a personal favor to let us finish he even promised to put it all right with the doctor if anything was said which showed his fighting qualities were still there brown of course curled up but his little eyes blazed and he said that sutherland's father must take the responsibility which he gladly undertook to do then brown giving us a look which told without words what would happen when sutherland's father was gone went back to the kids in the meantime i and sutherland had a fine rest and after that we went on again i wished much that his father had seen the whole fight because i knew now only too well that sutherland had got me and that of course with his father there he'd buck up and do something out of the common and i deeply wished my father were there and not far away buying horses at a guinea a day in ireland but i hoped now with this good rest to last at least two more rounds i may now go on with the description of blades round seven 
much refreshed by about six minutes rest rice and sutherland began again and sutherland's father watched the fight with a calm and sporting interest he was a clean-shaved man of large size about the shoulders but he had a pale sad-looking face and very thin lips and one ear larger than the other sutherland had to withstand a wild rush from rice and hit rice while he backed away from him which pleased his father but rice was not stopped and he got close to sutherland and hit him very hard on the body until they fell into each other's arms and sutherland's father said break break and then apologized to travers major who was referee they parted and rice evidently much refreshed went after sutherland and hit him about three or four times then sutherland hit him once and then it was time round eight sutherland's father certainly seemed to have brought sutherland bad luck for in the next round rice held his own and though knocked down at the beginning of the round got up and went on and sutherland's father asked me how many rounds had been fought and was very much interested in my notes and owing to him reading them i could not describe this round at the end both were tired one not more than the other round nine rice feeling he had still a chance fought as well as ever in this round and sutherland was clearly not taking anything like his old interest in the fight he kept looking mournfully at his father and didn't seem to care where rice hit him and i could see that his father was a good deal disappointed rice had much the best of this round and sutherland bled again though rice did also round ten it began all right though both could hardly keep up their arms and then without a blow suddenly sutherland shook his head and extended his hand to rice and rice shook it and the battle was over that was the end of what blades wrote but much remains to be told and the fight which was extraordinary in the beginning turned out far more extraordinary at the end i couldn't believe my senses when sutherland gave in and nor could his father and then came out the truth which was sad in a way but really much sadder for me than sutherland because what i had thought was a right down glorious victory well worth the pint of blood i had shed and the tooth i had lost turned out to be what you might really call very little better than winning on a foul after the fight sutherland hastened to his father and asked him about sutherland major and heard he was all right and going strong then he actually began to blub and his father rotted him and asked him what the dickens was the matter with him and how he had given in to a chap sizes smaller than himself and then sutherland between moments of undoubted weeping explained he said i never saw you in black clothes before because at home you always wear tweeds with squares and a red tie and seeing you in pitch black of course i thought tom was dead till then i was winning and rice knows i was but after you came and i felt positive tom was dead then sutherland was quite unable to go on and his father asked him however he thought he could have stood there grinning at a kid fight under such sad circumstances then he led sutherland away and explained that he happened to have been attending a funeral near plymouth of some old lawyer friend and he thought he would kill two birds with one stone as they say and come over and have a look at sutherland and tell him they'd heard good news of his brother and that his mother had bucked up again well there it was and much worse for me than sutherland because his grief was turned into joy but my joy was turned into grief winning in that footling way which didn't amount to winning at all in fact it was mere dust and enough to make me weep myself only that was a thing i had never been known to do and never shall in this world or the next however sutherland minor was jolly sporting about it and thoroughly understood how it must look from my point of view he even offered to come to ireland in the christmas holidays if my people would ask him and fight me again on my own ground he couldn't say more but though i gladly accepted the idea of his coming to ireland which was a very happy thought on his part i told him frankly that i should not fight him again at present we may meet some happy day in the amateur championship sutherland i said if i get large enough and you don't get too large no rice he answered for i shall be a heavy weight when i'm twenty and you at best can never hope to be anything but a welter 
but i hope we'll second each other many a time and oft end of story six story seven of the human boy and the war by eden philpotts this librivox recording is in the public domain story seven percy minimus and his tommy there were three percys at merivale and they were all there together and to masters they were of course known as percy major percy minor and percy minimus but we called them the three maniacs though mad they were nice chaps in a way and did unexpected things and always interested everybody because of their surprises they were all very different but very original owing to their father being a well-known actor and percy major was already an actor by nature and could imitate anything with remarkable exactness from dr dunstan to a monkey on a barrel organ he could even imitate a hen with chickens but he was going for much higher flights when he went on the stage and knew the parts of hamlet and macbeth and richard the third by heart though he said to travers and i heard him that it would probably be many a long day before he got a chance to act these great tragical characters before a london audience his father on the contrary was a comedian and blades had once seen him in a pantomime and liked him and said that he was good percy minor was not going on the stage though when he liked he could be awfully funny only he was generally serious and meant to be a painter his great hope was to take likenesses and he was always practising it and his school books were full of portraits of chaps and masters some you could recognise as for percy minimus he was the maddest of the lot and my special friend we were in the lower third and forbes minimus was also our special friend but he chucked merivale as his parents went to the cape of good hope and took him and then percy and i were left percy never came out much while his brothers were at merivale and his only strong point was singing in the choir at music he was an undoubted dab and he liked it and he said that if his voice turned into anything worth mentioning after it cracked he would very likely be an opera singer of the first water and if it failed and fizzled away to nothing after cracking as treble voices sometimes do then he was going to be a clergyman if his father would let him he certainly sang like the devil and mr prowse our music master was fearfully keen on him and arranged solos in chapel for him and people came from long distances on sundays to hear him sing though old dunstan always thought when outsiders turned up to the chapel services it was to hear him preach but far from it well this percy minimus was what you may call sentimental and he certainly was a bit of a girl in some ways i hated that squashy side of him and tried to cure it but i forgave him because he liked me and not many chaps did owing to my having a stammer percy minimus was frightfully interested in my stammer and said it would very likely be cured when i grew up he said that people who stammer when they talk can often sing quite well so i tried and found it was so but here again there was a drawback because my singing voice though quite without any stammer was quite bang off as a voice and even funnier than my stammer percy minimus said it was just the sound a fly made before it died when it was caught by a spider so naturally i chucked it but this is about percy not me he had very kind instincts and was of a gentle disposition for instance when three of the masters went to the war and dr dunstan said he was going to fill the breach and do extra work and take our class while we much regretted it percy minimus thought it was fine of the doctor he said though it is bad hearing for us cornwallis we are bound to admit it is sporting of him because at his great age it must be very tiring to do a lot of extra work and no doubt to take the lower form must be fairly deadly for such a learned man as him it will be deadlier for us i said and of course it was but that shows the queer views that percy gets hardly natural i call it and then when the doctor threw up the sponge and got a new master called peacock to help and fill the gap till after the war when hutchings and meadows would come back if alive percy minimus was queer again this peacock was old and dreadfully humble 
i don't think he'd ever been a master before and he was very unlike his name in every way and had no idea of keeping order but went in forgetting our affection he tried frantically to be friendly but he failed because he was too worm-like being a crushed and shabby man with a thin grey beard and when he attempted to fling himself into a game of hockey and to be young and dashing he hurt himself and had to go in and get brandy i believe he was a sort of charity on old dunstan's part really for mr peacock told pegram that he had a wife and six children and his eldest son was at the war and his second son was in the general post office and his eldest daughter was a schoolmistress at bedford fancy telling pegram these things all pegram did afterwards was to make fun of peacock and treat him with scorn and many did the same but percy minimus encouraged him and he liked percy minimus and told him several things about the general post office not generally known peacock finding that me and percy minimus were rather above the common herd told us that he was very anxious about his son at the war and was very interested about the war in general and made us interested in it too he read us a letter from his son at the front and percy minimus said it brought home the horrors especially in the matters of food though not a great eater percy liked nice food better than any other kind and then owing to his great feeling for nice food there happened the curious and in fact most extraordinary adventure of his life he came to me much excited one day with a newspaper it was a week old but otherwise perfect in every way and it had started a scheme for sending the men at the front a jolly good christmas gift for the sum of five shillings the newspaper promised to send off tobacco and cigarettes and sweets and chocolate and a new wooden pipe all in one parcel and so as percy minimus pointed out if you could only rake up that amount and send it to the paper it meant that one man in the trenches on christmas day would have the great joy of receiving all these luxuries in one simultaneous parcel from an unknown friend at home i said oh it's a splendid idea and i should like nothing better but of course in our case it is out of the question we've both subscribed to the hutchings testimonial and there's not a penny in sight for me this side of christmas and no more there is for you he admitted this but said because there wasn't a penny in sight it didn't follow we might not by some unheard-of deeds rake up the money in time and i said well knowing what five shillings meant that the deeds would certainly have to be unheard of i said there's a fortnight before you have to send in the money but so far as i'm concerned it might just as well be ten years and he said the problem simply is how to raise five shillings out of nothing in fourteen days and i said well yes and he said it sounds simple enough and i said the hardest problems often do in two days he had got a shilling by selling a thing he greatly valued it was a tie his mother had given him and it was made of sheeny silk and changed colour according to which way you looked at it his mother had given half a crown for it and percy wore it on sundays only it was sutherland who gave the money and that still left four shillings and percy minimus hadn't got another thing in the world worth tuppence he then tried writing home and failed he said his father was out of work and though a very generous and kind father as a rule not just now his mother also failed him she wrote sorrowfully but said that she and his father had done everything about the war they could for the present he then wrote to his godmother and got a shilling encouraged by this he wrote to his godfather who didn't answer the letter fourpence had gone on stamps for these four letters and he was accordingly left with one and eightpence subtracting this from five shillings you will find he still had to raise three shillings and fourpence it looked hopeless and i pointed out there was the additional danger that he might be accused of getting money under false pretenses if he didn't collect the lot but he did not fear that because as he said whatever he might get he could send to some other charity which was open to take less than five shillings there were now seven days left and he began to get very fidgety and wretched he said he was always seeing in his mind's eye a tommy in the trenches waiting and watching and hoping between his fights that percy minimus would send him one of those grand simultaneous packets it got on his nerves after a bit and twice he woke me in the dead of night in our dormitory sniffing very loud 
I said, You're making a toil of a pleasure, Percy. And he said, No, I'm not. Whenever I go to sleep, I dream of my Tommy in the trenches, and the parcels are being given out by Lord French, and my Tommy stretches out his hand eagerly and hopefully, but there's no parcel for him, and he shrugs his shoulders and just bears it and goes back to his gun. But it's simply hell for me. What's he like? I asked, to get Percy Minimus off the sad side of it huge and filthy said percy minimus he has a brown face and a big black moustache and one of the new steel hats and he's plastered with mud and his eyes roll with craving for cigarettes and chocolates oh you needn't worry i said he'll get his parcel all right of course they won't miss him what a fool you are cornwallis he answered still sniffing can't you see that if i don't send a parcel there will be one parcel left and so one man will go without who would otherwise have had a parcel and that man will be this one i see in my dreadful dreams well if you put it like that i said of course then he had another beastly thought i've got an idea the man is peacock's son he said and i feel a regular traitor to peacock now every time i look at him then why don't you ask him for some money i naturally answered i feel he hasn't got any replied percy but i can try besides i said his son may be an officer and of course they would be far above parcels i hope he is said percy but i don't think he is and nobody would be above a parcel at a time like that anyway he asked peacock and peacock gave him sixpence and wished he could do better this made two and tuppence and the same day percy found a threepenny piece in the playground and though at another time he would have mentioned this with a view of returning it to the proper owner now he didn't but said it was a providence and added it to the rest and this gave him another hopeful idea and he mentioned the parcel for his tommy in his prayers morning and evening and asked me to do so too i was fed up with the whole thing by now because percy was getting fairly tormented by it and even said he saw the tommy looking at him in broad daylight sometimes over the playground wall or through the window in the middle of a class still i obliged him and prayed four times for him to get his two and seven pence but there was no reply whatever and in this way two days were wasted then he had a desperate but brilliant idea and told me he said after school on friday in the half hour before tea i'm going to break bounds and go down into merivale and stand by the pavement and sing the solo from the anthem we did last sunday many people who sing along by the pavement make money by doing so and i might if you're caught dunston will flog you i reminded him but he was far past a thing like that his eyes had glittered in rather a wild way for three days now and he said the tommy with the black moustache was always looking reproachfully at him and if he shut his eyes he saw him more distinctly than ever in fact he was getting larger and more threatening every minute he said a mere flogging is nothing to what they endure in the trenches it was a sporting idea and i would have risked it and gone with him in fact i offered being his great chum but he would not allow me no he said nothing is gained by your coming this is entirely my affair besides you wouldn't tempt people to subscribe so he went and escaped in the darkness and i waited at the limit of bounds with great anxiety to meet him when he came back my last word to him was not to sing this bit out of an anthem but something comic about the war but he didn't know anything comic about the war and he said even if he did that such a thing would only amuse common people who could not be supposed to give more than half pence if they gave anything at all whereas a solo from a fine anthem would attract a better class who understood more about music and were more religious and consequently had more money so he went and in about twenty minutes to my great horror i saw him being brought back in the custody of brown our well-known master the hateful brown always loves to score off anybody not in his own class and so seeing percy warbling out of bounds in the middle of merivale and about ten people mostly kids listening to him he pounced on the wretched percy and dragged him away he had been singing about ten minutes when the blow fell and he was fearfully upset about it because everything had been going jolly well and he had already made no less than seven pence in coppers all from oldish women 
he had been told to go away from in front of a butcher's shop but nobody else had interfered with him in the least and he had sung the anthem solo through twice and was just off again when the brutal brown came along and saw the merivale colors on his cap recognized percy minimus and very nearly had a fit so there it was and he got flogged and dr dunstan said it showed low tastes and would have been a source of great sorrow to his father and he also said that to explode a sacred air in that way in hope of touching the charitable to fill his own pocket was about the limit and a great disgrace to the school in general all of which went off percy like water off a duck's back and the flogging didn't seem to hurt him either and there were four days still and he said his tommy grew larger and larger until he was almost as big as a house in fact percy minimus was rapidly growing dotty and as his great friend i felt i must do something or he would very likely get some other dangerous illness or have a fit or lose his mind forever and become a maniac in real earnest so i told percy minor but unfortunately he and my percy had quarrelled rather bitterly for the moment and percy minor said he didn't care what happened to percy minimus and that if he went out of his mind he wouldn't have far to go while as to percy major i couldn't tell him because he had left merivale the term before the matron now discovered that percy was queer for she'd been making him take pills for two days and then one night hearing him sigh fearfully after he was in bed she tried his temperature and found it about three hundred degrees of warmth so she lugged him off to the sick-room and dr weston came in his motor and said he couldn't see any reason for it and gave percy some muck to calm him down next day he was kept in the sick-room though cooler and when dr weston came on that day and questioned percy in a kind tone of voice he explained the whole thing to the doctor and said that he was in fearful difficulties of mind and dr weston asked him what difficulties and he said for two shillings which added to three makes five then the doctor told him to go on so he did and showed the doctor the advertisement from the paper about the simultaneous parcels he also said that his tommy had now grown as big as a cloud in the sky and was always looking at him by night and day hungrily and urging him on to fresh efforts and he also said that if he was only allowed to go into the streets and sing an anthem for an hour or two the two shillings should be accomplished and all would be well and encouraged by the great interest of dr weston percy minimus ventured to ask him if he thought he could ask dr dunstan to allow this to be done seeing it meant great comfort and joy for a tommy in the trenches on christmas day it made percy much cooler and calmer explaining why his temperature had run up and the doctor said it was undoubtedly not good for percy to have the tommy so much on his mind he didn't approve of the idea of percy singing either but he put his hand into his waistcoat pocket and produced a two-shilling piece as if it was nothing and he said that if the matron or somebody would get a postal order for five shillings and send it off at once he had every reason to think that percy would soon recover which was done and i was allowed to see percy and bring from his desk the cutting out of the newspaper which he had already signed with his name and address which were to go to the front with his parcel and percy said that a great weight had now been lifted from his brain which no doubt it had anyhow when dr weston came next day he found percy in a bath of perspiration and was much pleased and said he was practically cured and percy told him that his tommy had now shrunk to about the size of an ordinary tommy and only came when he was asleep and was not in the least reproachful but quite pleasant and nice and one day later the tommy disappeared altogether and percy minimus became perfectly well in fact before the holidays arrived he seemed to have forgotten all about his tommy and i took jolly good care not to remind him he got fearfully keen about dr weston then and said that he was the best man he'd ever seen or heard of and he even hoped that next term he might run up to three hundred degrees again just for the great pleasure of seeing and talking to this doctor once more but that wasn't all by any means in fact you might say that far the most remarkable part of the adventure of percy minimus had yet to come 
he went home for the holidays and when he came back much to my astonishment he was full of his blessed tommy again he actually said that he'd got a photograph of him i thought that coming back to school had made him queer once more but he wasn't in the least queer for i saw the photograph with my own eyes it was like this the tommy who had got the christmas parcel which percy's five shillings bought found percy's address in it according to the splendid arrangement of the newspaper and though far too busy in the trenches to take any notice of it just then he was not too busy to smoke the new pipe and the cigarettes and eat the various sweets no doubt between intervals of fiery slaughter but he kept percy's address in his pocket for he was a good and grateful man and then most unfortunately he was hit in the foot by a piece of shrapnel shell and though far from killed yet so much wounded that he had to retire from the front in fact he was sent home to recover and one day in hospital about a week before the end of the holidays he had found percy minimus's name and address in the pocket of his coat and had written percy a most interesting letter of four pages saying that the parcel had been a great comfort to him and that he had sucked the last peppermint drop only an hour before being shrapneled and having been photographed several times in the hospital by visitors he sent percy minimus one and there he was i said it was a jolly interesting thing and so on but i couldn't for the moment see why percy was so frightfully excited about it because it was quite a possible thing to happen though of course very good in its way and a letter he would always keep and he said you don't seem to see the point cornwallis it's a miracle and i said why and he said because this is the very identical tommy i was always seeing in my dreams the very identical one i hadn't thought of that but somehow taken it for granted then he pointed out it wasn't in the least a thing to take for granted but the purest miracle that ever happened in the memory of man and quite beyond human power to explain it in the world i said there might be people in the world who could but he wouldn't hear of such a thing he said no not in this world but no doubt there are in the next and i said then you'll have to wait and he said it's done one thing it's quite decided me about my future i'm going to be a clergyman and i said not if your voice doesn't crack surely my voice answered percy minimus with great scorn what is a voice compared to a miracle if miracles happen to you then if you've got any proper feeling you ought to insist on being a clergyman so i suppose he will be but whatever else he is even if he rises to be a canon or a bishop he'll always be a maniac the same as his brothers end of story seven Story eight of the Human Boy in the War by Eden Philpotts. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story eight: The Prize Poem. Things were beastly dull at Merivale when we went back after the Christmas holidays, and I believe even the doctor felt it. Of course, from our point of view, his life must always be deadly, but I suppose he gets a certain amount of feeble excitement into it in ways not known to us it's rather interesting to wonder what old people do find worth doing yet they must do something to amuse themselves off and on or they go mad i should think which they seldom do the amusements of a very old person must be rather weird yet they clearly like to be alive for when my grandmother died she was eighty a time of life when you'd think there was simply nothing left yet when i went to say farewell to her she told me she hoped to see the spring flowers once more she didn't but it shows how fearfully hard up old people must be for amusement of any kind for who on earth would want to see flowers spring or otherwise if practically everything else had not been lost to them myself i would much rather have died years before than eat the food my grandmother ate and never go out except in a bath chair but she found it good enough strange to say so no doubt dr dunstan who is entirely active and can eat meat and drink wine and walk rapidly about still finds being head of merivale school all right but the winter term was deadly what with the bad weather and the slow progress of the war and losing most of our football matches owing to having a very weak team 
then old peacock of all men the new master i mean got an idea and fortescue thought it was a good one and peacock proposed it to the doctor and dr dunstan agreed to it in fact he announced it after chapel during the third week of february in these words our new friend dr peacock has made a proposal to me and i have great pleasure not only in agreeing with him but in congratulating him on a very happy thought suspecting that there might be mute inglorious miltons among us a sanguine hope i cannot share mr peacock has thought it would add an interest to the term and wake a measure of enthusiasm and energy in the ranks of our versifiers if we initiate a competition he suggests a prize poem upon the subject of the war and while my heart misgives me yet i bow to mr peacock's generous proposal you are invited one and all of you from the greatest to the least to write a prize poem on the subject of the war and if such a momentous theme fails to produce some notable addition to our war poetry then mr peacock's disappointment will be considerable he trusts you to enter upon this task in no light spirit and when i add that mr peacock proposes to give a prize of one guinea twenty-one shillings to the victorious poet you will see that a great effort is needed you will have a calendar month to prepare and execute your verses which must be composed outside the regular school hours and i may tell you that unless a certain humble standard of intelligence and poetic ability is reached i shall direct mr peacock to withhold his prize well there it was and of course a good deal of excitement occurred and it was jolly interesting to see who entered for the prize poem and who did not no doubt travis major would have won it without an effort being so keen about everything to do with war but luckily for the rest he had left to go to woolwich the term before travers minor entered because he was strongly advised to being a flyer at literature in general and keen about poetry but he said frankly he should not praise the war but slate it because he utterly disagreed with it and hated war in general of course the prize being a guinea made a lot of difference and many unexpected chaps decided to write a prize poem though most of these when they sat down with pens and ink to do it found such a thing quite beyond them in every way i myself my name is abbott was one of these and after reading a good many real poems of the war which mr fortescue who was a great poet and much interested in the competition kindly lent me i found on setting out to do it that the difficulties were far too great rhymes are easy enough to get in a way but when you come to string the poem together you generally find your rhymes aren't solemn enough i believe i could have written a screamingly funny prize poem but of course that wouldn't have pleased the doctor or peacock either so it wasn't any good wasting time being funny for instance i wrote the following poem in less than ten minutes the hun the hun the footling hun most certainly doth take the bun and blades and several other chaps said it was jolly good but blades who had also had a shot or two on the quiet was like me he could only make comic poems and the stanzas of his poem took the form of limericks he said he could invent them with the greatest ease in class or at prayers or at meals or going to bed or getting up or in his bath in fact at any time when he wasn't playing football he gave me an example which seemed to me so frightfully good that i thought very likely peacock would have given him a consolation prize so i tried it on peacock but mr peacock thought nothing of it and said that was not at all the spirit of a prize poem but belonged to the gutter press whatever that is it ran like this the kaiser set off for paris as if it was only a spree but old french's army it soon knocked him barmy and now he is melancholy he next had a flutter at nancy though doubtless a little bit chancy but his men got a doing with plenty more brewing so he galloped off saying just fancy there were hundreds more verses in fact you might say the whole history of the war as far as it had got and i advised blades to send it to the times to buck it up or a punch or something but he wouldn't and when peacock decided it was no use he gave up writing it so a good poem was lost in my opinion 
many fell out before the appointed day for sending in the prize poems but many did not and though it was natural that a good few chaps chucked it the extraordinary thing was the number of chaps who kept on to the bitter end so to speak and sent in poems almost the most amazing was mitchell he certainly had made a rude poem once in a moment of rage but as to real poetry a cabbage might just as well have tried to make a poem as him he was only keen about one thing in the world and that was money and of course that was why he entered the competition he said to me i'd do much worse things than make a prize poem if anybody offered me a guinea if it had been one of the doctor's wretched prizes i wouldn't have attempted it but a guinea is a guinea and as nobody here can make poetry for nuts i'm just as likely to bring it off as anybody else it's taking a risk in a way but i've got my ideas about the war just as much as Travers minor or sutherland and if i don't win i shall get a bit of fun out of it anyway he was a mean beast always but cunning and frightfully crafty and as he had never had a decent idea in his life let alone a poetical one we were all frightfully interested in mitchell's poem on the war the chap sutherland he had mentioned was regarded as having a chance for he knew a lot about the war and had two cousins in it one in france and one with the fleet he got letters without stamps on them from these chaps but there was never much in them thwaites also entered and he was known to write poetry and send it home but it had not been seen and thwaites being delicate and rather fond of art and playing the piano and such like piffle we didn't regard him as having warlike ideas besides once when blades suddenly pulled out one of his teeth in class and bled freely over thwaites who sat next to him thwaites fainted at the sight of blood which showed he couldn't possibly write anything worth mentioning on such a fearful subject as war because you may say a war is blood or nothing only one absolute kid entered and this was percy minimus who had sent a christmas pudding to the front and had the photograph of a tommy back so he wrote a prize poem which he let his friend see and forbes minimus said it was good as far as he could say to the contrary no doubt it appeared so to a squirt like forbes minimus but of course it could not be supposed to stand against the work of travers minor or sutherland or rice i always rather thought myself that rice might pull it off being irish and a great fighter by nature unfortunately he didn't know anything whatever about poetry yet his fighting instinct made him enter and though he wasn't likely to rhyme very well or look after the scanning and the feet and the spondees and dactyls and all that mess which no doubt would count yet i hoped that for a simple warlike dash rice might bring it off i asked him about it and he said a good many things had gone wrong with it but here and there were bits that might save it he said i believe i shall either win the guinea right bang off or get flogged which interested me fearfully but didn't surprise me because it was rather the way with rice to rush at a thing headlong and come out top or bottom he only really kept cool and patient and never ran risks when he was fighting but at everything else which he considered less important he just dashed he had dashed at the prize poem very different from tracy who was always cool about everything and wouldn't have gone to the front himself for a thousand pounds tracy was great at satire in fact satire was a natural gift with him and though of course it didn't always come off owing to being so satirical that nobody saw it still he often did get in a nasty one and sometimes got licked for doing so he told me his prize poem was all pure satire and i said i doubt if the doctor or peacock will see it and tracy said i can't help that poetry is art and i can't alter my great feeling for satire to please them it will come out and even though old dunston and peacock don't see it i know jolly well the kaiser and the crown prince would if they read it well there it was and that was about the lot worth mentioning who had a shot at mr peacock's guinea the calendar month passed and one day when classes began the doctor appeared supported by peacock fortescue and brown everybody was summoned into the chapel and the doctor who dearly likes a flare-up of this kind told us that the prize poems had been judged and were going to be read 
i may tell you he said that the prize has been won contrary to my fear that none would prove worthy of it but we are agreed that there is a copy of verses on the solemn subject set for discussion that disgraces neither the writer nor merivale indeed i will go further than that and declare that one poem reflects no small credit on the youthful poet responsible for it and mr peacock and mr fortescue than whom you shall find no more acute and critical judges share my own pleasure at the effusion the doctor then began to read the prize poems and he started with that of percy minimus much to percy's confusion the views of percy minimus on the war are elementary as we should expect from a youth of his years said old dunstan i may remark however that he rhymes with great accuracy and if he shows an inclination to be didactic and even give lord kitchener a hint or two i frankly pardon him for the sake of his concluding line this reveals in percy minimus a flash of elevated feeling which does him infinite credit one can only hope that his pious aspiration will be echoed by those great nations doomed to defeat in the appalling catastrophe which they have provoked then he gave us the poem the war by percy minimus war is a very fearful thing i'm sure you'll all agree but sometimes we have to fight in order to be free the germans want to slaughter us and do not understand we are a people famed in fight and also good and grand we never were unkind to them and never turned them out when unto england's shores they came to trade and look about but all the time i grieve to say they only came as spies so that when came the dreadful day they take us by surprise which they did so and if our ships had not been all prepared the germans would have landed and not you or i been spared now all is changed and very soon upon the belgian strand i promise you a million men of english breed will land and thanks to good lord kitchener their wants will be supplied with splendid food and cosy clothes and many things beside but he must bring the big siege guns when antwerp we shall reach because with these fine weapons we have got to make a breach so let us pray that very soon we smash the cruel hun and if by dreadful luck we lose oh then god's will be done we applauded percy minimus for his sporting attempt feeling of course it was piffle really but good for a kid then the doctor said he was going to read rice mr fortescue said dunstan has evinced the deepest interest in the achievement of rice he tells me that there is now a movement in art including the sacred art of poesy which is known as the futurist movement rice's efforts reminds mr fortescue of this lamentable outrage on the muses for it appears that the futurist desire to thrust all that man has done for art into the flames to forget the glories of greece to pour scorn on the renaissance to begin again with primal chaos in a world where all shall be without form and void this is nihilism and a crime against culture for some mysterious reason the boy rice who we may safely assume has never heard of the futurists until this moment appears to have emulated their methods and shared their unholy extravagance of epithets their frenzied anarchy their scorn of all that is lovely and of good repute he even permits himself expressions that at another time would win something more than a rebuke i will now read rice not for my pleasure or yours but that at least you may learn what is not poetry and can never be mistaken for poetry by those who like ourselves have drunk at the pyrian spring war by rice smash crash crash bang crash bang rattle 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 and crash again air full of puffs of smoke where shells are bursting overhead scream of shrapnel over the trenches and yells of rage roar of men charging and howling a savage song now we shan't be long tramp of feet then flop they fall dropping out here there and everywhere and rolling head over heels like rabbits and some sit up after the charge and some don't shot through the heart or head they roll gloriously over all in but on go the living shouting and screaming and some bleeding and not knowing it 
as loud as the jack johnsons they howl their rifles are at the charge and the bayonets are white the white arm that goes in in front and out behind or in behind and out in front of the germans running away the boche hates the white arm it sends him to hell by the millions crash crash squash smash 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 the trench is reached blood spurts and bones crack like china gurgles chokes yells helmets fly bayonets stick and won't come out everybody is dead or dying in the trench except twelve tommies dams growls yells choked with blood death awful wounds mess corpses legs arms heads all separate the trench is taken and england has gained a hundred yards hurro 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 and what must it be to be there signed rice i looked at rice while his poem was being intoned by the doctor he had turned very red but he stuck it well and somehow though of course it was right bang off and no rhymes or anything i liked it and mr fortescue liked it as he afterwards told rice but the doctor and mr peacock fairly hated it so that was the end of rice they thought nothing of tracy's poem either the doctor said tracy has produced what for reasons best known to himself he calls a satire it possesses a certain element of crude humour which on such a solemn theme is utterly out of place upon the whole i regard it as discreditable in a sixth form boy and do not think the better of tracy for having written it he then read tracy a satire by tracy no doubt o kaiser you have thought napoleon was a duffer compared to you when you set out to make old england suffer but if you read your history books you'd very quickly find sir that bonny knew despite his faults how to make up his mind sir you flutter up you flutter down you flutter night and day sir yet somehow victory won't look your mad and fluttering way sir but when the war by us is won and in berlin our men sir you'll be a bit surprised to find where you will flutter then sir we laughed and thought it ripping but the doctor seemed to be hurt and said silence silence boys it ill becomes us to jest at the spectacle of a fallen potentate and still less so before he has fallen a more pleasing effort is that of travers minor went on the doctor picking up the poem of travers we have here nothing to be described as a picture of war but rather the views of an intelligent and christian boy upon war personally i think well of these verses they are unostentatious no flash of fire but a temperate lament on war in general and a final conviction not lacking in shrewdness i will not say that i entirely agree with travers minor in his concluding assertion but he may be right he may be right at any rate the poem is a worthy expression of an educated mind and by no means the worst of those with which we are called to deal he then read Travers Minor, and we were all frightfully disappointed, for it turned out that Travers hated war, so the result wasn't a war poem at all, but a very tame affair without any dash about it. In fact, very feeble, I thought. His brother would have despised him for writing it. Of course, Peacock wanted a poem praising up the glory of war, not sitting on it like Travers Minor did. The Fog of War by Travers Minor from out the awful fog of war one thing too well we see that man has not yet reached unto his highest majesty for battle is a fiendish art we share with wolf and bear but man has got a soul to save he will not save it there this is the twentieth century we boast our great good sense and yet can only go to war at horrible expense of human life it makes us beasts we shout and spend our breath to hear a thousand enemies have all been blown to death and each of all those thousand men was doubtless good and kind as those no doubt remember well whom he has left behind and when i hear that war brings out our finest qualities i do believe with all my heart that is a pack of lies a deadly silence greeted the prize poem of travers minor and i believe the doctor felt rather sick with us for not applauding it 
and tracy who was very mad at what the doctor had said about him whispered rather loud that travers minor's efforts was almost worthy of hymns ancient and modern there were only three poems left now and the excitement increased a good deal because nobody had won peacock's guinea yet so it was clear that either mitchell or thwaites or sutherland minor was the lucky bargee both mitchell and thwaites seemed beyond the wildest hope and we felt pretty sure that sutherland must have done the trick but he hadn't the doctor picked up his poem and put on a doubtful expression i confess that sutherland gives me pause he said for skill in rhyming sutherland deserves all praise he is ingenious and correct but such is the faultiness of his ear that he flouts the fundamentals of prosody in each of his four stanzas in fact sutherland's poetry regarded as such is excruciating he has ideas though not of a particularly exalted character and even if he had given us something better worthy to be called a poem his lamentable failure in metre would have debarred him from victory his last verse contains an objectionable suspicion we might associate rather with a commercial traveller or small tradesman than with one of us well sutherland's wasn't bad really though rather rocky from a poetical point of view as the doctor truly said khaki forever by sutherland loud roars the dreadful cannon above the bloody field while like the lightning through the smoke's dim shroud the tongues of flame are flashing where concealed the vainglorious enemy's battery doth vaunt and laugh aloud thinking that men of british race are going to yield poor german cannon fodder little do they know that those who wear the khaki have never yet wherever at the call of bellona they may go surrender to a lesser foe than death they've met far finer fighters than the Bosch and made their life-blood flow whether upon the open battle-front or in a trench or in a fort or keeping communications with such a leader as great general french the british khaki boys defeat all nations and in the foeman's gore their glittering bayonets they quench and they will win for right is on their side and when they do the neutral shall not share the rich earned booty the allies divide for as they would not sail in and fight it is not fair that they should win the fruits of this bloody tide we could see what the doctor meant about sutherland's poem it didn't flow exactly but it might have been worse then dr dunston picked up mitchell's poem and frowned and peacock frowned and fortescue also frowned we didn't know what was going to happen for the doctor made no preliminary remarks on the subject of mitchell he just gave his glasses a hitch and glared over the top of mitchell's effort and then read it out old england forever by mitchell oh now doth death line his dead chaps with steel the swords of soldiers are his teeth his fangs and now he feasts mousing the flesh of man rejoice ye men of england ring your bells king george your king and england's doth approach commander of this hot malicious day our armour that marched hence so silver bright hither returns all gilt with german blood our colours do return in those same hands that did display them when we first marched forth and like a jolly troop of huntsmen come our lusty english all with purple hands died in the slaughter of their teuton foes but to their home they will no more return till belgium's free and france is also free then to their pale their white-faced shore whose foot spurns back the ocean's roaring tides and coops from other lands her islanders even to that england hedged in with the main that water-walled bulwark still secure will they return and hear our thunderous cheers but belgium first unhappy stricken land which has we know and all too well we know sluiced out her innocent soul through streams of blood which blood like sacrificing abels cries even from the tongueless caverns of the earth to us for justice and rough chastisement and by the glorious worth of our descent our arm shall do it 
or our life be spent the doctor stopped suddenly and flung his eyes over us naturally we were staggered and full of amazement to think of a hard blade like mitchell producing such glorious stuff any fool could see it was poetry of the classiest kind do you desire to hear more shouted the doctor and we said yes sir then seek it in the immortal pages from whence the boy mitchell has dared to steal it he thundered out and growing his well-known deadly red colour with predatory hand and audacity from which the most hardened criminal would have shrunk this abominable boy insolently counting on the ignorance of those whose unfortunate duty it is to instruct him has appropriated the bard to his own vile uses and his cunning has led him to interpolate and alter the text in such a manner that sundry passages are made to appear as one mitchell will meet me in my study after morning school i need say no more words fail me and they actually did which was a record in its way the doctor panted for a bit then he picked up mitchell's poem or rather shakespeare's as if it was a mouse that had been dead a fortnight and dropped it on the ground it was rather a solemn moment especially for mitchell and the only funny thing about it was to see the sixth of course they'd been had by mitchell just the same as us in the fifth in fact everybody but they tried to look as if they'd known it was shakespeare from the first as for mitchell he had made the rather rash mistake of thinking old dunston and peacock and fortescue didn't know any more about shakespeare than he did and now he sat awful white but resigned as a matter of fact he got the worst flogging he ever did get and had a narrow squeak of being expelled also it calmed him down for days afterwards and he was also called king john till the end of the term as a mark of contempt which he badly hated then the doctor snorted himself calm and his face grew its usual colour he picked up thwaites and ended with the tamest poem of all in my opinion which shows that grown-up people and boys have a very different idea about what is poetry and what isn't the verses of thwaites have won the poet's bay said dr dunston thwaites alone has written a work worthy to be called a poem his stanzas possess music and reveal thought and feeling neither technically are they open to grave objection i congratulate thwaites though not robust or a pillar of strength either in his class or in the field he possesses a refined mind a capacity of emotion and a power for expressing that emotion in terms of poetry that time and application may possibly ripen and mature such at least is my opinion and those who have sat in judgment share it with me he then gave us thwaites a twittering sort of stuff and interesting not because thwaites had got the poet's bay whatever that is but because he had landed peacock's guinea nobody much liked his prize poem except the masters and even thwaites himself said it wasn't any real good and it was written when he had a beastly sore throat and was feeling utterly down on his luck in fact he was going to call it lines written in dejection at merivale like real poets do only he got better before he finished the last verse and so did not to the earth by thwaites suffer sad earth no pain can equal thine thy giant heart must ever be a shrine for all the sorrows of humanity as one by one the stricken ages die the bright beams of the stars are turned to tears and howling winds that whistle down the years sigh sorrow 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 and are gone into the silence of oblivion suffer great world the poison fangs of death can only wound not kill thee lo the breath of everlasting dawn is in the wind the distant throbbing of a giant mind shall set the music of the universe once more in time with harmony coerce the discord of a warring race to seize and sorrow die within the arms of peace Thwaites spent his guinea almost entirely on tuck, and though he was very generous with it, and shared the grub with the competitors Rice and Sutherland Minor, who were his friends, he still kept enough to make himself ill again, for it was one of the unlucky things about Thwaites that any muck really worth eating always bowled him over. 
he wrote a poem three times as long as his war poem called effect of coconut rock on the tummy of thwaites but dunston wouldn't have purred much over that end of story eight story nine of the human boy and the war by eden philpotts this librivox recording is in the public domain story nine the revenge if anybody has done a crime dr dunston generally speaks to them before the school so that all may hear what the crime is and according to the way he speaks to them we know the sort of fate in store if he says he remembers what it was to be a boy himself there is great hope for as mitchell pointed out that means the doctor has himself committed the crime in far-off times when he was young but if he doesn't say he remembers what it was to be a boy himself then the crime is probably a crime he never committed and these are the sort he punishes worst well in the case of tudor he had never committed tudor's crime and he himself said when ragging tudor before punishment that he had never even heard of such a crime therefore the consequences were bad for tudor and he was flogged and his greatest treasure taken away from him forever it was no doubt a very peculiar crime and mitchell told tudor that it was not so much the crime itself as the destructive consequences that had put the doctor into such a bait but we found out next term that the destructive consequences had been sent home in a bill for tudor's father to pay and they amounted to two pounds so tudor caught it at home also well it was like this tudor came back for the spring term with a remarkably interesting tool called a glazier's diamond he had saved up and bought it with his own money and it was valuable having in it a real diamond the beauty of which was that it could cut glass it could also mark glass forever and after a good deal of practice on out-of-the-way panes of glass in secluded places tudor had thoroughly learned the difficult art of writing on glass we were allowed to walk round the kitchen garden sometimes upon sunday afternoons and occasionally if a boy was seedy and separated from the rest for a day or two for fear he had got something catching such a boy was allowed in the kitchen garden under the eye of harris the kitchen gardener and tudor often got queer and threatened to develop catching things though he never really did but on the days when he threatened he generally escaped lessons and was allowed in the kitchen garden needless to say that this place was full of opportunities for practising the art of writing on glass and as nothing was easier than to escape from the eye of harris he used these opportunities and wrote his name and mine and many others on cucumber frames and on the side of a hothouse used for growing grapes and also on the window of a potting shed i am pratt and tudor and me were in the lower fourth it was a class that dr dunston unfortunately took for history and on those occasions we went to his study for the lesson and stood in a row which extended from the window to the front of dr dunston's desk he sat behind the desk and took the class from there but there was a great difference in tudor and me because i was at the top of the lower fourth and he was at the bottom in the case of the doctor's history class however this was a great advantage for tudor because the bottom of the class was by the window and the top was in front of the doctor well tudor actually got the great idea of writing with his glazier's diamond on the doctor's window i advised him not but he disdained my advice and wrote in the left-hand top corner of the bottom sheet of glass he wrote very small but with great clearness and it took him seven history lessons to finish because it was only at rare moments he could do it but the doctor was now and then called out of his study by mrs dunston or somebody and once he had to go and see the mother of a new boy who had written home to say he was being starved it took ten minutes to calm his mother down and during that interval tudor finished his work he had written the amusing words bynon is a louse and we were all rather pleased except bynon but he well deserved the insult being a fearful outsider and generally hated 
and in any case he couldn't hit back for though he had been known to sneak many a time and oft yet it wasn't likely he would sneak about a thing that showed him in his true colours like the writing on the doctor's study window well it was a triumph in a way and everybody heard of it and it was a regular adventure to go into the doctor's study and see the insult to bynan which of course would last for ever unless somebody broke the window and in fact bynan once told me in a fit of rage that he meant to break the window and take the consequences but he hadn't the pluck even when he got an excellent chance to do so and when in despair he tried to bribe other chaps to break the window he hadn't enough money so he failed in every way and the insult stood i must remind you the writing was very small and could only be seen by careful scrutiny it was absolutely safe from the doctor or in fact anybody who didn't know it was there and naturally a tutor never felt the slightest fear that it would ever be seen by the eyes of an enemy when therefore it was discovered and shown to the doctor and all was lost tudor felt bitterly surprised it came out that a housemaid who disliked bannon found it when she was cleaning the window and she showed it to milly dunstan and the hateful milly who loathed tudor because he had once given her a cough lozenge of a deadly kind and made her suck it before she had found out the truth promptly told her mother about the inscription and her mother sneaked to the doctor discovery might still have been avoided but unfortunately tudor's glazier's diamond was well known because he had been reported by brown for scratching brown's looking-glass over the mantel in brown's study when he thought brown was miles away and brown came in at the critical moment so dunstan knew only too well that tudor had a glazier's diamond and owing to the laws of cause and effect felt quite sure that tudor had done the fatal deed therefore tudor suffered the full penalty and dr dunstan told the school that tudor's coarseness was only exceeded by his lawless insolence and contempt for private property that it should have been done in his own study during intervals of respite in the history lesson naturally had its effect on the doctor and made it worse for tudor the glazier's diamond had to be given up and tudor was flogged but being very apt to crock and often bursting out coughing without any reason the doctor did not flog tudor to any great extent and it was not the flogging but the loss of his glazier's diamond that made tudor so mad and resolved him on his revenge well he had a very revengeful nature as a matter of fact and if anybody scored on him he was never as you may say contented with life in general until he had scored back and he always did so and sometimes though he might have to wait for a term or even two he was like the elephant that a man stuck a pin into who remembered it and instantly killed the man when he met him again twenty years later to be revenged in an ordinary way is of course easy but to be revenged against the doctor is far from easy and i reminded tudor how hard it had been even to revenge himself on brown when brown scored heavily off him and if it was hard to be revenged on a master like brown what would it be to strike a blow at the doctor he said it might or might not come off but he should be poor company for me or anybody until he had a try and he developed his scheme of a revenge and thought of nothing else until the idea was ready to be put into execution he said it's not so much revenge really as simple justice he took my glazier's diamond which was the thing i valued most in the world naturally and what i ought to do if i could pratt would it be to take from him the thing he values most in the world i said that's hidden from you and he said no it isn't the thing that he values most in the world is mrs dunstan i said well you can't take her away from him and he said i might some people would remove her by death of course i wouldn't do anything like that she's all right though how she can live with a grey and brutal beast like the doctor i don't know or anybody but of course i can't strike him there i've merely decided to take something he can't do without he'll be able to make it good in time but not all in a minute and in the meanwhile he'll look a fool besides being useless to the world at large it was dangerous but interesting i said 
what could you take so important as all that without being spotted and he said swear not to tell anybody living and i swore then he said his glasses it was a great thought worthy of tudor and of course without his glasses the doctor would be hopelessly done he cannot read a line without them and when he takes a greek class strange to say he wears two pairs his ordinary double glasses against the naked eye and a pair of common spectacles of very large size on his nose outside in this elaborate way he reads greek well i praised tudor but reminded him it was stealing and he said i know that's where the justice comes in he stole my glazier's diamond now i'm going to steal his glasses shall you ever give them back i asked and he said i may or i may not the first thing is to get them he takes them off to stretch his eyes sometimes i reminded tudor yes and for tea said tudor if he goes into mrs dunstan's room for a hasty cup of tea he generally leaves the glasses in the study on his desk till he comes back to work well tudor got them in a week from the day he decided to take them he had an opportunity every day that week he had contrived to be around when tea-time came on and once dr dunstan found him hanging about the passage and told him to be gone but he was crowned with success and that same night in the playground by the light of my electric torch tudor showed me the solemn sight of the double eyeglasses of the doctor actually in his hand well he was fearfully excited about it and concealed the glasses for a few hours in his play-box then fearing there might be a hue and cry and everything stirred to its foundations he took the glasses out just before supper and concealed them in a crevice on the top of the playground wall only known to me and him that night he did not sleep for hours and nor did i i pictured the doctor's terrible anger at having to stop reading the news of the war and tudor told me next morning that he had put the doctor out of action for all school purposes as well as private reading and we might hope for at least three days without him as it would take fully that time to manufacture such glasses as he wore but a bitter disappointment was in store for tudor and when the usual moment came for prayers in the chapel before breakfast lo and behold dr dunstan sailed in with a pair of glasses perched on his nose in the customary place we could hardly believe our eyes then we quickly perceived that dunstan evidently kept a reserve pair of glasses for fear of accidents and the accident had happened and he had fallen back upon the reserve pair no doubt in triumph well tudor said it was gall and wormwood to be done like that and even thought of stealing the second pair of glasses but then a strange and sudden thing overtook tudor and the very next sunday a man came to preach at the chapel service for a good cause and the good cause was a medical drug fund for natives in the wilds of africa these natives become christians under steady pressure and after that always seem to be in need of drugs especially quinine and tudor who owing to his lungs and one thing and another had a good experience of drugs was deeply interested and gave sixpence to the medical drug fund and showed a strong inclination to become a collector for the medical drug missionary i had often heard of sermons altering a person's ideas and making him or her inclined to be different from that moment onwards but i never saw it actually happen in real life before yet in the case of tudor that medical drug sermon and the stirring anecdotes of the savage tribes tamed into well-behaved invalids by the missionary had a wonderful effect upon him and it took the strange form of making him rather downhearted about dr dunstan's glasses nothing had been said when they disappeared and no fuss was made at all and i advised him just to take them back quietly when a chance presented itself and slip them under some papers on the doctor's desk and leave the rest to time i said you'd better do it now while this feeling about being a collector for the missionary is on you it will soon pass off and then you won't want to give them back he said to show you how i did feel before hearing the drug missionary pratt i may tell you that i had an idea of taking the glasses home next holidays and buying a new glazier's diamond and writing on the glasses the bitter words thou shalt not steal and then returning them to his desk next term 
but there are two very good reasons why i shall not do that one is this strong pro-missionary feeling in me and the other is that if i did dunstan would guess to a dead certainty who had done it knowing only too well what i can do in the matter of writing on glass he would i told tudor so the sooner you put them back unharmed the better i shall said tudor and i am going to return them in a very peculiar way i am going to hide them in a certain place and then i am going to write an anonymous letter to dunstan telling him they are in that place well i thought nothing of this idea i said why make it so beastly complicated besides anonymous letters are often traced by skilled detectives and if it was found you wrote it where are you then and he said i have no fear about that because the letter will all be carefully printed and my reason for writing a letter at all is to explain to him that the unknown who took his glasses away is sorry what on earth does that matter to him i said well it matters to me explained tudor as you know that drug missionary made a great impression upon me and i have come to be very sick with myself that i did this thing of course i am not nearly sick enough to give the show away and tell dunstan i did it but i am sick enough to say i am sorry and i want him to know it anonymously well this was beyond me and i told tudor so he then said sometimes pratt people don't pay quite enough income tax but presently there comes a feeling over them that they have defrauded the innocent and trustful government and their hearts are softened i dare say often by a missionary like mine was and then they send five pound notes by great stealth to the chancellor of the exchequer and feel better and their consciences are quickly cured but they take jolly good care not to send their names because they know that if they did the chancellor of the exchequer would go much further and far from rewarding them for their conduct would very likely want more still and never trust them again about their incomes and persecute them to their dying day and it's like that with me then i saw what he meant and i also saw that there may be a great danger in listening to missionaries and was exceedingly sorry that tudor had done so i still advised him not to write to the doctor and i felt sure his conscience would be just as comfortable if he didn't but when tudor decides to carry out a project he carries it out and he is generally very unpleasant till he has accordingly he dropped the doctor's glasses into a deep indian jar which stood on the mantelpiece in the study and then in great secret with me he wrote his letter it happened he had just got a new latin delectus and at the end of this book was a sheet of clean paper without a mark upon it we cut it out with a penknife and took a school envelope and two halfpenny stamps and wrote the letter and posted it to the doctor on the following day well the letter ran in these words all printed so that there was no handwriting in it and the envelope needless to say was also printed in a very dexterous and utterly misleading manner dear sir i regret to have to confess that i stole your eyeglasses in a bad moment there was a very good reason but all the same i am sorry and also clearly know now that it was a very wrong thing to do it was a revenge but it came to nothing because you had a pair in reserve i am glad you did i prefer to be unknown your glasses are in a beautiful and rare indian jar at the left-hand corner of your mantelpiece and i hope you will forgive because my eyes have been opened by the visit of the drug missionary to merivale and i am sorry i am dear sir your well-wisher the unknown well this a good and mysterious letter tudor posted and the very next morning curiously enough he entirely ceased to want to collect for the drug missionary in fact from that moment he fell back quite into his usual way of looking at things and by the next evening actually said he was sorry he had given dr dunstan back his glasses but he was sorrier still three days later for then a very shattering event indeed happened to tudor the doctor sent for him and he went without the least fear to find his anonymous letter lying on the doctor's desk i heard the whole amazing story afterwards the doctor asked him first if he had written the letter and being taken utterly unawares and frightfully fluttered at the shock almost before he knew what he was doing you may say 
Tudor confessed that he had. Then the doctor told him how vain it was for any boy to seek to deceive him. He said, You see how swiftly your sin has found you out, Tudor. And Tudor admitted it had. He was now, of course, prepared for the worst, yet, as he told me, his chief feeling at that moment was not so much terror as a frightful longing to know how the doctor had spotted him. Of course, he couldn't dare to ask, so he merely admitted that his sin certainly had found him out quicker than he expected, and then, rather craftily, he said he was glad it had well the doctor didn't believe this but he was not in a particularly severe mood that evening strange to say and he told tudor exactly what had happened he said it may interest you to know misguided boy that mentioning your anonymous letter to mr brown and informing him that i had found my lost glasses in the spot indicated he evinced a kindly concern and even assured me that he would probably have no great difficulty in discovering the culprit in the brief space of four and twenty hours he did so perceiving that the paper on which you wrote was obviously from a book of a certain folio his first care was to ascertain by comparisons of size from what work it had come perceiving also that the paper was extraordinarily clean he had no difficulty in concluding it was extracted from a new book he then discovered that the pages came from a latin delectus and on further inquiry was able to learn that three copies of the work had recently been issued to members of the lower fourth pursuing his investigations when the boys had retired to rest he speedily marked down the mutilated volume in your desk tutor and while i have already thanked him for his zeal and penetration i feel little doubt that a time will come when looking back on this dark page in your history you will thank him also well tudor didn't give his views about brown but he said the glasses had been very much on his mind only he had not liked to return them without saying he was bitterly sorry he told me afterwards that he was very nearly saying to dr dunstan that some boys would have returned the glasses without even an anonymous letter of regret but fortunately he did not the doctor then took him through the letter and invited him to throw light upon it he was chiefly interested in the part about revenge and he forced tudor to explain that the revenge was because dr dunstan had taken away his glazier's diamond dr dunstan then said that incident was long ago closed and that in fact after the pane of glass in his study had been taken out and a new one put in he had dismissed the matter from his mind he seemed much surprised that tudor had not dismissed the matter from his mind also and he told him that the revengeful spirit always came to grief in the long run he then wound up by saying you sign yourself the unknown wretched boy but let this be a lesson to you that henceforth you are neither unknown to your headmaster or your god for the rest since you have the grace in this penitential though patronizing communication to express sincere regret at your conduct and also to regard the fact that you are my well-wisher though that is not at all the sort of expression suitable from a fourth form scholar to his headmaster since i say i find these signs of grace i shall not inflict the extreme penalty on this occasion for the moment i have not determined on my next step and will thank you to wait upon me this time to-morrow now you may go and tudor said thank you very much sir and went he was a great deal cast down and admitted for once i was right but though his feeling for the doctor was now on the whole one of patience and thankfulness his feeling for brown was very different and when the wretched brown grinned at tudor and rotted him in class and told the whole story of how he had played the beastly sleuth hound on tudor and started calling him the unknown tudor took it with dignified silence and from that instant started to plan the greatest revenge of his life he told me that it might not be at merivale he would be revenged but in the world at large and if it was not until brown had grown old and bald-headed the end was bound to be just the same and the rest of brown's life however long it might last would undoubtedly be ruined by tudor and he also said that he was jolly glad the missionary feeling had left him so that not a shadow of remorse might come between him and brown when the day arrived 
well there was only one thing more rather interesting about tudor's revenge on the doctor and that was dr dunstan's revenge on tudor tudor went to him again at the appointed time and after a lot of jaw the doctor told tudor that he must now write out the complete article on optics in the encyclopedia britannica including all the algebra and everything there were exactly ten huge pages of this deadly stuff and tudor was fairly frantic at first but curious to relate after he had done one page he found it quite interesting in its way then it got more and more interesting as it went on and tudor finally decided that there was no doubt with his strong feeling for the science of optics that he ought to take it up as a profession i asked him if he should take up microscopes or telescopes and he said telescopes certainly because that meant astronomy and in time you might rise to be the astronomer royal at greenwich which was something i said it is a great thing to know the stars and comets by their names and he said yes pratt and another great advantage of astronomy is that you may be out all night whenever you choose and nobody can say a word against you so the extraordinary event came about that what dr dunstan intended as a stiff imposition and sharp punishment on tudor really worked in a very different manner and instead of crushing tudor and grinding him under the heel of dr dunstan so to speak only put into tudor the splendid idea of mastering the heavens and then some day getting the perfect freedom by night of an astronomer royal of greenwich End of Story 9《Story 10 of The Human Boy and the War by Eden Philpotts. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story 10 The Turbot's Aunt. Of course, he was not really called Turbot, but just after he came to Merivale, some ass in the fifth started the silly rag of calling everybody after a fish and pretty well every fish known to science was rung in in fact they just about went round sometimes the likeness was fairly clear and the simile was good for instance being head of the school i was called salmon which is the king of fish and as i am underhung and have rather fierce eyes there was a certain fitness in calling me salmon but after i had decided that abbott could not have his colours for footer being lame there was a feeling against me among abbott's friends and tracy called me tinned salmon which was merely silly and not in the least amusing nor was it amusing to call maybrick sardine because he kept tins of this fish in his desk but john dory was all right for nicholas that being the ugliest fish in the sea and nicholas the ugliest chap at merivale porpoise was true for preston who inclines to great fatness and blows after exertion in a very porpoise-like way but to call briggs herring because he was a doter on a bloater as tracy said and to call tracy himself a torpedo ray because he was always trying to give shocks was footling without being funny on the other hand it was neat to call pratt cuttlefish because he was always inky to the elbows and as far as bradwell was concerned the nickname of turbot suited him very well owing to his eyes which always goggled if a master spoke to him and also owing to his mouth which was all lips and rather one-sided when he laughed kids of course have a poor sense of what is really funny owing to their general ignorance yet they prefer their own feeble jokes to ours a joke that the sixth sees in a moment is utterly lost on them while utter piffle that no sane person would smile at makes them scream we for instance called mitchell shark because of his well-known habits over money but this did not amuse the kids in the least while they called forbes minimus whale because he was the smallest boy in the school which naturally could not cause anybody but an idiot the least amusement well bradwell was far from interesting from a mental point of view having as our master mr fortescue said apparently outgrown his brains he was just at his seventeenth birthday when these remarkable events happened but at first glance and in fact until you talked to him you would at once have said he was grown up 
he was in the lower fifth and it really looked as though a master was in the lower fifth rather than a pupil and he was only there because it would have been a burlesque to put him any lower though in strict justice as far as his knowledge was concerned he would have been in his right place in the upper third but he had to stop in the lower fifth and even there was an absurd sight being six feet high and very large in every way and having a distinct moustache which owing to its being black could not be hidden what a scissors could do he did but it was there and grew by night and could not be concealed he was a very finely made chap and had magnificent muscles but such was his awkwardness and stupidity that he couldn't even use these muscles properly and he was no earthly good even in the gym at games he failed utterly though he tried hard but he was too slow even for a full-back at footer and couldn't get down quick enough for a goalie in fact rapid movement seemed utterly beyond his power at cricket he was also an object of utter scorn for despite his hands which were huge he couldn't hold the simplest catch and despite his reach which was that of a six-foot chap he had not the humblest idea of timing a ball or the vaguest notion of how to play a stroke in fact such was his unworthiness that he could only have played in the third eleven and as that was naturally composed of kids of eleven and twelve it would have been an outrage to see him in it bradwell meant well but he was rather barred not from dislike but simply because he had as it were grown up before his time and had a kid's mind and a man's body in fact he fell between two stools in a manner of speaking because to the sixth and the masters he was a thing of naught while to those who had a mind like his own he was grown up and no use in any way i was the only one at merivale who understood his weird case and when he first came i let him fag for me but he was awful as a fag and such was his over anxiety to please and shine that he never did either i had in fact to chuck him at sixteen years and eleven months of age he led rather a lonely life but when the war broke out he said he was very interested in it and asked me sometimes if i would be so good as to explain military matters to him which i did in the simplest words possible as anything like regular military terms would have been far beyond him on hearing that aeroplanes have great difficulty in descending by night he invented a scheme of stretching strong nets with a big mesh on poles ten feet above the ground spread over half a mile of landing place to catch them this showed mind in a way but he never appeared to have any real martial instinct and when once a girl in merivale handed him a white feather he stopped and took off his hat and said i quite understand what you mean but i shan't be seventeen for a fortnight yet this the girl naturally refused to believe and the turbot came to me and complained about it as a matter of fact i rather backed up the girl not for giving turbot a white feather which is a vulgar and silly thing to give anybody because you never know as the great case of fortescue showed but because she didn't believe turbot when he said he was only about to be seventeen to look at him he might easily have been married which shows appearances are very deceptive but anyway i said you can't blame a flapper for thinking you are of age to join the army bradwell anybody would think so and lots of younger-looking chaps than you have said they were eighteen and been passed without a murmur though their birth certificates would have given them away but anybody six feet high and with a clearly visible black moustache and with your muscles would pass the authorities and you may bet that many have he merely goggled and said no doubt i was right i must tell you that turbot had no father or mother and in fact nobody but a single oldish aunt who lived at plymouth but he had a guardian who sent him to merivale when his family unfortunately died and at first he stopped at merivale in the holidays but once the aunt took him for a fortnight at easter and she appeared to like him for after that he always went to her the guardian did not however like turbot and turbot would have been quite content to stop at merivale in the holidays rather than spend his time with the guardian who had no friendly feeling for him in fact you may say that turbot was a duty rather than a pleasure to the guardian 
then at the beginning of the autumn term in the first year of the war turbot's aunt wrote to dr dunston and asked if turbot might spend saturday till monday with her because it was going to be his birthday and the doctor gave permission so turbot went and naturally was not missed in any way till monday morning then at roll call before chapel the turbot's well-known bleat was not heard and it was soon perceived that he'd done something very much out of the common nothing had been heard from his aunt apparently and so a telegram was dispatched to her and as no reply came to it dr dunston began to worry he then sent off a telegram to the guardian and the excitement decidedly thickened after dinner the doctor sent for me as head boy and told me that the guardian had heard nothing whatever about turbot i may tell you travers he said though there is no reason to repeat it that bradwell is not persona grata with the gentleman who stands to him in loco parentis that is unfortunate for bradwell because he may lack friends in the future being a boy without any mental ability or that charm and power to please we occasionally find in the stupid lad his guardian however evinces no uneasiness at the disappearance of bradwell and my knowledge of human nature inclines me to doubt if the individual in question will much care whether bradwell returns or does not i speak of course in confidence but he is a busy man and has a large family of his own with its concomitant anxieties he sends his own boys to harrow and it is not for us to judge his motives in so doing or whether they are guided by disinterested desire for the future welfare of an obscure attorney's sons or influenced by that spirit of snobbishness from which few englishmen are entirely free now i shall ask you this afternoon travers to undertake a little mission which i can safely trust to you we are as you know very short-handed and to spare a master is almost impossible i will therefore invite you to go as far as plymouth call at number ten motley plain villas and ask to see miss mason the maternal aunt of bradwell and his sole surviving relative it is a somewhat delicate duty and you must regard it as a compliment that i seek your aid here is half a crown for your return railway fare you will alight at motley station and should catch the five thirty train back to merivale the lady has not responded to my telegram hence my desire before putting the matter in the hands of the police to learn all she may be able to tell us present my card and she will see you at once if at home if not wait until she returns it was rather a responsible thing and a great compliment to me so i went first putting on my best clothes and a new pair of gloves arrived at plymouth i got out at mutley and easily found mutley plain villas which were only a quarter of a mile from the railway the house was small but very neat in appearance and the door knocker which was of highly polished brass gave a loud tapping sound into the hall there was no sign of the turbot a servant of considerable age answered my knock and when i asked her if miss mason was at home she replied that she was she told me to walk in which i did i then gave her dr dunston's card and was shown into a neat drawing-room which had a piano in it and a pile of khaki wool on a sofa there was also an illustrated newspaper in the room and i sat down on a chair and read the illustrated newspaper until miss mason arrived presently she came and proved younger than her servant though still not in reality young she was unlike bradwell in every way even her eyes did not resemble his being black and small you might say beady and her mouth had thin lips which revealed lustrous teeth which might have been false ones though on the other hand they might not curiously enough she said i was just writing a letter to dr dunston when you arrived now i can send a message by you instead are you his son no miss mason i answered i am travers the head boy at merivale school how interesting she said and what are you going to do in the world travers i leave next term this is my last term in fact and i am then going to try for woolwich i said that means the army of course she answered i hope you will pass well i then thanked her for this kind wish and said i hoped so too 
owing to the war i explained there is no very great difficulty in passing into woolwich at present and i hope to get on quickly and take my place in the fighting line before the war is over she approved of this quite right she said i never wanted to be a man before the war but i do now she spoke in a very martial and sporting way and rang for tea this was good of its kind and when i had eaten pretty well everything after handing her each dish first she asked me if i would like an egg and of course i said i would then she ordered the old servant to boil two eggs and the old servant did so and i ate them both we talked of the war and funnily enough i quite forgot all about the turbot till a clock chimed on the mantelshelf the hour of five this as it were reminded me of my mission i must soon go back to the station i said so perhaps you will now be so kind as to tell me about turbot and who is turbot she asked so i had to explain that we were all called fish owing to a silly joke and i also hoped that she would not think that i meant anything rude to her nephew by mentioning him in that way she was not in the least annoyed and said ralph came to me on saturday and he left me on sunday morning do you know where he has gone i asked and she said i haven't the slightest idea where he has gone travers that's very serious i said because your nephew's guardian hasn't the slightest idea either her lips tightened over her dazzling teeth at the mention of the guardian and i could see she didn't like him she spoke in a sneering sort of voice and said ah oh, really then feeling there was nothing more to discuss i got up and cleared let me know if anything transpires she said and not happening to remember exactly what transpire meant i merely said that no doubt the doctor would tell her all that might happen in the future about bradwell she shook hands in a kindly manner and saw me to the gate and such was her friendly spirit that she picked a small blue flower and gave it to me to wear put it in your buttonhole she said which i did do until i was out of sight and could chuck it away without hurting her feelings the doctor didn't seem to like what i had to say and evidently thought i hadn't got it right his aunt appears as callous as his guardian said the doctor i am to understand that he went out on sunday morning and did not return and that miss mason has not the slightest idea where he's gone to that's what she made me understand sir i said i fail to credit it answered the doctor then he dismissed me rather slightingly and sent for brown who always does the detective business at merivale there was a good deal of quiet excitement about it and of course we all thought turbot would be run to earth in a few hours or days at most but he never was and though the police looked into the matter and hunted far and wide they never even got a clue because apparently there wasn't one to get in fact turbot vanished off the face of the earth as far as merivale was concerned and it was a nine days wonder as the saying is and no light was ever thrown upon it till long afterwards the aunt was cross-examined by the police but she knew nothing and cared less as brown said for he cross-examined her also all she could say was that turbot had gone out early and not come home in time for church as she naturally expected a boy brought up at merivale to do which was one in the eye for merivale as for the guardian he offered a reward of ten pounds for the recovery of turbot and no more which showed the market value of turbot in that guardian's opinion the only person who really worried was the doctor and i believe he didn't leave a stone unturned to root up turbot but all in vain he had entirely disappeared and being so ordinary in appearance without any distinguishing marks he simply vanished into the void as tracy said and we sold his cricket bat at auction and one or two other things of slight value which we found in his school locker but a portrait of his mother we did not sell and i gave it to the doctor who sent it to the aunt who was much obliged for it and wrote to old dunston with great thanks and said she would keep it until the happy day when turbot turned up out of the void again and that i believe made the doctor more suspicious than ever for he always believed that miss mason knew more about the turbot than she pretended in fact he told mr fortescue that she was prevaricating and fortescue said it looked as though she might be as a matter of fact fortescue had his own theory about turbot and though he never told anybody what it was till afterwards then he told everybody because he proved to be perfectly right 
this was that fortescue who wrote such splendid war poetry but was prevented from enlisting unfortunately by an illness of the aorta which is part of the heart and when enlarged is fearfully dangerous but while he taught at merivale his soul was entirely in the war and in his spare time he did good work chiefly at the red cross hospital in the town where fifty wounded men were always on hand when they got well they went and others came and sometimes when the war slacked off the numbers sank to thirty-two or even thirty and then when it burst out more fiercely they quickly rose to fifty again milly dunstan was one of the workers there but only for swank and the sake of the uniform i believe she peeled onions and shelled peas and cut up meat and so on in the kitchen and sometimes she was allowed to go and see the wounded but i never heard that they cared much for her until they knew she worked in the kitchen then they took interest in her because she could tell them what they were going to have for supper that night and what they were going to have for dinner next day which naturally are things very important to the mind of a wounded hero mr fortescue was well liked at the hospital and took many cigarettes there also books suited to the tommies and he got to be so popular that there was a fair fight for him and if he favoured one ward and didn't go into the other for half the time the other ward got vexed about it for tommy has a jealous nature in some ways though so heroic in the field then there came rather a bad cot case called ted marmaduke and as soon as he arrived he sent a special message to the school for me and for fortescue and fortescue went to see him of course this happened long after i had left merivale and it was in fact my brother who wrote to me about it for after six months at woolwich owing to luck in the war and so on i got a commission in the royal engineers and went to france and there i heard from travers minor about the chap who wanted to see fortescue he had been wounded in the cheek and also in the leg and his face was almost hidden but his eyes were all right and what was fortescue's amazement to see the eyes of ted marmaduke goggle in the old familiar way the moment he came to his bedside for there lay the turbot and fearing that he was going to die he had determined to tell somebody the truth and not die anonymously so to speak and when he found he was at merivale of all places naturally he thought of fortescue and me but i was gone to do my bit so fortescue went and heard the true story of the wily turbot he could only tell it in pieces because it hurt him awfully to talk but in fact he wasn't allowed to talk much at a time but what happened was this he had gone to the aunt for his birthday and told her in secret that he hated merivale worse than ever and was ashamed to be there with a moustache and everything and she was a very martial and fine woman and entirely agreed with him she told him that he was just the sort they wanted in the army and that though he could not distinguish himself at school that was nothing at such a time and she felt positive that he would jolly soon distinguish himself in the army and do things at the front that would make merivale fairly squirm to remember how it had treated him and such was the aunt's warlike instinct that when he reminded her he was only seventeen she scorned him for remembering it go to the recruiting people she said on your seventeenth birthday which is to-morrow and when they ask you how old you are say you'll be eighteen on your next birthday which will be true and he gladly did so but the aunt was fearfully crafty as well as warlike for when turbot decided to go off and enlist at plymouth under his own name she pointed out that he would instantly be traced by dr dunstan and ignominiously dragged back out of the army to merivale so she advised him to take a train to the north of england and enlist up there which he did do and he changed his name to ted marmaduke and the enlisting people in the north never smelt a rat and were quite agreeable to take him when he said he would be eighteen next birthday and such was the fine strategy of the aunt that she expressly made turbot promise not to write a line to her till he was under orders for the front therefore when she was asked if she knew where he was she could honestly say she did not of course long before he came back wounded he was entirely forgotten at merivale and when fortescue discovered him in our red cross hospital and then confessed that he had always believed this was what turbot had really done the excitement became great 
and many of the chaps asked to be allowed to go and see him and some were allowed to go but it was not till the turbot had recovered and was going back to fight that dr dunstan forgave him and he never forgave the aunt yet that amazing aunt was more than a fine strategist she was a prophet also for fortescue found out in the papers that ted marmaduke of the third yorkshires was promoted a sergeant and had won the d c m for splendid bravery in gallipoli just as his aunt had always prophesied he would of course she came to see him at the hospital but she didn't come to merivale when he got nearly right the old turbot took tea at merivale and the doctor let the past bury the past as they say and made a speech and hoped that the chaps would follow turbot's lead in certain directions though not in all but privately to the turbot he said more than this in fact he dug up the past again and reminded turbot that he should not do evil that good may come and turbot quite saw this and said he never would again then he went back to the wars once more and had good luck i'm glad to say and before he'd been a soldier eighteen months he got his commission for though such a mug at school the military instinct was in him all the time and the war naturally brought it out when he became lieutenant bradwell his guardian tried to make friends again but he scorned him as well he might though no doubt he will always be friendly with his crafty aunt for you may say that he owed pretty well everything to her masterly mind End of story ten. story eleven of the human boy and the war by eden philpotts this librivox recording is in the public domain story eleven cornwallis and me and fate dr dunstan was always awfully great on the classic idea of fate he made millions of efforts to make us understand it but failed blades said he understood it and so did abbott and of course the sixth said they did but they always pretended to understand everything including the war fate is the same as greek tragedy and a very difficult subject indeed anyway cornwallis and me couldn't understand fate or how it worked exactly until that far famous whole holiday and the remarkable adventure which made cornwallis and me blaze out into great fame though only for a short while as long as it lasted however the fame was wonderful for the sudden curious result of being somebody after you have for many years been nobody not only leaves its mark on your own character but quite changes the opinion of other people about you and also the way they behave to you enemies slack off and even offer to become friends and people who have been your friends when you were nobody redouble in their affection and even get a sort of feeble fame themselves owing to being able to approach you as a matter of course and not as a favour all this happened to cornwallis and me and though fame is said to have a very bad effect on some people and make them get above themselves like the germans and austrians for instance in our case though dazzling in its way the fame died out almost as quickly as it sprang up in fact to show you what people are and what envy may do just as cornwallis and me began to sink back into our usual obscurity in the lower third some beasts such as pegram and the master brown said in public that the whole excitement was a mild attack of hysteria and utter footle and that neither cornwallis nor me had done anything but make little asses of ourselves and that it was all pure luck and not fame at all but anyway the adventure did this for cornwallis and also for me it explained what the doctor really meant by fate and afterwards we were always tremendously keen about fate and spoke well of it though before it had if anything rather bored us because at the age of ten your fate is generally so far off until the great adventure i can't honestly say i had seen fate bothering about cornwallis and he had never seen it bothering in the least about me but afterwards having as you may say got thoroughly to understand its ways and its special interest in us on a very important occasion in fact what you might call a matter of life and death we always felt a sharp interest in it and often noticed little marks of fate at work both in school and out 
sometimes for us and sometimes for other people not of course always for us because as cornwallis said and i agreed we weren't everybody and when it came to prizes and getting into elevens and other advantages fate undoubtedly favoured various chaps far more than us but as i pointed out to cornwallis after saving our lives in a very ingenious and unexpected way no doubt it had done enough for us for some years and intended to give us a rest we both saw the fairness of this and did not complain in the least at our rather bad failures in the lower third afterwards but curiously enough dr dunstan though so well up in greek tragedy and the ways of fate as a rule missed this and said our reports were a scandal and a source of the utmost discomfort to him and far from showing our gratitude to fate as we ought to have shown it after the terrible affair of foster day foster day was an important day at merivale it arose from the mists of antiquity as they say because among the first pupils old dunstan ever had when he started at merivale was a chap called foster he was very rich and his father lived at dalham on the sea coast and had a mansion and thousands of acres of land running down to the sea this foster seems to have liked the doctor and been a great success at merivale and his rich father evidently liked the doctor too and so when young foster had the bad luck to fall for his country in the boer war the rich father foster built a beautiful and precious chapel to his memory at dalham and had his soldier's son carved in pure marble and put in the chapel it was known as a memorial chapel and simply couldn't be beaten in its way and not content with doing this the rich father arranged with dunstan that fifty boys from merivale should once every year come to a service in this chapel and after the service was over be entertained in his grounds and on the seashore with games and luscious foods the doctor fell in with this excellent plan readily and now for some years on the seventh day of july which was the day the splendid young soldier foster had fallen fifty chaps from merivale drove over in brakes to dalham and attended the memorial service and sang a hymn and afterwards enjoyed themselves in the spacious grounds and on the beach for though not actually belonging to the rich old foster the beach finished off his estates and so he had a special sort of right to it and had built a boat-house where he kept a steam launch and other vessels the day came round as usual and by rather exceptional luck cornwallis and myself got into the fifty for nobody was barred and it was always arranged that a certain number of chaps from the lower school should join the giddy throng so we went in white flannels and the school blazers little knowing what lay before us the day was slightly clouded by the fact that brown was the master who took us for brown loves to display his power before strangers and make us look as small as possible in order that he may shine but the great mr foster though what he had done that was great i don't know saw through brown with ease and told him we must do what we liked and have a good time in every way not in fact hampered by brown after the service in the chapel where some good singing was done by us and a clergyman preached a rather longish sermon on duty and so on the solemn business of the day began and we had an ample meal when i tell you that there were enough raspberries and cream for all i need add no more if all those raspberries had been put in one pile we should have had no small part of a mountain as virgil so truly says the great thing after dinner was to go and bathe and ramble on the shore this was the time that brown could be most easily escaped and as he had to keep his attention on the chaps who went swimming those who did not were able to enjoy themselves in various interesting ways the tide was out and by a little dodging behind rocks cornwallis and me who did not bathe were able gradually as it were to slip out of the danger zone which we did do a magnificent and interesting beach spread out before us and we decided to explore it so we retreated fast for some distance till a cliff jutted out and entirely concealed us and then we went slower and explored as we went cornwallis had a watch and as there was no serious work on hand till tea at five o'clock we had more than two hours 
we did some natural history and found some pools full of marine wonders such as sea anemones and blenny fish which in skilled hands can be made as tame as white mice and can live out of the sea between tides we also collected shells and much to my amusement i collected one shell which i thought was empty until i felt a gentle crawling in my trousers pocket and discovered that a hermit crab had lived in the shell and was frantically trying to escape this of course i allowed him to do and no doubt he is puzzling to this day about what happened to upset his usual life on we went and when the beach got narrower and i said it was natural but cornwallis thought not he thought the tide was coming in which would account for the increasing narrowness of the beach i said in that case cornwallis we had better go back because you can see by the marks on the cliff that the tide will come here in great quantities and in fact the water will be jolly deep and cornwallis said he supposed it would the time also was getting on and we found it was past four but of course we meant getting back fast with an occasional run and had allowed half the time to get back that we allowed to go out we were just turning after going a few hundred yards farther when a most interesting thing appeared the cliffs hung over rather and were made of red sandstone and very steep but ahead of us was a ledge of rock halfway up the cliff and on it a mysterious little house made of bits of old boat and painted with tar it was extraordinary to see such a thing in such a lonely spot and cornwallis who was rather suspicious owing to the war and being a boy scout wondered if it was all right because if you are once a boy scout as travers minor pointed out you are always a boy scout and though you may not be scouting in a professional sort of way yet if anything peculiar happens or you get a chance of doing good to the country you must instantly look into it so cornwallis decided to go and examine this queer shed and i went with him the door was open but we saw no signs of life it was a solid building made of heavy timbers and there was a padlock on the door inside was a pleasant smell of tar and cobbler's wax and fish it seemed to belong to a mariner of some sort but on the other hand what mariner could possibly want to make his house in such a weird spot there was no bed or washing basin or chest of drawers to show that the stranger lived there but there were many interesting things including a lobster pot a telescope and a large lantern of the sort used on board ship i saw nothing peculiarly suspicious but cornwallis did from the first he took rather a serious view of it and when he found a green tin full of petrol his face went white and he said it was fate i said what the dickens do you mean cornwallis and he said i mean towler that this is the hiding place of a german spy there's a telescope with which he picks up periscopes and there's a lamp with which he signals to the submarines by night and there's the petrol he takes to them to replenish their tanks and this shows the doctor was right you can get fate in real life as well as greek tragedies and i said but the prawn nets and the fishing lines and corks and paint and so on and he said these things are merely blinds to distract the eye from the others so i said well what are you going to do about it and he said i'm going straight back and after tea or even before i shall tell the great mr foster there is a pro-german traitor under his cliff and offer to show him the way to the spot i'll help i said but the thing is to be careful and surprise the spy at his work just as i said these words curiously enough the spy surprised us and we found ourselves in a position that wanted enormous presence of mind suddenly we heard the sound of heavy feet outside and as there was only one way up to the hut it was clear we could not escape without being seen and if seen of course our object was lost for the spy would make a bolt of it the question was where to hide and by the best possible luck there was a chance to do so a big tarpaulin hung on a nail on the side of the hut and it was of great size and came nearly to the ground while at its feet was a seaman's box 
owing to the fortunate smallness of cornwallis and me there was ample room for concealment behind the tarpaulin and our feet were hidden by the box so we got behind it and hardly dared to breathe though just before the traitor came in cornwallis had time to whisper to me if he's come for his tarpaulin coat we're done for and he'll very likely kill us and i whispered to him be hopeful fate may be on our side and it's not the weather for a tarpaulin coat anyway then the spy came in and though i was not able to see him cornwallis by a lucky chance got a buttonhole of the coat level with his eye and saw the fearful spectacle of the spy he was a dreadful object with wickedness fairly stamped on him so cornwallis said afterwards he was a big man with humpbacked shoulders and a coconut-like head far too small for his body and legs he was gray and had a shaggy beard and a wide mouth that showed his teeth these were broken and black his nose was flat and small and his eyes rolled in his head as he looked round his hut they were black and ferocious to a most savage extent he kept making a snorting sound which was his manner of breathing he wore dirty white trousers and a jersey and upon his feet were dirty canvas shoes he had no hat and he didn't look the sort of person that fate would be interested in but you never know he suspected nothing and had not seen us come in which was the great fear of my mind the creature did not stop long yet long enough to give himself away for ever as a spy for he took one of the green tins of petrol and then saying some english swear words to himself of the worst kind went out and slammed the door behind him we nearly shouted with joy but a moment later our joy was changed into the most terrible sorrow because the spy fastened the door behind him we heard a chain rattle and a padlock click so there we were entirely at the mercy of a creature evidently quite dead to pity in every way this was of course fate again as cornwallis pointed out there was a window about a foot square high up in the roof of the hut and when the spy shut the door and locked us in everything became dark excepting for the light from this narrow window therefore when we were sure our enemy had gone and there was not a sound outside i got on to a table and cornwallis climbed on my back from which he was able to look out through the window luckily it faced the sea and cornwallis reported that the sea had come a great deal nearer and that the spy was only about fifty yards off he stood on a sort of pier of rocks and was pulling in a rope to which was attached a small motor-boat then naturally i wanted to get on cornwallis's shoulders but he told me not to move for a moment then he said that the spy had got into the boat and was evidently going to sea and then he said he had gone i next climbed on to cornwallis and so proved the truth of his words for i distinctly saw the motor-boat speed off with the spy in it i also saw that the tide had come in and soon it was actually beating against the rocks twenty-five feet or so below us when the motor-boat had disappeared in a westerly direction cornwallis and me got down off the table and considered what we ought to do the first thing is to make every possible effort to escape at any cost i said but he said that he had already thought of that and felt pretty certain it was beyond our power the window seemed the only hopeful place but it was made not to open and the glass was thick and cornwallis said we couldn't have got through the hole even if there had been no glass but i said it is well known cornwallis that if a man can get his head through a hole he can get his body through and he said it isn't well known at all you might because you have got a head like a tadpole but i couldn't i said i was sure i had read it somewhere but anyway it didn't matter we examined the hut thoroughly and found it was only too well and solidly made we were utter prisoners in fact and owing to the spy not knowing it might very likely be left to die of starvation he might even have gone to join a submarine and never come back perhaps he does know we are here all the time said cornwallis perhaps he spotted us and pretended he didn't in that case he may have locked us in deliberately to starve us not caring to waste a shot on us this thought depressed us a good deal and presently the sun sank and the light began to fade and a seagull that settled outside on the roof uttered a melancholy and doleful squawk of course we were far from despairing yet 
and cornwallis made a cheerful remark and reminded me that if we had eaten our last meal on earth at any rate it was a jolly good one and i said there may be food concealed here for that matter we'd better have a good hunt and look into every hole and corner before it is dark this we did without success there were many strange things there including pieces of wreckage a bit of an old ship's steering wheel and a brass bell with a ship's name on it but there was nothing eatable excepting some fish to bait a lobster pot and the fish hadn't been caught yesterday and we had by no means reached the stage of exhaustion in which we could regard it as food cornwallis said as a matter of fact our great enemy will be thirst i am frightfully thirsty already for that matter and i said so am i now you mention it as the light died away we held a sort of a council and tried to decide what exactly was our duty to england firstly and to ourselves secondly we talked a good deal until our voices grew queer to ourselves and it all came back to the same simple fact our duty was to get out and we could not then i had the best idea that had yet come to us i said as we can't get out we must try and get somebody in the outer world to let us out the only question is shall we attract anybody but the spy if we raise an alarm cornwallis said of course that was the question but it didn't matter because we couldn't raise an alarm i said if we howl steadily together once every sixty seconds by your watch like a minute gun at sea somebody is bound to hear sooner or later and he said far from it towler we shall only tire ourselves out and get hungry as well as thirsty for no good our voices wouldn't go any distance through these solid walls and even if they did we are evidently in a frightfully lonely and secluded place miles and miles from civilization else the spy wouldn't have chosen it for his operations i admitted this but we did try a yell or two the result was feeble and i myself said that if any belated traveller heard it he would only murmur a prayer and cross himself and hurry on like they do in books then Corsmallis decided to break the window he didn't know why exactly but he felt he wanted to be up and doing in a sort of way besides it was beastly fuggy in the spy's den so we broke the window with a boat hook and i got on the shoulders of cornwallis and had a good yell through it but no answer came then another idea struck me and it was undoubtedly this idea that saved the situation we got the old ship's bell and hung it up on a rope as near the window as possible and hammered it with the boat hook taking turns of five minutes each this created an immense volume of sound and though of course it was more far more likely to bring the spy back than anybody else we had now reached a pitch of despair and would have even welcomed the spy in a sort of way cornwallis from time to time still worried about our duty but i had long passed that for it was nine o'clock so at last i told him to shut up and hit the bell harder it was now quite dark and from time to time heavy drops of rain fell through the window the sea-going lamp would have been very useful now for we might have signalled with it but though there was an oil lamp in it we had no matches and it was therefore useless then in a lull when i was handing over the boat hook to cornwallis whose turn it was to hammer the bell we distinctly heard the stealthy sound of the motor-boat returning and cornwallis mounting my shoulders and nearly breaking my neck in his excitement reported a red light below then he heard several harsh voices cornwallis said we are now probably done for towler the spy has evidently been to a submarine and he's heard the bell and you can pretty easily guess what submarine germans will do to us in fact our fate is right bang off i said surely they wouldn't kill two kids like us and he said killing kids is their chief sport they can't be too young from babies upward so it looked pretty putrid in every way and it wouldn't be true and it wouldn't be believed if i said cornwallis and me weren't in the funk of our lives but the awful moments didn't last long for almost before the padlock was undone what should we hear but the well-known yelp of brown our first thought was that the crew of a german submarine had also got brown but even in our present condition we felt that was too mad 
all the same when he actually appeared with two other men and the spy he looked such a ghastly object and was so white and wild that it seemed clear that he was in a mess of some kind what he said when we both appeared in the lantern light was thank god for the first and last time in his life he was apparently glad to see us but after this expression of joy he instantly became beastly and in fact so much so that a man behind him who did not fear him told him not to talk so roughly to us at such a moment this man turned out to be no less a man than the great mr foster himself and he explained to us that we had put everybody to frightful anxiety and distress and that in fact he had feared the worst this much surprised us and what surprised us still more was mr foster's attitude to the spy for he called him joe and treated him in a most friendly manner we all went back to the motor-boat and while it tore away to the landing-place under mr foster's beach we told our story during this narrative which was listened to very carefully the man called joe made several remarks of a familiar nature which showed he was not in the least afraid of anybody and we found out later that he was an old and trusted servant of mr foster's who lived at dalham and who managed mr foster's motor-boat and caught lobsters for him and fish of many kinds and was in fact a sort of family friend of long standing it was admitted however that joe was very queer to look at and also odd in his ways this arose entirely from his peculiar fate because fate had had a dash at him too and when a young man he had once gone out fishing and returned to find that during his absence his wife had run away forever with another mariner this was such a surprise to him that it had quite turned his head for a time and in fact he had been odd ever since having told our tale we ventured to ask why everybody had feared the worst and mr foster explained the situation and showed what a splendid and remarkable bit of work fate had really done for cornwallis and me he said what did you intend to do when you left joe's hut and i said we were going to tear back along the beach sir and give the alarm because we thought he was a pro-german spy joe gurgled at this but did not condescend to answer and do you know what would have happened in that case asked mr foster you would have explained to us that we were on a false scent sir said cornwallis no my child i should not answered mr foster for the very good reason that i should never have seen either of you again alive nor would anybody else if you had started to go back by the beach you would both have been overtaken by the tide and most certainly been drowned crikey said cornwallis under his breath to me yes continued the good and great mr foster if joe here quite ignorant of the fact that you were trespassing in his store shed had not turned the key upon you both you would neither of you be alive to tell your story now somehow we never thought we were trespassing but doing our duty to england it just shows how different a thing looks from different points of view you ought to be very thankful said mr foster and i hope this terrible experience will leave its mark in your hearts my boys you have been spared a sad and untimely death and i trust that the memory of this night will help you both to justify your existence in time to come we said we trusted it would then brown of course put in his oar and if you had used your eyes towler and cornwallis as i have tried so often to make you he squeaked you would have seen a notice on the cliff warning people not to go beyond a certain point as the tides were very dangerous we were studying the wonders of nature sir i answered in rather a sublime tone of voice because this was no time for sitting on cornwallis and me and just then the motor-boat came to shore and it was found that we could catch the last train back to dalham so we caught it of course all the other chaps had gone back in the brakes ages ago mr foster blessed us before the train started in a very affectionate and gentlemanly way but brown did not bless us on the journey back in fact he said that he should advise the doctor to flog us we preserved a dignified silence he couldn't send a telegram on in advance as the office was shut and therefore when we arrived at merivale it was rather triumphant in a way and the news of our safe return created a great sensation in the excitement food for us was overlooked entirely until cornwallis told the matron we had had nothing to eat since dinner food was then provided 
the doctor said very little until the following day and then he told the whole story to the school after morning prayers and not until we heard it from him did we realize what a good yarn it really was but nothing was done against us much to brown's disappointment and from the way he hated cornwallis and me afterwards i believe he got ragged in private for not keeping his eye on us we wrote a very sporting letter to mr foster and said we should not forget his great kindness as long as we lived and we also wrote home and scared up ten pounds for joe because he had locked us up and saved our lives it was an enormous lot of money and far beyond what we expected my father sent five and the mother of cornwallis also sent five and cornwallis truly said it showed that my father and his mother must think much more highly of our lives than they have ever led us to believe in fact so excited was the mother of cornwallis about it that she couldn't wait till the end of the term but had to come and see him and kiss him and realize that he was still all there but my father waited until the end of the term for me he is rather a hard sort of man compared to such a man as mr foster for instance and when i did go home and explained all about what fate had done he said he hoped that i would not give fate cause to regret it at any rate during the summer holidays end of story eleven story twelve of the human boy and the war by eden philpotts this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story 12, For the Red Cross Of course, being for the Red Cross, we were jolly well paid for all our trouble by knowing what a tremendous lift we had given the Red Cross in general. But somehow we felt that, if anything, too much was made of the wonderful result, and too little of us who had done it. Because, you see, if a chap in the trenches covers himself with glory, as they so often do, it is noted down to the chap's credit, and he gets a DCM or DSO or a VC. But in our case, as Tracy rather neatly put it, we weren't so much as mentioned in dispatches, and the bitter irony was that Merivale fairly rung with the fame of Dr. Dunstan, whereas the truth was that we did everything, and Dr. Dunstan, far from urging us on, really threw cold water on the whole show, and up to the last moment feared we were in for a grisly failure instead of a most extraordinary success. There was a good deal of difference of opinion afterwards as to who sprang the idea, and on the whole I don't think any one chap could take the credit. It was too big a thing for one chap's mind, and you might say nearly everybody in the fifth and sixth had a hand in it. It grew and grew till it reached the stage of asking Dr. Dunstan, and after he had conferred with Brown and Fortescue and Old Peacock, he reluctantly agreed and then it grew by leaps and bounds till it became the wonderful thing it was. The idea was to give an entertainment for the funds of the Red Cross, and Blades believed it would be a better and finer entertainment if we did it absolutely on our own, without any help from the masters whatever. A few faint-hearted chaps thought not, but they were overruled, for, as Briggs pointed out, there was no entertaining power whatever in the masters. The only one who would have been any good in that way was Hutchings, who sang remarkably well in a bass voice of great depth, but he was at the war, and none of the others had any gift that could lure a paying audience. No doubt they might have tried, but as Tracy said, you couldn't ask people to pay good money just for the doubtful pleasure of seeing them trying. So it was settled that as there was a great deal of mixed power of amusing an audience in the school, we could do it without any assistance and Fortescue supported this and advised the doctor that we should be given a free hand, but Peacock, of all people, doubted, and Brown, who wanted to shine himself in some way, thought we ought to have him and Fortescue to give a backbone to the show. What he was prepared to do, by way of backbone, we didn't ask. What he did do, when the time came, was to show the people to their seats, and his evening dress, which we had not seen before, was worth all the money, if not more. Anyway, Fortescue got the doctor to let us do everything without help, and the end justified the means, as Saunders very truly said, though at one time it rather looked as if it might not. It was announced in public that the scholars of Merivale were going to give an entertainment for the Red Cross before Christmas breaking up, and when all was decided, we had two clear months for the preparations. 
owing to the war and one thing and another we didn't have much football that term and the show got to be the great idea in everybody's mind so much so in fact that owing to an utter breakdown in geography in the lower fourth there was a threat from headquarters that the whole thing would be knocked on the head if the work was going to suffer so we gave the lower fourth some advice on the subject and told them not one of them should do anything if they didn't buck up of course the great problem was who should be in the show and who should not that was a question for the sixth and it proved a very difficult problem because there were immense stores of talent at merivale and some of the chaps best fitted to entertain a paying audience by their great gifts absolutely refused to appear whereas strangely enough others quite useless in every way were death on appearing we even had one or two letters from mothers written to the committee of the merivale concert fairly groveling to us to let their sons do something of course we ignored these though pegram with his usual strategy advised us to give young tudor a show of some sort because his mother and father were worth many thousands and would doubtless buy dozens of front seats if tudor did anything publicly so in one item of the performance which was a scene from the merchant of venice we let tudor and certain other kids come on in the crowd we also let cornwallis and towler sing a duet not so much because it was a thing to pay to hear but because of their great adventure on foster day when by a fluke they weren't drowned and so possessed a passing interest in merivale the program needed a fearful lot of thought and we altered it many times the first program would have taken about three days to get through and tracy said as it wasn't a wagner cycle we'd better try and cram the show into three hours and briggs said there would be encores which must be allowed for and i remembered that there must be an interval because on these occasions women want something to drink about halfway through and men want both to drink and smoke also and if they are prevented from doing these things they often turn against the performance and the last state of that show is worse than the first i am thwaites by the way and like percy minor i hope that i may go on the stage some day being much inclined to do so but his father is a professional actor and so he has a better chance than me mine being a government official in london who never goes to the theatre always being too tired to do anything after his day's work i recite when i get the chance and have already acted several times i also write poems I did not push myself forward in the least. It was agreed by a sort of general understanding, except in the mind of Percy Minor, that I should play Shylock in the trial scene from The Merchant of Venice. And Williams, who is pretty and had many a time been rotted for his girl-like eyes and eyelashes, now found that his hour had come, for he was going to play Portia. And we hoped his beautiful appearance might carry him through, though at rehearsal it was only too apparent his acting would not. The first part of the show was to end with a Shakespearean impersonation, but this was not all, though of course the cream of the night. We had in the second half an original satire in one act, written by Tracy, and entitled The White Feather this would be the concluding item and as we finally decided that we would have twelve separate items that left ten to find there were some obvious things like percy minimus who had a ripping voice and was accustomed to singing both in and out of chapel so knowing he was considered class we put him down for a song and the school glee singers were also rather well thought of and we gave them two items this only left seven performances and after we had subtracted most of the chaps who were going to perform in the plays there was still an immense amount of mixed ability to choose from of course rice had to be in it though in his usual sporting way he said he could do nothing but as he was the best boxer in the school and almost as good as a professional flyweight we felt no show would be complete without him and it was arranged he should box three exhibition rounds with bassett as Briggs said, with people who pay money, you must give everybody something they will like, and though the people who would come to see Shakespeare acted might not be at all the same people who would come to see Rice, Hammer, Bassett, yet there it was, we didn't want to disappoint anybody, because the great thing with a successful entertainment is to make everybody thoroughly feel that they have had their money's worth, as Mitchell pointed out. He was going to take the money and sit in the box and give out the tickets, 
he could have done other things but chose that himself having great natural ability in everything of a financial sort and as all the tickets were numbered we felt it was safe besides for the red cross nobody would let his financial ability lead him astray so to speak percy minor the son of the famous professional actor also wished to play shylock but was put down for a comic song an art in which he excelled and tracy wanted to write it for him and make it topical but we knew tracy's satire and felt it would not do besides he'd already written a whole play as it was and was performing the chief part in it so we let percy minor choose his own song and he chose one of albert chevalier's which blended pathos and humour in a very wonderful way but was difficult this left five items and it seemed almost a shame to leave out so much talent but we finally decided on abbott for a conjuring entertainment him being a flyer at that art and on nicholas who has the great gift of lightning calculation though strange to say a fool in everything else he stands with his back to a blackboard and can divide or add in his head and if you read him out ten figures and then ten more to subtract from them he can do it in a moment and no doubt he will make his living in this way though it is a science that is utterly useless in the world at large allowing for cornwallis and towler there were only two items left and i had the good luck to remember there was so far nothing about the red cross in the whole show so we asked fortescue if he would allow a recitation of his famous poem on that subject and he consented if he was allowed to coach the boy who did it we gladly agreed to this and forrester was decided upon for the boy though he would rather have given his well-known and remarkable imitation of natural sounds such as a cock crowing or a bottle of ginger beer popping or a man with a cold in his head or a distant military band it was decided therefore that if forrester got an encore he might give the imitations but he didn't so they were unfortunately lost though many a paying audience would have liked them better than the recitation splendid as it was for the last item of all it was almost impossible to choose between about ten chaps and at last after voting in secret several times the six got it down to young hastings who could play the fiddle in a manner seldom heard from a kid of nine years old and weston who was prepared to black his face and play his banjo finally we decided for weston because he was the eldest and would be leaving next term but one whereas hastings being only nine was bound to have many future chances of appearing with his fiddle so that was the program and even when drawn out and written down it was pretty staggering but when actually printed in regular program form it was wonderful and for my part i didn't see how the big schoolroom would hold half the people who were bound to come in fact i suggested giving two or even three performances on consecutive nights but this was not approved of being as you may say historical i will here insert the program the price was threepence or what you liked to give above that sum many gave more some got copies for nothing owing to the program kids losing their heads about change it appeared in this way on pink paper faintly scented and nothing was charged for the scenting by the printers so i suppose the scent was their contribution to the red cross fund for the red cross on the seventeenth day of december next by kind permission of dr dunston the scholars of merivale will give the following entertainment in the great hall of merivale school at seven thirty p m doors open at seven o'clock but reserved seats may be booked and a plan of the room seen at messrs thompson's number four high street merivale the program one song by percy minimus son of the world-famous actor thomas percy two conjuring by abbott using live rabbits live goldfish etc three three rounds of exhibition boxing by rice flyweight champion and bassett n b the rounds will be of two minutes duration four glee singing by the school glee singers five recitation the cross of red words published in the times newspaper by mr fortescue of merivale school reciter forrester six the trial scene from the merchant of venice by william shakespeare dramatis personae as follows shylock thwaites the duke pegram antonio saunders bassanio preston graziano percy minor salario travers minor nerissa percy minimus portia williams magnificos 
tudor forbes minimus hastings and five others scene venice a court of justice n b the scene will conclude with the exit of shylock an interval of ten minutes part two seven glee singing by the school glee singers the three chafers by request eight comic song percy minor son of the great actor thomas percy nine lightning calculation nicholas introduced by thwaites must be seen to be believed ten coon interlude with banjo weston eleven duet towler and cornwallis both nearly drowned last summer on foster day twelve a satire in one act by tracy entitled the white feather dramatis personae captain harold van sittert maltravers b c tracy general sir henry champernon k c b blades a policeman briggs miss sophia flapperkin williams scene trafalgar square time the present god save the king booking office mitchell well that was the program and seeing the front seats were only half a crown there didn't seem much chance of anybody not getting their money's worth i could say a great deal about the rehearsals which were very difficult owing to the question of scenery and finally after many suggestions we decided merely to have wings and leave the rest to the imagination because we couldn't get within miles of a court in venice and trafalgar square was equally out of the question and percy minor said that really classy stage managers like granville barker relied less and less on scenery and that the very highest art was to go back to elizabethan times and just stick up what the scene was on a curtain and if people didn't like it they could do the other thing so we went back to elizabethan times but we had a professional man from plymouth to make us up for shakespeare and he did it professionally and we were rather dazzled ourselves at what we looked like on the night seen close you're awful but of course it's all right from the front the dresses for shakespeare were also professional and we had help for without the matron and nelly dunston and minnie dunston and a maid or two the dresses would not have fitted and so caused derision but they did well and we looked very realistic though my jewish gabardine was too long to the last however nobody noticed though naturally they did notice when antonio's beard carried away and it spoilt the pathos because some fools laughed instead of taking no notice as any decent chaps would have well of course the excitement was to see how the half-crown seats went off at dowson's and they weren't gone in a moment by any means you could book both half-crowners and eighteen pennies which came next and people put off their booking a good deal but when the program was out the booking improved and five people booked in one day it was rather interesting to hear who had booked and mitchell was allowed to go to the shop every morning after school to know how things were going sir neville carew from the manor house took five half-crown seats in the front row and dr dunston himself took the next five this news we greeted with mingled feelings yet as mitchell pointed out he might have had them for nothing which was true the masters all took half-crown seats dotted about the big hall and when briggs asked brown why they had done this instead of sitting together brown said to applaud your efforts briggs and suggest a consensus of opinion if we can as a matter of fact we didn't want their wretched applause when the time came for we got plenty without it the most sensational person to take a half-crown seat was old black from next door he had always been our greatest enemy and hated us and he never gave anything back that went over his wall and made us pay instantly if we did any damage or broke a pane of glass or anything yet there he was he sat in the second row and not a muscle moved from first to last and he never clapped once yet extraordinary to say the most remarkable thing about the whole performance had to do with old black though the amazing affair didn't come out till next morning mitchell calculated that if every seat was taken we should clear thirty-four pounds odd and he rather hoped the programmes would bring in about thirty-six from that however had to be subtracted the cost of the dresses and the professional man from plymouth and also the cost of the programmes and the piano man it looked as if we should be good for a clear thirty pounds but only if the house was full happy to relate it was and many people who did not book at all came and took their tickets at the door and the one bob part was packed 
in fact a good many stood all through including those interested in merivale in humbler ways such as the tuck woman and the ground man and the drill sergeant and many other such like people when therefore after the interval for refreshments dr dunston got up and said we had taken thirty seven pounds four shillings there was great cheering and most did not hide their surprise a reporter came from the merivale trumpet and mitchell saw that he had plenty of refreshments for nothing because this was expected by reporters and much depends on it he ate and drank well so we naturally hoped for a column or two about the show but the cur wrote a most feeble account in three inches of type and gave all the praise to dr dunston so i need not repeat what he said the truth was as follows and i shall take the program by its items and be perfectly fair about it i don't pretend everything went off as well as we hoped and some of the chaps didn't come off at all but on the other hand many did and the failures also got a friendly greeting and even if you make a person laugh quite differently from what you expected it's better than if he doesn't laugh at all besides we had to remember that everybody had paid solid cash so it wasn't like a free show where people have got to be pleased or pretend to be because when you have paid your money you are free to display your feelings and if people in a paying audience are such utter bounders as to laugh in the wrong places there's no law against it and the performers must jolly well stick it as best they can well of course percy minimus was a certainty and the start was excellent in fact some people wanted to encore him but this did not happen though he would have sung again because the live rabbit which abbott had borrowed from bellamy for his illusions broke loose and dashed on to the platform so when the audience expected percy back instead there appeared a large lop-eared white rabbit with the brown behind it looked of course as if abbott had already begun to conjure and in fact had turned percy into a lop-eared rabbit anyway the people were so much interested that they stopped encoring percy and seemed inclined to encore the bewildered rabbit then abbott appeared and caught the rabbit which had rather ruined his show by appearing in this way and vernon and montgomery who were his assistants brought on the magic table with various objects arranged upon it for the tricks unfortunately abbott was very nervous which is a most dangerous thing for a conjurer to be and tricks which he would have done to perfection during school hours or in the home circle so to say got fairly mucked up before the paying audience he put on an appearance of great ease but he couldn't manage his voice and he forgot his patter and he also forgot how to palm and kept dropping secret things at awkward moments and making footling jokes to hide his confusion the people were frightfully kind and patient and that made him worse i believe if they had hissed it might have bucked him up he forced a card as he thought on old black and after messing about with a pistol and an orange and a silk handkerchief and some unseen contrivances he made the ace of spades appear in a bouquet of imitation flowers and then challenged old black to show his card which he did do and it unfortunately turned out to be the four of hearts this fairly broke abbott and when it came to bringing the lop-eared rabbit out of a borrowed hat every soul in that paying audience saw him put it in first it is true he tried to conceal it and a mass of other things under a huge flag supposed to be the union jack but the rabbit who had never been conjured with before and hated it kicked violently and defied concealment so to say however abbott got a lot of trick flowers and vegetables and about half a mile of yellow ribbon into that hat at the same time as the rabbit and the audience had not seen him do this so they were slightly mystified and applauded in a weary sort of way he finished up by bringing a bowl of goldfish out of a dice with white spots on it and though there was no great deception it passed off safely for the goldfish then abbott bowed and cleared out and thanks to fortescue who is fond of abbott and said bravo and tried to work up some applause there was no absolute blank when he had done but montgomery and vernon who had to clear up the debris afterwards got one of the best laughs of the night because they became fearfully entangled in the yellow ribbon and thoughtless people were a good deal amused to see it then came rice and bassett in shorts with a new pair of boxing gloves a chair was put in each corner of the stage and the seconds stood by the chairs 
it was all pure science but only a few chaps at the back appreciated them and when as bad luck would have it rice tapped bassett's ruby in the first round the women part of the audience gurgled and gave little yelps and screams it was nothing but evidently appeared strange and dreadful to them so the doctor stopped the exhibition and that item had to be put down as an utter failure perhaps it was a silly thing to have arranged for a mixed audience but we had to think of rice's feelings and we also knew that scores of countesses and duchesses go to see carpentier and wells and such like in real fights so we little dreamed anybody would squirm at a harmless exhibition bout that wouldn't have shaken a flea but it was so and consequently the glee singers were a great relief and while they warbled their simple lays the female part of the audience recovered of course we thespians did not see any of these things as we were all making up for the great trial scene forrester got fair applause for fortescue's fine poem but nothing special as a matter of fact he forgot the third verse which was the best and doubtless fortescue felt very sick about it but he was powerless to do anything though he never much liked forrester after then came the grand item and it was good in every way and went very smoothly till just the end of course i can't say anything about my rendition of shylock in fact i didn't feel i had gripped the audience in the least but chaps told me you might have heard a pin drop and nobody recognized me who knew me and many of the people in the audience thought it was one of the masters and not a boy at all pegram rather overreacted the duke which is a part that merely wants stateliness and no acting but he would act and so forgot his words and hung us up once or twice in fact pegram was not good but antonio by saunders was a very thoughtful performance and so was bassanio by preston percy minor certainly came off as graziano and unfortunately he acted so jolly well that in one of his fearful scores off me i forgot the dignified pathos of shylock and laughed it was a new reading in a way but i didn't mean to laugh and it did a lot of harm because after that the audience wouldn't take me seriously though before i believe most of them had it spoiled the illusion of the scene portia in the hands of williams was most beautiful to see but from the art point of view awful he got out his words however and just at the end before my exit many dunstan who had plotted it with him in secret threw him a bouquet of white chrysanthemums and the fool picked it up and said out loud thank you many of course after that my exit went for nothing and when it was over i punched his head behind the scenes while in front people were laughing themselves silly we got two calls and it shows what a force the drama really is because in the second half of the program nobody cared a button about such excellent things as percy minor's comic song and though Towler and cornwallis were mildly applauded it was only because they happened to be still alive and not dead and the lightning calculations of nichols didn't even tempt many men to come away from the refreshments i dare say many of them were very poor and had to make so many lightning calculations themselves owing to the war that they weren't specially interested in what nicholas could do but for tracy's play they all came and such applause was never heard within the walls of maryvale which shows that the drama still holds its own the idea of the white feather was certainly very original and the dialogue very satirical as the girl with the white feathers williams appeared again in a dress lent him by minnie dunstan this was too small in some places and too big in others but thanks to a huge female hat and a wig of golden hair williams made a very fair flapper though inches too tall for such a creature he gave a feather to captain maltravers v c from gallipoli who was in mufti and tracy with an eyeglass which he manages fairly well and a moustache was frightfully satirical at the flapper's expense and every point he made went with a roar then the flapper stuck a white feather into the frock coat of general sir champernon also in mufti and he was not satirical but got into a frightful rage and gave up the flapper to a policeman she cried and begged for pardon and then the v c returned and saved her from the general and the policeman and promised to marry her after the war the house was fairly convulsed 
and it was really jolly true to nature so much so that the pianist almost forgot god save the king when all was over for though a professional and well used to entertainments he laughed as much as anybody then the people came like shadows and so departed in the words of the immortal bard and not until next day did the final stupendous thing happen with old black he looked over the playground wall just before dinner as he often did to make a beast of himself about something and seeing me and weston and another chap or two kicking about a football he said to me are you the boy thwaites and i said i was then he said come in thwaites i want to speak to you my first thought was what had i done but as i hadn't had any row with old black for two terms my withers were unwrung and i went and he took me into his study and handed me a bit of pink paper with writing on it what's this sir i asked a check for the red cross he answered a check for twenty guineas to add to the money from your performance last night he was scowling all the time mind you and looking as if he hated the show i'm sure it's very sporting of you sir i said to old black not in the least he replied i laughed more last night than i've laughed for fifty years and i only paid half a crown much too little for what i got i was fearfully amazed excuse me sir i said but i didn't see you laugh once no he answered and nor did anybody else when i laugh i laugh inside boy not outside so do most wise men now be off and when you next play shylock let me know if i'm alive i'll come so i went and we cheered old black from the playground he must have heard us but he didn't show up certainly taking one thing with another there are many extraordinary people in the world and you may be surprised at any moment no doubt it was one of those cases of coming to scoff and remaining to pray that you hear about but don't often actually see end of story twelve Story 13 of The Human Boy and the War by Eden Philpotts. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story 13 The Last of Mitchell. There is a great deal of difference between being expelled and invited to find another sphere for your activities. In fact, as my father said, if Dr. Dunstan had expelled me, he would certainly have made a row about it and very likely have written to the newspapers but old Dunstan was a jolly sight too wily for that. He wrote to my father when the event happened, and said that circumstances had come to his ears which made him think, etc., etc., and that I had better leave Merivale. I am Mitchell, and my father is a financier, and I may say that this profession embraces a great many branches. Sometimes, after dinner and holidays, he has allowed me to stop and smoke a cigarette while he talked to friends, and so I have got a gradual inkling of what it means to be a financier, and in a way this inkling was my downfall. Not that I felt it a downfall really to be hoofed out of Merivale, for it was rather a potty sort of show, and I should have gone to a far more swagger place if my father had been flusher just at the time when I had to go somewhere, owing to a trifling bother at another school. But I went to Merivale, and just because I tried to take advantage of what my father had said about finance and apply it to school life, the difficulties arose i gathered off and on from my father when he was in a talkative frame of mind that one of the great arts of a financier is to do deals between other people for instance you have something to sell and my father knows it and he roots about and leaves no stone unturned as they say until he finds somebody who wants to buy just what you want to sell then having found you a customer my father arranges all the details of the business and everybody is satisfied and my father, for all his time and trouble, gets richly rewarded. Then again, another fine branch of the financier's art is the floating of public companies. To float a company requires great skill and nerve. The first thing is to find a place a long way off, far beyond the reach of intending shareholders, in fact. Then you discover this far-off country is extraordinarily rich in minerals, or India rubber, or manure, or some other useful material which everybody wants. 
You send out a mineral or manure expert to the far-off country, and he is delighted to find these things in enormous quantities, and sees at a glance that, if properly managed, they will produce dividends of very likely a hundred percent for the first year, and much more afterwards. Then my father, or whoever it might be, is glad, and he goes about to other skillful men who understand companies, and they collect together and make a board. The more famous financiers there are among this board, the better the public likes it, and so the company is floated, and the public is invited to put in money. This the public is only too thankful to do, because, of course, the thing promises so well and then the shares are quoted on the stock exchange and the papers are suddenly full of the company some morning and the board sits and has a champagne luncheon and arranges its salaries and so on of course the people who have found that happy far-away land flowing with minerals and manure and such like are richly rewarded as they deserve to be and sometimes they take it in money and sometimes in shares and sometimes in both and all may or may not go well but the financier whose business it is to do these things and float the company takes care to come out of it all right in any case otherwise it is no good being a financier there was once a very fine company floated by my father and several of his scientific friends for extracting gold from salt water it was based on thoroughly sound principles because science has proved that there is so much gold in every ton of salt water and of course if it is there it can be extracted by modern inventions so my father and others of even greater renown were filled with the idea of promoting a company to do this it was a brilliant and successful company in a way but did not last long for some reason they started at a place near market i think with pumps and tubes to draw in the water and machinery and professional chemists to get the gold out of it and a staff of twenty skilled men who understood the complicated mechanism and they easily got enough gold from somewhere to make the prospectus and also enough to make a brooch for the manager's wife and no doubt they would have got much more in course of time but something failed the water in the english channel was a bit off or some other natural cause and my father said it would have been far better for everybody concerned if the works had been put up in the isle of skye or perhaps in norway or in the west indies or the fiji islands where conditions might have been better suited to success but gold was none the less made for my father and one or two others though not from the sea as my father said thoughtfully when discussing the winding up of the affair there is another and even higher branch of the financier's art the loftiest of all in fact this consists in floating loans for hard-up monarchs and it is absolutely the biggest thing the financier does it wants great skill and delicacy you can also float loans for hard-up nations if you understand how to do it but there are hundreds of financiers who never reach these dizzy heights of the profession just as there are hundreds you may say millions of soldiers who never get above being colonels and thousands of clergymen who fall short of becoming bishops my father of course understood these high branches of his profession and once even went so far as to be interested in a loan for a south american republic but before the thing was matured one side of the republic was destroyed by a volcano and the other side by insurgents who shot the president and all his best friends and these events so shook the investors in general that they would not subscribe to that loan though the republic in its financial extremities offered fabulous rates of interest i mention my father at such great length just to show the man he was and to explain my own bent of mind which lay in the same direction he said once in a genial mood that no man had ever made more bricks without straw than he had it seemed to me a very dignified and original profession because you are on your own so to say and you go out into the world single-handed and by simple force of a brilliant imagination and hard work win to yourself an honourable position you may even get knighted or baroneted if your financial genius is crowned with sufficient success to give away a few tons of money to a hospital or the party chest whatever that is 
So understanding all these things fairly well, it was natural that I took the line I did in the affair of Prothero Minimus and Young Maine, and whatever the doctor thought, my father didn't see any objection to the operation, and of course his opinion was the only one I cared about. It was like this. Young Maine, though very poor, had a most amazing knack of prize winning. He was in a class where all the chaps were a year older than him, and yet he always beat them with the greatest ease. He was good all around, and thought nothing of raking in prizes term after term. In fact, it seemed a thousand pities, seeing that he was very poor and the only son of a lawyer's clerk, that his great prize-winning powers were not yielding a better return. For, not to put too fine a point upon it, as they say, the prizes at Merivale were piffle of the deepest dye, and of no money value worth mentioning. Dr. Dunstan went on getting the same books term after term, and simply unreadable slush was all you could call them. The few things that were good were all back numbers, like Robinson Crusoe, all right in themselves, but nobody wants to read them twice, and then there were school stories that would have made angels weep, especially one called St. Winifred's, in which boys behaved like girls and blushed if anybody said anything dashing. Then there were books about birds and animals and insects, and for the lower school the doctor used to sink to Peter Parley and the Peep of Day and such like absolute mess of a bygone age. These things were all bound in blue leather and had a gold owl stamped upon them, which was the badge of Merivale. I believe the owl was supposed to be the bird of Athena and stood for wisdom, or some such rot. Anyhow, it wasn't a bad idea in its way, for a more owlish sort of school than Merivale I never was at. And young Maine got more of these books than anybody, but to him they were as grass, and he thought nothing of them, whereas Prothero Minimus had never won a prize in his life, and wanted one fearfully, not for itself, but for the valuable effect it would have on his mother. She was a widow, and loved Prothero Minimus, best of her three sons. The others had taken prizes and were fair flyers at school, but Prothero Minimus was useless except at running. So, woman-like, just because he couldn't get a prize anyhow, his mother was set on his doing so, and promised him rare rewards if he would only work extra hard or be extra good or extra something, and so scare up a blue book with a gold owl at any cost. Well, if you have a financial mind, you will see at a glance that here was a possible opportunity. At least, so it looked to me, because on the one hand was young Maine, always fearfully hard up, and always getting prizes at the end of each term as a matter of course. While on the other hand was Prothero Minimus, never hard up, but never a scholastic success, so to say, from the beginning of the term to the end, and of course never even within sight of a prize of any sort. Here, it seemed to me, was the whole problem of supply and demand in a nutshell, and the financier instinct cried out in me, as it were, that I ought to be up and doing. So I went to young Maine and said that I thought it was a frightful pity all his great skill was being chucked away, and bringing no return more important than the mournful things that he won as prizes. And he said, "'My well, time will come, Mitchell.' And then I told him that a time had come. I know you sell your prizes for a few bob at home, and that you think nothing of them, I said, but I had a bit of a yarn with that kid Prothero yesterday, and it seems that what is nothing to you would be a perfect godsend to him. You may not believe it, but his mother, who is a bit dotty on him, has promised him five pounds if he will bring home a prize. Five pounds, said Maine. The best prize old Dunn ever gave wasn't worth five bob. She doesn't want to sell it. She wants to keep it for the honor and glory of Prothero Minimus, I explain, and the idea in my mind in bringing you chaps together for your mutual advantage was, firstly, that you should let Prothero have one of your prizes to take home in triumph to his mother, and secondly, that he should give you a document swearing to let you have two pounds of his five pounds at the beginning of next term. Maine was much interested at this suggestion and knowing that he must be a snip for at least two prizes, if not three, at the end of the summer term, he had no difficulty whatever in falling in with my scheme. We were allowed to walk in the playing fields on Sunday after chapel before dinner, and then Maine and Prothero Minimus and myself discussed the details. 
Funnily enough, they were so full of it between themselves that they did not exactly realize where I came in. So I had to remind Prothero that it was I who had arranged the supply when I heard about his demand. And I had also to remind him he had certainly said that if anybody could put him in the way of a prize, he would give that person a clear pound at the beginning of next term. I also had to remind Maine that he had promised me ten shillings on delivery of his two pounds. In fact, before the day was done, I got them both to sign documents, because, as I say, when they once got together over it, they seemed rather to forget me. So I explained to them that my part was simply that of a financier, and that many men made their whole living in that way, arranging supplies for demands, and bringing capitalists together in a friendly spirit, but not for nothing. They quite saw it, but thought I asked too much, however i was older than they were and speedily convinced them that i had not there was only one difficulty in the way after this and prothero came to me about it and i helped him over it free of charge he said when i take home the prize what shall i say it's for you know what my school reports are like there's never a loophole for a prize of any kind well you might say good conduct i suggested but prothero minimus scorned the thought that would give away the whole show at once, he said, because even my mother wouldn't be deceived. It's no good taking back a prize for good conduct when the report will be sure to read as usual, no attempt at any improvement, which is how it always does. Anything I suggested, Prothero scoffed at in the same way, so I could see the prize would have to be for something not mentioned at all in the school report. Of course, you don't get book prizes for cricket or footer or running, which, especially the latter, were the only things that Prothero Minimus could have hoped honestly to get a prize for. But I stuck to the problem and had a very happy idea three nights before the end of the term. I then advised Prothero to say the prize was for calisthenics. There are no prizes for calisthenics at Maribel, but it sounded rather a likely subject, especially as he was a dab at it, and anyway he thought it would satisfy his mother and be all right. So that was settled, and it only remained for Maine to get his lawful prizes and hand over the least important to Prothero Minimus. It all went exceedingly well, at the start, and young Maine got the prizes and gave Prothero the second, which was for literature. The thing was composed entirely of poems, Longfellow or Southey or some such blighter, and Prothero said that his mother would fairly revel to think that he had won it. He packed it in his box after breaking up, and we exchanged our agreements, and it came out, when all was over, that young Maine was to have two pounds out of Prothero's five, and I was to have ten bob from Maine and a pound from Prothero, thirty shillings in all, and Prothero would have the prize and two pounds, not to mention other pickings that would doubtless be given to him by his proud and grateful mother. You might have thought that nothing would go wrong with a sound financial scheme of that sort, I put any amount of time and thought into the transaction, and as it was my first introduction into the world of business, so to speak, and I stood to net a clear thirty shillings. Naturally, I left no stone unturned, as they say, to make it a brilliant and successful affair. And yet it all went to utter and hopeless smash, though it was no fault of mine. And you certainly wouldn't blame Pothero Minimus or Maine either. In fact, Prothero must have carried it off very well when he got home, and the calisthenics went down all right, and Maine, when his people asked how it was that he hadn't got more than one prize, was ingenious enough to say that he'd suffered from hay fever all the term and been too off-color to make his usual haul. So everything would have been perfection, but for the idiotic and footling behavior of Prothero Minimus's mother. This excitable and weak-minded woman was not content with just quietly taking the prize and putting it in a glass case with the prizes won in the past by Prothero's brothers. She must go fluttering about, telling his wretched relations what he'd done, and as if that was not enough, she got altogether above herself and wrote to Dr. Dunstan about it. She said how glad and happy it had made her, and that success in the gymnasium was something to begin with, and that she hoped and prayed that it would lead to better things, and that they would live to be proud of Prothero Minimus yet, and such like truck. Well, the result was a knockdown blow to us all, as you may imagine, and the doctor showed himself both wily and beastly, as usual. 
for he merely asked prothero's mother to send back the prize at the beginning of the term as he fancied there might have been some mistake but he begged her not to mention the matter to prothero minimus so when prothero and maine and myself all arrived again for the arduous toil of the winter term and maine and i were eager for the financial disbursements to begin we heard the shattering news that at the last moment prothero hadn't got his fiver it was to have been given to him on the day that he came back to school but instead his mother had merely told him that she feared there was a little mistake somewhere and that she couldn't give him his hard-earned cash till dr dunston had cleared the matter up needless to say that dunston did clear it up with all the brutality of which he was capable as for myself when the crash came i hoped it would happen to me as it often does to professional financiers in real life and that i should escape as it were not of course that i had done anything that in fairness made it necessary for me to escape because to take advantage of supply and demand is a natural law of self-preservation and everybody does it as a matter of course not only financiers but much to my annoyance the common-sense view of the thing was not taken and i found myself in the cart as they say with young maine and prothero minimus the doctor on examining prothero's prize for calisthenics instantly perceived that it was in reality young maine's prize for literature but evidently anything like strategy of this kind was very distasteful to the doctor in fact he took a prejudiced view from the first and as young maine was only eleven and prothero minimus merely ten and a half it instantly jumped to dunston's hateful and suspicious mind that somebody must have helped them in what he called a nefarious project and by dint of some very unmanly cross-questioning he got my name out of maine i never blamed maine in fact i quite believed him when he swore that it only slipped out under the treacherous questions of the doctor but the result was of course unsatisfactory in every way for me i was immediately sent for and had no course open to me but to explain the whole nature of financial operations to dr dunston and try to make him see that i had simply fallen in with the iron laws of supply and demand needless to say i failed for he was in one of his fiery and snorting conditions and above all appeal to reason it was an ordinary sort of transaction sir i said and i don't see that anybody was hurt by it in fact everybody was pleased including mrs brothero this made him simply foam at the mouth i had never been what you may call a great success with him and now to hear sound business views from one still at the early age of sixteen fairly shook him up he ordered me to go back to my class and when i had gone he flogged young maine and prothero minimus he then forgave them and told them to go and sin no more and the same day doubtless after the old fool had cooled down a bit he wrote to my father and put the case before him though not quite fairly and said that apparently i had no moral sense and a lot of other insulting and vulgar things in conclusion he asked my father to remove me that i might find another sphere for my activities and my father did he never took my view of the matter exactly but he certainly did not take dr dunston's view either he seemed to be more amused than anything and was by no means in such a wax with dr dunston as i should have expected he said that the scholastic point of view was rather stuffy and lacked humour and then he explained that i had certainly not acted quite on the straight but had been a deceitful and cunning little bounder i was a, a good deal hurt at this view and when he found a billet for me in the firm of messrs martin and moss stockbrokers i felt very glad indeed to go into it and shake off the dust of school from my feet as they say it is a good and a busy firm and i have been here a fortnight now ten days ago happening to pass mr martin's door and catching my name i naturally stood and listened and heard an old clerk tell mr martin that i was taking to the work like a duck takes to water i am writing this account of the business at merivale on sheets of the best correspondence paper of messrs martin and moss they would not like it if they knew but they won't know End of story 13. End of The Human Boy and the War by Eaton Philpotts.